F. C. H. Wendell, History of Egypt. In presenting to the public this little book, which treats of the history of ancient Egypt from the earliest times to the conquest by Alexander the Great, my object has been twofold. First, to give to American readers a brief account of Egyptian history, which would be as reliable as the present state of Egyptological science permits. And second, to create a deeper interest in the study of ancient Egypt. The study of Egyptology is of the greatest importance to the theologist, the historian, the student of civilization, and the art student. In science and art, Egypt was the teacher of Greece. Even the Greek alphabet is derived from the Egyptian through the medium of the Phoenician, and Greece was the teacher of Europe. The basis of a rational study of Egyptology will always be a thorough knowledge of Egyptian history. Without this, the student cannot properly understand the development of Egypt's civilization, of its science, its religion, its art, its language, and its literature. I have in the following pages given as complete a history as the space allotted would permit. In the introductory chapter, I have not been able to give as much space as I should have wished to the subjects there treated, and have been compelled to confine myself to what was absolutely necessary. Science, art, and literature could not be treated, as even a partial account of them would have required too much space. In regard to the sources of my book, I have, as a rule, confined myself to the Egyptian monuments, using foreign sources only in emergencies where no native sources are extant for the period in question. It may appear strange to some readers that I have not treated of the Exodus. This event does not, however, properly belong to Egyptian history. It did not at all affect Egypt, however important it may have been to the Israelites. In my chronology, I have followed Edward Meyer, the famous German historian who introduced a system of so-called approximate dates, which are always the latest dates that can be given for an era. Thus, when we say that King Mena ruled about 3200 BC, that King Snefru ruled about 2830 BC, and Pepi I 2530 BC, we would not by any means imply that these dates are absolutely correct, but we would merely imply that these monarchs could not have ruled after the dates given, though we cannot say how long before these dates they did live. Snefru may even have ruled 500 years before 2830 BC, but we have no means of knowing his exact date. From the date of Achmes I's accession to the throne, about 1530 BC, Meyer's dates are approximately correct. We know that King Necho ruled 609 to 595 BC, that Sheshong I lived about 930 BC, that Ramses II lived in the 13th, and Tutmosis III in the 15th century BC, but we know as an absolute certainty nothing more. These approximate dates are, however, such a convenience that it would be well to adopt them until we can give the exact dates. The maps here given have been most carefully prepared and will, I hope, greatly assist the reader in understanding the history of the great campaigns. With these few prefatory remarks, 
I submit this booklet to the judgment of the public, and if I succeed in the twofold object of spreading the truth so far as discoverable and creating a deeper interest in ancient Egypt, I shall rest content. F. C. H. Wendell, A. M. P. H. D. The Ancient Geography of Egypt Egypt lies in the northeastern corner of Africa, between the twenty-fourth and the thirty-second degrees of north latitude. It is bounded on the east by Asia and the Red Sea, on the south by a line drawn east and west through Aswan on the first cataract, on the west by the desert of Sahara, and on the north by the Mediterranean Sea. This tract of country is five hundred and twenty miles long, and on an average one hundred and sixty miles wide. The area of the entire country is about one hundred thousand square miles, or about two and a half times that of Ohio. But the whole of this country is not cultivable. By far the larger part is desert. On the west, a low, arid, sandy plain. On the east, an arid mountain region. Only the immediate valley of the Nile is arable soil, and this is a very narrow strip, which between Aswan and the Delta never exceeds fifteen miles in width, and at places is only two miles wide. In the Delta, there is a far wider stretch of cultivable land, owing to the fact that the Nile here divides into numerous branches. But even here, all the land is not available for cultivation, owing to numerous great swamps and large lakes. In antiquity, the greater part of the delta was swamp and meadowland, and its chief value lay in the fact that it was a good grazing country, and that its swamps and lakes made fine hunting grounds, abounding as they did in all sorts of aquatic birds. The lakes were full of fish, so that fishing was added to grazing and hunting, and thus the country possessed considerable resources even before agriculture became profitable. It is well known that Egypt owes this strip of good land to the Nile. This remarkable river, which rises in the Nyanza lakes in tropical Africa, and has several branches which come from the Ethiopic highlands, is annually swollen by the rains which prevail in the tropics during the rainy season. Already in June, the river begins to rise and continues to swell until about September 15th, when it reaches the high water mark. It then remains stationary until late in October, when it begins to fall, and by January the river is again at its old level. So important was this rise of the Nile to the entire population, that the ancient Egyptians made the day on which the river attained its highest level, September 15th, their New Year's Day, called in Egyptian op rampet The inundation brought coolness, humidity, and fertility. The river brought down from the Ethiopian highlands vast masses of mud, which it deposited on the Egyptian soil when it inundated the land and which remained there when the water receded. Thus, an alluvial soil of great depth and richness was produced. The full benefits of the inundation could not, however, be gained without hard work on the part of the dwellers in the Nile Valley, as rain was, in antiquity, almost entirely wanting in Egypt. A carefully arranged system of irrigation was necessary to convey the much-needed moisture to the more remote fields. The digging of canals from the river and building of reservoirs 
were not easy work, and moreover, the overflow had to be carefully regulated in accordance with the character of the various fields should the full results be obtained. Thus, we see that the Egyptian farmer could not sit with folded arms and let his generous river do the work for him. He had to be up and doing from early morning till late at night to reap the full benefits obtainable from his wonderful stream. Before we touch the old geographical division of the country, we may well say a few words of the character of the rocky highlands that fringe the Nile Valley. At the first cataract, the river breaks through a vast granite barrier that here crosses the Nubian sandstone deposit. At this place, the Egyptians had established, already in the times of King Chufu, about 2800 BC, great quarries from which they took their supply of granite. In the same neighborhood, basalt, too, was quarried about this time. The Nubian sandstone then continues as far north as Silsile, where the Egyptians early worked sandstone quarries. The character of the hills now changes, a little to the north of Silsile, the sandstone giving place to a tertiary pneumolytic limestone, which formation continues on both sides of the Nile, on the west to the Mediterranean, on the east to Memphis, whence it strikes off to the northeast. These rocky hills seldom reach and never exceed the moderate height of 600 to 800 feet. The character of the mountain region between the Nile and the Red Sea is, however, vastly different. Here we meet with grand and imposing mountain scenery, the bold, many-colored mountain peaks often reaching a height of 6,000 feet. These mountains consist of crystalline rock, granite, gneiss, porphyry, diorite, and others. Several valleys lead from the Nile into this region. The most important of these is the Wadi Hamamat, the Rohanu of the ancient Egyptians, a valley extending from Kene on the Nile to Kosur on the Red Sea. This valley was used in antiquity as a trade route between the Nile Valley and the sea, the point of departure being, in olden times, the city of Kebti, the Koptos of the Greeks, the modern Kuft, and the Red Sea port being some place near the modern Koser. For a time, it was at the extremity of the Wadi Gasus, north of Koser. This valley had, in antiquity, a further significance. Midway between the Nile and the Red Sea, the Egyptians worked in very early times diorite quarries of considerable extent. So much for the general character of the land. We now turn to a consideration of the ancient geography. The Egyptian official name of the state was Taui, both lands, that is, both North and South Egypt. The name Kemet, the Black Land, was also often used, though not in state documents. From this name was derived the Coptic name of the country, Keme in Sahidic, Shemi in Boheric, from which the latter form was derived the Hebrew Ham. The country was divided into two parts, the south, known in Egyptian as Res or Kemat, the south, and as Patares, the south land, which latter name gave rise to the Hebrew Patros. The reader's note, name in Greek letters, of the Septuaginta and the north, 
designated in Egyptian as Meta, the north, and Pata Mera. The south included all the land from Aswan to Memphis, the north all of the delta. Why this division was made we shall see in section 3. Each of these countries was divided into a number of small districts, which we are accustomed to designate as gnomes, generally given as 42 in number, 22 in upper and 20 in lower Egypt. I here enumerate the 22 upper Egyptian and the principal lower Egyptian gnomes, going from south to north and stating as briefly as possible what interest attaches to each. 1. The southernmost gnome, Ta Chont, extended from Aswan to Silsile. Its chief town was the city of Abu, Greek Elephantine, situated on an island in the Nile. Opposite this city, on the river bank, lay the town of Swen where the old granite quarries were situated. Swen became in Greek Syen, and from this, by prefixing the article, the Arabs made as Suan. On the northern boundary of the Nome lay the sandstone quarries of Silsile. The deity worshipped in this Nome was the god Knum. 2. The second gnome was called Tes Hor. Its capital and religious center was the famous old town of Debot, the modern Edfu, where the well-preserved ruins of the temple erected by the Ptolemies to the local divinity Hor Debeti, a form of the god Horus, still excite the admiration of the beholder. 3. The third gnome. 10, with the capital Nekebet, the modern Elkab, Greek Eletheia, the home of the old tutelar deity of Upper Egypt, the goddess Nekebet, had for local deity the god Chenum. Two other cities of importance were situated in this nome, Enet, the modern Esne, where there stands a fairly preserved temple built in Ptolemaic times, and the city of On, called On of the god Mont, in contradistinction to On Heliopolis, the city of Ra in Lower Egypt. It is the Greek Hermonthus, an Arabic Ermet. 4. Now follows the fourth nome, Oeset the capital of which was the famous city of Oeset, commonly known by its Greek name Thebes. Its chief divinity was Amon. Mentu was worshipped in the southern portion. 5. Horui, the capital of which was the city of Kebti, situated on the Nile at the entrance to the Wadi Hamamat, of which we have spoken above. The local divinity was the god Min. 6. Eati had chiefly religious importance. Its capital, Ta Ent Ter Er, modern Dendera, Greek Tentiris, was the home of the great goddess Hathor. Her temple, built by the Ptolemies, is fairly preserved. 7 the nome Sechem, the capital of which was Hat, Diospolis Parva, had the same local divinity, Hathor. 8. Abt was one of the most important gnomes. Its capital was Abdu, Abydos, the seat of the Osiris religion, an alleged burial place of the god. 9. The ninth gnome, Min, with the capital Per-Min, House of Min, Greek, Panopolis, had but little importance. 10. This gnome, called Oatjet, 
the capital of which was Debu, Aphroditopolis, worshipped the goddess Hathor. The district Neterui, with the capital Duca, and the god Horus, formed part of it. 11. The eleventh nome, Set, the capital of which was Shashotep, Hipsale, was devoted to the god Shnam. 12. Duhefu had as capital the town of Nut and Bek, and worshipped the god Horus. The chief importance of this nome lay in its valuable alabaster quarries, which were worked in very early times near the ancient city of Hatnub, the modern Ebnub. 13. The nome Atefchont, the capital of which was the old city of Sayut, Sayut, a town that in the Middle Empire, 2100 to 1900 BC, was of considerable importance, owing to the influential and powerful position occupied by its nomarchoi. It was the chief seat of the cult of the jackal-headed god of the dead, Anubis. 14. Atefpe was unimportant. Its capital was Kesi, Kusse, and its deity Hathor. 15. The nome of Owen had for capital the city of Chamunu, Greek Hermopolis, modern Eshmunen, which derived its name from the fact that it was the seat of the eight gods of the elements, so called. The chief divinity of the nome was the god of wisdom, thought. 16. Memahet was of great importance in the times of the Middle Empire, owing to its influential and mighty Nomarchoi, whose tombs were discovered at Bani Hassan. To these tombs, which are hewn into the living rock, and the walls of which are covered with important representations and inscriptions, we owe much of what we know of this period. The capital was Hebenu, and the local divinity, Horus. 17. The capital of the nome Anbu was Kasa, Sinonpolis. Its god was Anubis. 18. Sapet, the capital of which was Hotbenu, Alabastronpolis, one of the seats of the Anubis cult, was important for its alabaster quarries, which were opened in early times. 19. Oab, the capital of which was the city of Permachet, Axerhinchos, was the only nome where Set was worshipped. From this nome led the roads to the oases of the eastern Sahara. 20. This nome bore the name Atefchont. Its capital was Chenensuten, Heracleopolis Magna a city of great importance in the religion of Egypt, as the god Ra was supposed to have made his first appearance here. The local divinity of the nome was Horsha, a form of Horus. 21. Atefpe had for capital the city of Semenhor, and for local deity the god Chnam. The western part was known as Tashe, Lakeland, the modern name of the region being Fayum, which is derived from the ancient word Payum, the sea, through the medium of the Bohiric dialect of the Coptic, in which it became Fayum. Here was situated the great reservoir built by Amenhotep III. 22. The northernmost nome of Upper Egypt was known as Maten. Its capital was Tepa, and its local deity, the goddess Hathor. Of the twenty lower Egyptian gnomes, I shall enumerate only the principal ones. 1. 
Anbu Hitched, the gnome of Menefer, Memphis, the city of Ta. 4. Sepires, the gnome of Cheka, Canopus, where Amun Ra was worshipped. 5. Sepi Emhet, the gnome of Sa, Saïs, where the great goddess Neit was worshipped, the home of the Samitics. 9. Achi, the gnome of Per Usiri, Busiris, the city of Osiris. 12. Kachib, the gnome of Jebnatur, Sebenithos, the home of the god Anher. 13. Hakad, the gnome of On, Heliopolis, the great seat of the Ra religion. 14. Chantabed, the gnome of Jan, Tanis, where Horus was worshipped. 16. Char, the gnome of Perbanebded, Mendes, the god of which was the sacred ram Banebded. 18. Amchent, the gnome of Perbastet, Bubastis, the city of the cat-headed goddess Bastet. 19. Ampe, the name of Per Uache, Buto, where Uache, the tutelar deity of Lower Egypt, had her home. Section 2. The Sources of Egyptian History It is needful in a history of Egypt to give a brief summary of the sources from which our knowledge of the facts is derived. These sources are A. National B. Asiatic and C. Classical A. National Sources before we give any account of the monuments and documents on which by far the greatest part of Egyptian history is based, it may be well to review rapidly the history of the decipherment of the hieroglyphics and to give a brief sketch of the Egyptian system of writing. Already in the Middle Ages, men like Athanasius Kircher attempted to decipher the mysterious picture writing of ancient Egypt, but their interpretations, proceeding from an utter misconception of the true nature of the hieroglyphics, were fantastical and utterly useless. The results attained by these men discredited the study of hieroglyphics, and scholars turned rather to Coptic, the liturgic language of the Christian Church of Egypt a descendant of the Egyptian tongue, and at the time still a living language. The results attained in this study were later on of great value to the decipherers of the ancient tongue. In August 1799, there was unearthed at Rosetta a block of black basalt bearing a decree of Ptolemy Epiphanes in Greek. Hieroglyphics and Demotic, the celebrated Rosetta Stone. Immediately, scholars set to work at deciphering the inscription. Thomas Young, an English mathematician, and Francois Champollion, a French savant, working independently of one another, succeeded at about the same time in deciphering the royal names and the hieroglyphical part. And, to the surprise of all, it was found that the writing was largely phonetic. Champollion's results were by far the more important, and when, ten years after his first great discovery, he died in 1832, he had already correctly given the contents of entire inscriptions and papyri, and had laid down the elements of a grammar. Ten years later, Richard Karl Lepsius, the great German Egyptologist, who died some years ago, carried further the work so ably begun by Champollion, 
and through him the final proof was given that the results so far attained were correct. He discovered in 1867, at Tanis, a trilingual inscription, the so-called Decree of Canopus, the study of which document finally confirmed the results hitherto obtained from the study of the Egyptian texts. Thus, the stage of decipherment came to a close. Since then, able scholars in all parts of Europe have been adding to our knowledge of Egyptian matters. The Egyptian system of writing appears at first glance to be highly complicated, but it is in reality far simpler than it looks. It is a combination of the phonetic, alphabetic, and syllabic, and ideographic systems, to which is added a system of determinatives. The alphabet consists of 22 consonants. Vowels are, as in all other old Semitic languages, not written. The alphabetic and syllabic signs are by far the oldest, the most ancient texts being purely phonetic, containing neither ideograms nor determinatives. Owing to the fact that the vowels were not written, Confusion early arose among words having the same consonants but different significations, and in all probability pronounced with different vowels. To obviate this difficulty, the Egyptians early invented a system of determinatives. A determinative is the picture of an object placed after the word signifying the object in question. Determinatives are either generic or specific. The generic determinative is the picture of some object which is characteristic of a group. Thus, after the names of animals, we frequently find the picture of a piece of skin. After abstract words and verbs, we find the picture of a papyrus roll and after the names of foreign countries, we find the picture of a range of hills. The specific determinative is the picture of the object that the word denotes. Thus, after the word hetra, signifying horse, the picture of a horse was often placed. After the word abu, denoting panther, we often find a picture of that animal. After the word romet, man, we find the picture of a man, as also after the names of males. After the word suten, king, we find the picture of a king. After the word hemet, woman, the names of females and goddesses, we find the picture of a woman. And after the names of cities, we find the plan of a city. From these determinatives arose, in course of time, ideograms, or word pictures. Thus, the plan of a city, originally the determinative of the word nut, city, came with time to stand for the word itself, which is never written phonetically. The picture of a bee, originally the determinative of the word afet, honey, came with time to be used as the ideogram for that word. The figure of a man walking with a long staff, originally the determinative of the word sir, prince, later on was used as an ideogram. Many other examples could be given, but these will illustrate the general principle. In Ptolemaic times, the ideograms were greatly multiplied, many texts being written almost entirely in ideograms. It must, however, always be borne in mind that the writing was originally phonetic and not ideographic. The writing, too, has a history of its own. In the oldest times, the writing was purely hieroglyphical. 
Hieroglyphics were written as early as 4000 BC, if not earlier, and continued in use far into the times of the Roman emperors. These hieroglyphics were originally finely executed in every detail, and this remained the custom on all government monuments so long as hieroglyphics were used. But it was early found that the full hieroglyphics, while admirably adapted for inscriptions on stone, were too cumbersome for writing on papyrus or mummy bands, which were of linen. So an abridged or cursive form that we call linear hieroglyphics was invented. These linear hieroglyphics are merely the characteristic outlines of the full signs. They remained in use all through Egyptian history for religious texts written on papyrus and mummy bands. About 1700 BC, a new method of writing came into vogue for profane writings. This new method, which still further abridged the hieroglyphics, is called hieratic. The older form of this hieratic still in some measure resembles the linear hieroglyphical writing from which it was derived. Some four hundred years this method seems to have been in use, when a new system came into being, which is also called hieratic but differs materially from the older style from which it is abridged, in that it is far less cumbersome, omitting many of the details found in the older hieratic, and being thus far more suitable for rapid writing. From this newer hieratic was derived the Phoenician alphabet, from which the Greek alphabet was derived. This form of the hieratic is thus the ancestor of our alphabet. This style of writing remained in fashion many hundred years as the cursive script used on papyrus, and sometimes even on mummy bands. The last stage in the development of Egyptian script was reached in the Demotic in the 5th century before the Christian era. This was a still further abridgment of the new hieratic, but it eliminated so many details that very many letters and syllabic signs that had been kept distinct in hieratic became one and the same sign, a fact that renders the reading of demotic very difficult. The new system had, however, the advantage of being very rapid and thus it quickly supplanted the hieratic. It remained in use up to the Christian times, when it was supplanted by the Coptic script, which was modeled after the Greek. The reader must not, however, imagine that these changes were sudden. One led gradually to the other. Thus, the old, full hieroglyphics were abridged in the linear hieroglyphics. From these was developed the old hieratic, from this the new hieratic, and this, becoming gradually more and more cursive, led over to the demotic. We now pass to a consideration of the Egyptian sources from which our knowledge of the facts of Egyptian history is derived. The texts, which are of primary importance, are the lists of kings compiled in antiquity. The most important of these is the so-called Turin Papyrus of Kings, which gives a list of Egyptian kings from the earliest times to the times of the 16th dynasty, about 1700 BC, including the earlier kings of this dynasty, in which it was most probably written. This list is chronological. The duration of the reign of each king in years, months, and days 
being given after his name. Unfortunately, however, the papyrus is fragmentary, having been broken into one hundred and sixty-four small pieces on the way to Turin. Professor Seyfarth conferred a lasting benefit on historical science by arranging, numbering, and mounting these fragments, thus preserving this valuable document. The second list of importance is that discovered in the Temple of Osiris in Abydos. This list contains the names of seventy-five predecessors of Seti I, about 1320 B.C., arranged in chronological order. The third list was discovered in a private tomb dating from the time of Ramses II, 1300 to 1230 B.C. It enumerates 47 kings. The last important list is that found in Karnak, which enumerates 61 predecessors of Thutmose III, 1480 to 1430. Besides these, a number of smaller and less important lists have been discovered. Next in importance to the lists stand the official inscriptions of the kings. The pharaohs were in the habit of inscribing on the walls of the temples they erected to the gods long accounts of their deeds. In order to be able to give a full account of their campaigns, the kings were accompanied by scribes, specially detailed to write down the history of these campaigns. Their accounts were then copied on the temple walls. Great paintings illustrating the principal events of a campaign covered the space not occupied by the inscriptions in that part of the temple allotted to the annals. These inscriptions were divided into two parts, the date, on which followed, as a rule, a laudatory hymn to the king, and the account of the campaign. These texts give a chronological account of the campaigns of the king, often going into the details of the march and of the various battles. Among the most interesting of these inscriptions is a copy of the Treaty of Peace and Alliance between Ramses II and Chedasar, King of the Cheda, which was originally engraved on a silver plate, and from this was copied on the outer wall of the Temple of Karnak, where it has been completely preserved. Of importance are further royal decrees, which are frequently found inscribed on stele and temple walls. Reports of buildings erected by the kings, and of expeditions undertaken at their command, are not unfrequent. Several of the latter the reader will meet with later on. The most important report of all is that which Ramses III, about 1180 to 1148 B.C., gave of his reign, and which is preserved in the so-called Papyrus Harris I. It is a comprehensive account of Ramses's architectural enterprises, his expeditions, and his gifts to the temples. In addition, it gives a brief review of the state of Egypt immediately before the reign of the king's father, Setnecht. Lists of conquered nations are also of frequent occurrence, but often possess very little value. The most valuable of these lists is that of Tutmosis III, which gives the names of from 300 to 400 conquered nations and cities, lying mostly in Asia. Later lists, as those of Seti I, 
and Ramses the second, enumerating over a hundred countries, and that of Sheshong the first, which gives an equal number, are frequently copied in part from the lists of Tutmosis the third, and can be used only with the utmost caution. The oldest example of such a list is a stell of Usertesen the first, which enumerates the Negro tribes conquered by him. Scarabay are seldom of historical value, though some belonging to the reign of Amenhotep the third are important, namely those noticing his marriage with Queen T, and those giving accounts of his hunting exploits. Of great importance are the tombs of the nobles. These tombs had attached to them funereal chapels, the walls of which were covered with paintings and inscriptions, giving a brief biographical sketch of the individual buried in the tomb, enumerating his titles, his possessions, and all his exploits. These inscriptions are of great value. To them we owe all that we know of the Egyptian civilization, and often all the historical knowledge we possess of entire epochs. Confer the case of the Una inscription, page 42. Asiatic Sources First among these we must mention the Bible. The sacred writings are, as may be expected from their character, not the most copious or important sources of Egyptian history. The first two books, Genesis and Exodus, frequently mention Egypt, but they are concerned only with the fate of the Hebrews who dwelt in Egypt and do not go into Egyptian history. In the books of the kings and in chronicles, frequent allusions are made to Egyptian history and what we find here is always confirmed by the monuments. The prophets, especially Ezekiel and Jeremiah, frequently allude to contemporaneous Egyptian history. Of greater importance are the Assyrian inscriptions. These inscriptions shed light on a period of Egyptian history of which we know nothing from the national monuments. I refer to the period of the Assyrian invasions in the 7th century BC. The Assyrian kings, whose inscriptions are of importance in this connection, are Tiglath-Pilesar III, Sargon II, Sanherib, and Assurbanipal. Next in importance are the inscriptions of King Nebuchadnezzar II of Babylon who invaded Egypt in the 6th century B.C. C. Classical Sources Of the host of classical writers who wrote on Egypt, I give in the following only the principal ones. The book that long stood unchallenged as a source of Egyptian history is the Historia of Herodotus of Halicarnassus. The study of the monuments has, however, revealed great errors in this work, and has proved it to be utterly untrustworthy as a history. Herodotus's great fault was that he believed all the stories his guides told him, some of which are so improbable that we are surprised to find that so intelligent a man as our author was should have believed them at all. He visited Egypt about 450 B.C., at a time when it was under Persian rule, and probably never got farther south than Memphis. What he saw he described accurately, and that part of his history, which relates to the times of the last Semitics and the Persian rulers of the land, is perfectly reliable. His book is the book of a tourist, and all his faults are the faults of a tourist who travels in a strange and wonderful land 
without any knowledge of the language, and having but a short time to do the sights. Another reason why the book is in great part unreliable is because the Greeks, believing the Egyptians possessed of a deep and mysterious learning, and having some dim tradition of the fact that their arts and sciences were originally derived from Egypt, though they had already far surpassed their teachers, sought to derive their entire civilization, their religion and philosophy, which were purely native, as well as art and science, which had indeed received their first impulse from Egypt, from the mystic lore of that most ancient land. The Egyptian priests, with whom the Greek tourists came into contact, naturally strengthened them in this belief, and gave themselves a very mysterious air, thus still more increasing their reputations for learning. One word on the subject of castes may well be said here before we leave Herodotus. From his work, an erroneous impression has crept into many modern books on Egypt that the ancient Egyptians were divided into so-called castes. In ancient Egypt, there existed, of course, the same classes that existed in all ancient monarchies. There was the king and the royal family the hereditary nobility, the middle class consisting of merchants, farmers, mechanics, from which government officials and priests were recruited as well as from the princes and nobles, the laborers and the slaves. No one was, however, compelled to follow in the footsteps of his father. Thus, if the father was a government official, a priest, an officer, a merchant, a farmer, or a mechanic, the son need not necessarily also be a government official, a priest, an officer, a merchant, a farmer, or a mechanic, but was free to choose his vocation. We have even instances of men of humble birth rising to the highest position in the gift of the crown, and that does not look as though the Egyptians had possessed a system of castes. The most important of these writers is Manetho of Sebenithos. He lived in the third century before the Common Era, and his book was written about 271 BC. As tradition asserts, at the instance of Ptolemy Philadelphus. Manetho was a high priest and temple scribe of Sebenithos, and was thus familiar with the Egyptian language. He was also an able classical scholar. Thus, he was fitted for the work of writing an Egyptian history as perhaps no other man then living his learning giving him access alike to the native monuments and the classic authors, the errors of which latter he attacked. The chief value of the work lay in the fact that, being based on the native sources, it must have been quite reliable. Manetho divided all the kings from Mena to Alexander the Great into thirty-one so-called dynasties, stating from what part of Egypt the various dynasties came. On what his division is based, we cannot say. It is important to note that the Turin Papyrus makes a somewhat different division from his. He also divided Egyptian history into three periods. One, Old Empire. Dynasties 1 to 11. 2. Middle Empire. Dynasties 12 to 19. 3. 
New Empire, Dynasties 20 to 30. We retain his terms, but make a somewhat different division, as will be seen in the course of this book. Unfortunately, this important work is lost, and only fragmentary extracts of it have been preserved. The historians who made these extracts were not guided by a true scientific spirit, but took only what happened to suit their immediate purpose and the extracts frequently conflict with one another in important details. These copyists were Josephus, the Jewish historian, Africanus, and Eusebius. Of course, we can form no just estimate of a work preserved in so fragmentary a condition. Diodorus Siculus who visited Egypt about 57 B.C., wrote an account of the country. His work is, however, but little more trustworthy than that of Herodotus. Diodorus seems to have had all of Herodotus's faults, but none of his virtues. Manetho he does not seem to have known. At all events, he does not refer to his book. Strabo and Pliny both touch Egyptian history incidentally, but are not trustworthy. Plutarch, who lived in the 2nd century A.D., wrote a fair work on Egyptian religion under the title of Peri Isidos Kai Osiridos. Horapolon Nilois wrote between the years 379 and 395 A.D., a work under the title Hieroglyphica, in which he gives mostly correct explanations of such hieroglyphics as frequently occur in Ptolemaic inscriptions. He knew, however, merely the ideographic and not the phonetic value of these hieroglyphs. Section 3 Prehistoric Conditions When we first come upon Egypt, it is a full-grown state possessed of a well-ordered government, a well-organized society, and a civilization of a high order. At the dawn of history, the formative period of the nation was over, and Egypt was a finished product. How many centuries the formative period lasted, we cannot say, but we can, from facts observed in the later development of the land and its religion, make some deductions as to the prehistoric conditions of the country. We can even, and that is of great importance, trace in general outline the formative process, the result of which was the Egyptian state. Egypt was not always a single united country, as it was in historic times, but was, for a long time previous to Mena, divided into two countries, which were entirely independent of one another, and remained so until King Mena united them and founded the Egyptian state about 3200 B.C. These two countries were known, even after the Union, as the North and the South, and the official name of the United Kingdom was Taui, both lands, thus preserving the memory that there were originally two countries where, in historical times, there was but one. One of the king's titles was Sam Taui, uniter of both lands. We can even say what cities were the capitals of the two states. The capital of the south was in all probability the city of Nekebet. That of the north was the city of Buto. We deduce these facts from the fact 
that the goddess of Nekebet, whose name was also Nekebet, was regarded in all epics of Egyptian history as the tutelar divinity of Upper Egypt, the South, and the goddess of Buto, known originally as the double city of Pe and Dep, and in later times as Per Watch. Watch was regarded in all epics of Egyptian history as the tutelar deity of Lower Egypt, the North. Each of these two countries had its own crown. Lower Egypt, a curiously shaped red crown, and Upper Egypt, a peculiar white crown, shaped like one of the pieces used in playing nine pins. When the two countries were united, these two crowns were combined into one as the Peshant, or double crown, the white crown being put inside of the red. These two countries were in themselves composite products, resulting from the union of various small districts, which we designate as gnomes. That these gnomes were originally independent of one another, we can deduce with some degree of certainty from the fact that they retained their autonomy through all epochs of Egyptian history, had their own hereditary rulers known as nomarchoi, their own local governments, and what is most important in this inquiry, their own peculiar religious beliefs. Egyptian tradition naturally ignores this state of things, asserting that the first pharaohs of the land were the gods, that on these succeeded the Shemsu Hor, followers of Horus, a sort of demigods, and on these, finally, King Mena, that in Mena's time the two countries were united into one was a fact that could not be spirited away by any amount of tradition. So a legend arose to explain the fact that the country was divided before Mena's time, that Horus and Set had divided the country between them. Such a legend which seeks to explain existing conditions we call aetiological. The question whether or not the Egyptians were aborigines has been frequently discussed. The most probable solution of the problem is this. The Egyptians, as a race, were aborigines, and they always looked upon themselves as such. They designate only their own people as Rometu, men. The other peoples may be Syrians, Negroes, or Asiatics, but men they are not. It seems probable, however, that these aborigines were subdued by a small band of invaders who came from southwestern Asia, and who, though not strong enough to influence the race, yet were sufficiently powerful to force on the conquered people their language and perhaps some of their religious conceptions. The relations between conqueror and conquered were then pretty much the same as those between the Anglo-Saxons and Aboriginal Britons and those between the conquering Arabs and the modern Egyptians. Of course, this is merely a hypothesis, though it is a very probable one. To speak of a stone age in prehistoric Egypt is entirely out of the way. Stone implements were used for many centuries, even in historic times, and the stone age, if we may speak of one at all, falls within the historic periods. Section 4 A Brief Sketch of the Ancient Egyptian Religion 
To understand the development of Egyptian religion, we must understand the prehistoric conditions sketched above and must have a thorough knowledge of Egyptian history. We would, therefore, advise our readers to read the history before they read this sketch of the religion of Egypt. The Egyptians were originally what is called animists, that is to say, they believed that just as man is endowed with a soul, so every animal, every plant, aye, every inanimate object, is also endowed with a soul, or rather, is possessed of a spirit or demon, which is the cause of the good or evil qualities the animal, plant, or thing in question possesses. The animal, plant, or thing in question thus became the object of a primitive cult with a view to propitiating the same. The two great motives of primitive cults are always love and fear, and of the two, fear is the stronger. The savage is quicker at propitiating an evil spirit in order to preserve himself from harm than at showing gratitude to a benignant one. The early Egyptians worshipped animals and trees with especial fervor. Of the tree cult, we do not know more than that every gnome had its sacred trees, that the sycamore was sacred to the goddess Hathor, and that one of the gods bore the name Cheri Bakef, he in his oil tree, that is, the spirit dwelling in the oil tree. Of the animal worship we know a little more. Both motives of primitive cults, love and fear, must have operated on the Egyptian mind in this cult. The evil spirits that dwell in the lion, the crocodile, the hippopotamus, must be propitiated, and to this end the animal must be worshipped. The primitive mind cannot abstract the spirit from the animal it has chosen for a dwelling place. Again, it can scarce have been fear that impelled the worship of the bull, the cow, and such useful scavengers as the ebi, the vulture, and the sparrowhawk. Even in later times, when animism no longer prevailed, some traces of this early animal cult still remained in that various animals were looked upon as sacred to the gods. How the sacred animals came to be connected with their divinities we do not undertake to say. We shall here confine ourselves to an enumeration of the various sacred animals. The oldest and chief of these were the Apis, bull sacred to Ta, and the Nevis, bull sacred to Reharmachis. The cow was sacred to Isis, Hathor, and Nephthys, the ram to Amon and Chnum, the cat to Ra, Soket, Bast, and Tefnut, the lion to Poket and Soket, the Ebi and Cynocephalus were sacred to Thought. The jackal was sacred to Anubis. The sparrowhawk to Horus. The vulture to Nekebet. The asp to Watch. And the crocodile to Sebek. Frequently, the deities were depicted with the heads of their sacred animals. Thus, Horus always has the head of a sparrow hawk, Shnum, that of a ram, Thought, that of an ebi. Nephthys and Hathor are cow-headed, a solar disk being fixed between the horns. 
Other examples could be given, but these will suffice. From this early animism was developed, in the course of time, a polydemonism, that is, a belief in many demons or spirits. This is the second stage in religious development. The spirit has been abstracted from the animal, plant, or thing it inhabited and possessed, and has been given a separate, independent existence. From this polydemonism was later on developed polytheism, or the belief in many gods. How these changes came about we cannot say, for when we first come upon the Egyptian religion, it has gone through all of these stages, but it has retained numerous traces of this early development. This development must have taken place in the various gnomes before their union, and independently in each, for they present to us very varied religious beliefs. Each gnome had its own peculiar local divinities and its own local theosophy. The head of the local pantheon had his temple in the local capital. These local divinities were all supreme in their own localities, and it is them that the people worshipped, whatever divinity might be the head of the national pantheon. Every house had attached to it a chapel in which the local divinities were worshipped. These local deities were all, as a matter of policy, recognized by the national government as the guardian deities of their respective localities. The national religion was, in return, recognized by the various local governments, and the head of the national pantheon had dedicated to him a chapel in each of the local temples. The various religions of these gnomes, all in themselves polytheistic, united after the union to form that composite whole, the Egyptian religion, which we may well designate as an agglomerated polytheism. Thus we see that, just as from the union of the gnomes, and finally, of Upper and Lower Egypt, resulted the Egyptian state, so, from a union of the local religions of these gnomes, resulted the Egyptian religion. It has been already mentioned above that Nekebet was regarded as the guardian divinity of the South, and Wacha as that of the North. In many localities, the head of the local pantheon had associated with him two other divinities who shared his eminence and formed with him what we call a triad. Such a triad consisted generally of father, mother, and son. Thus, the triad of Memphis embraced Ta, his wife Soket, and their son, Imhotep, that of Abydos, Osiris, his wife Isis, and their son Horus, and that of Thebes, Amon, his wife Mut, and their son Chonsu. But we also find triads consisting of one male and two female members, possibly father, mother, and daughter. For example, that of Elephantine, Chnum, Satet, and Anuket. Another combination of gods is the Ennead, or circle of nine gods. The Ennead first appears in the fourth dynasty, about 3000 BC. It consists of nine members, combined 
in an apparently arbitrary manner. 1. Shu 2. Tefnut 3. Keb 4. Nut 5. Osiris 6. Isis 7. Horus 8. Set 9. Nephthys Where Shu and Tefnut are brother and sister, Keb and Nut, man and wife, parents of Osiris, Isis, Set, and Nephthys. Osiris, Isis, and Horus are father, mother, and son, and Set and Nephthys, man and wife. The Ennead was originated by the priests of On Heliopolis in order to bring into closer connection the various local religions. These priests claim that it was originated by Tum, a solar deity, who was in Heliopolis considered the leader of the Ennead, though standing outside of it. In fact, the Ennead which had national acceptance, was everywhere assigned a different deity, the head of the local pantheon as leader, though its membership remained fixed, except that in later times Set was eliminated and Horwer, a form of the god Horus, or Thought, put in his place. To many of the Egyptian gods, there has been ascribed a cosmological origin. Thus, Ta of Memphis and Chnum of Elephantine were in the very first line considered as world builders, or to use the scientific term, as demiurgoi, while the priests of On Heliopolis ascribed the same function to Ra and Tum. But we must not wonder at this multitude of world builders. It is but consistent with the entire character of the Egyptian religion. It is but natural that the important office of world builder should be ascribed in every locality to the head of the local pantheon. These were not, however, the cosmological gods proper. There was a number of other gods of undoubted cosmological origin that had not the slightest connection with any pantheon, some of which were worshipped by the people generally, while others were mere speculative deities, the full import of which was known to the priesthood alone. One of the chief divinities of the former class was Ranutet, the goddess of the harvest, who was recognized and worshipped throughout the land. She had her chapels and the granaries and her altars in the open field and was ardently worshipped by the great landowners as well as by the small farmers. Of her official cult we know nothing. Another popular cosmological figure was Ha-Pi, the god of the Nile, of whose cult, in the times of the New Empire, B.C. 1530 through 1050, we are well informed. Hundreds of hymns addressed to him have come down to us, all expressing a fervent devotion and sincere gratitude for his many good offices. Thousands of statuettes representing the god have also been preserved. With time, he assumed a national importance rivaled only by the heads of the great national religions, Ta, Ra, Osiris, and Amon. This is but natural for it is to this stream that Egypt owes all its prosperity, aye, its very existence. Min, 
the agricultural god of Kebti, Koptos, fifth upper Egyptian gnome, also belongs to this class of divinities. A typical representative of the second class is Chepra, the god of the mysterious becoming. He was a purely theosophical figure and had no hold on the popular mind. Results of cosmological speculation are likewise the eight gods of the elements, so-called the Ogdoas of Chimunu Hermopolis, the home of thought. They appear in four couples. One, none and nut. Two, he and Hehet. Three, Kek and Keket. And four, Nenu and Nenut. Originally, there were only the four male divinities, as they appear in the paintings on the walls of the tomb of Seti I, died about 1300 BC. The goddesses are later additions, their names being merely the feminine forms of those of the male divinities. The meaning ascribed to them is this. 1. None is the male generative principle of the universe, the father of Ra. Nut is the female conceptive principle, while together they personify the original chaos. 2. He and He Het personify eternity. 3. Kek and Keket darkness. And 4. Nenu and Nenut moisture. The full development of this curious cosmological doctrine seems to belong to a later theosophy. Another cosmological couple are Shu and his sister Tefnut. Shu is the god that supports the heavens and is in all probability a personification of the atmosphere. His sister Tefnut owes her existence merely to the desire of giving every god a female companion. Keb and Nut, his wife, are also a cosmological couple. He is a personification of the earth, she of the heavens. They are given a place in one of the acknowledged national religions as parents of Osiris, Isis, Set, and Nephthys. Egyptian name Nebhat. There were several deities that owed their existence to pure speculation and had, as a rule, no connection with the pantheons. The most important of these was Mat, the goddess of truth and justice, who is the personification of these qualities. She had national importance as Lady Patroness of Justice and its ministers the judges, who were all priests of Mat. There is little reason to doubt the statement of Herodotus that the judges wore her picture on their breasts. Of her cult, however, we know nothing. Safchet, the goddess of wisdom, of which she is a personification, was regarded as the wife of thought and was no doubt a very old figure in the theosophy of Chimunu Hermopolis. Thought himself, as a result of speculation, the personification of learning and wisdom, the scribe of the gods, and as such the patron of scribes. He has in this capacity national recognition. His home, Chimunu, seems to have been a great seat of speculative theosophy. Besides these many divinities, 
and our space has not permitted us to name more than the most important ones. Untold legions of demons, some attached to a particular pantheon, others floating about in wild and unrestrained freedom, help to complicate the religion. Osiris alone had forty-two demons attached to his person as associate judges in the court that sat in the lower world, in that part of it known as the Hall of the Two Truths, and tried the departed souls to judge of their worthiness to enter the blessed abodes. Each of these had a peculiarly absurd name, which the dead man had to know, and to each one he had to make a special negative confession. Besides these forty-two judges, unnumbered good and evil spirits peopled the lower world, all of which the dead man had to know and name at sight. It is only of these spirits of the Amenti, as the Egyptians called the lower world, that we know the names, and to some extent the natures. It was, by the by, far more important to know the former than the latter, for by merely calling him by name, the dead man could bring to his aid a good spirit or exercise an evil one. To know the demon was to have power over him, so that the outlook of the poor soul was not so bad after all. The rite of circumcision, so extensively practiced by the ancient Egyptians, has been brought into connection with this belief in demons. It is conjectured that this rite was originally a substitute for human sacrifice which may have been practiced in prehistoric times. Now we inquire in what relation the various local religions stood to one another. Part of them remained in obscurity, having only local significance. Part came with time to have national import, and it is now our object to inquire into the cause of this. Eight of these religions came with time to have national sway, those of Ta of Memphis, of Ra of Heliopolis, Osiris of Abydos, Amon of Thebes, Sabak of Crocodilopolis, Nayat of Sais, Hathor of Dendera, and Horus of Edfu. The causes of this lay partly in the character of the religion itself, partly in the history of the nation. Three religions seem to have come into prominence much at the same time, those of Ra, Osiris, and Ta. Ra owes his early prominence to the fact that he was the solar deity par excellence. He was looked upon as the first divine king of Egypt. His religion is of peculiar interest to us, for it finally culminated in a solar monotheism under Amenhotep the fourth, about 1382 through 1370 B.C., who set up Aten, the solar disk, as the supreme and, to a certain extent, the only god of Egypt. After the suppression of this reform, Ra seems rapidly to have lost his national prestige and to have sunk to the rank of the local deity of Heliopolis, becoming merged with Amon as Amon-Ra. Osiris also owes his early prominence to religious reasons. He was god of the dead, the ruler of the Amenti, and as such was a prominent figure in all epochs of Egyptian history. Together with him, Horus and his mother Isis, and Nebat, Nephthys, the sister of Osiris, came into prominence. Set, his brother, 
gained an unenviable notoriety through the Osiris mythology as the evil god, the great enemy of his brother Osiris. Anubis is also drawn into the circle by being made the son of Osiris and Nebhat. Ta was originally merely the head of the Memphitic pantheon, and as such was no more than the head of any other local pantheon. The rise of Mena, however, the union of the north and south, and the fact that through this union Memphis became the capital of the United Kingdom gave him a commanding place in the national pantheon. He became the god of the government, and as such the chief god of the nation. And even after Amon had succeeded him in this position, he held a high place in the religion, until under the Ptolemies he was merged with Osiris into the new god Serapis, who was imported from Asia Minor and given out as a union of Osiris and the Apis bull, the sacred animal of Ta. At the close of the Old Empire, about 2400 BC, there is a gap in Egyptian history, and it is not until 2100 BC that we again stand on firm ground, and then it is Thebes that is the capital of Egypt and as a consequence, the head of its local pantheon, Amon, a deity hitherto obscure, is the official head of the national pantheon. He retained this position throughout the 11th and 12th dynasties, but in the 13th dynasty, about 1930 BC, he seems to have surrendered the supremacy to Sebak of Crocodilopolis in the Fayum, Sebak did not retain his position long, for the 13th dynasty ended in anarchy, and soon after its fall the Hyksos invaded Egypt. For several centuries the foreign invaders ruled supreme, but about 1530 BC they were driven out by Achmes I, a Theban king, and Thebes again became the capital of Egypt. As one consequence of this, Amon again became the official head of the pantheon. But about 1400 BC, he was again dethroned when King Amenhotep IV, Chuenaten, instituted the religious reform above mentioned. Unfortunately, the reform was short-lived, dying soon after its founder. Again. Amon, now called Amon-Ra, ruled supreme. Through all the vicissitudes of Egyptian history, he held his own, even extending his sway to the neighboring kingdom of Napata, founded in Ethiopia early in the 10th century BC, probably by the descendants of the priest kings of Dynasty 21, who had been driven from Egypt by Sheshong I until finally when Semtek I founded the 26th dynasty, he gave way to Neit of Sais. She seems to have retained the place at the head of the national pantheon until the times of the Ptolemies, when Hathor of Denderah and Horus of Edfu shared the supremacy with Serapis. They too finally passed away with the advent of Christianity. Alone, of all the old deities, Isis retained her sway, even in Christian times, well into the 4th century AD on the island of Philae, but she too finally yielded and passed away before the new religion. Such is as adequate a sketch of the Egyptian religion as can be given in the space allotted. The reader will observe that the religion was not a homogeneous whole, the result of a continuous development along one line of thought, but a heterogeneous mass, the resultant of the union of a large number of religions, each of itself 
polytheistic in nature, and that with so little fusion of the component parts that we have all through the history of this curious religion three or four, and in later times as many as eight, essentially different religions having national recognition, and a large number of local religions running side by side. The reader will further observe that there is no trace of an original monotheism, and that the monotheism which was developed from the Ra religion was a very imperfect one and was far from being original, the result of many centuries of thought and speculation. The old empire, from the union of the upper and lower countries to the close of the Sixth Dynasty, about 3200 through 2400 B.C. Section 1. The First Dynasty Mena, 3200 B.C. The great king who first united Upper and Lower Egypt into one country lived not later than 3200 B.C. How many years earlier he lived we have no means of saying. He may have lived 500 or even a thousand years earlier, but until we can assign him an accurately correct date, it is best to retain the one here given. Naturally, he occupies a high place in Egyptian tradition, being regarded as the first human king of the country. His birthplace was the small town of Teni, Greek Thys, near Abydos. This town was not, however, favorably located for the capital of a great empire, so Mena left it and removed the seat of the government to the city of Memphis, which lay on the Nile a little to the south of the apex of the delta. This city was the home of the god Ta, who thus became the official head of the Egyptian pantheon. The site of this city was on the left bank of the Nile, a little above the modern city of Cairo. At the modern village of Mitrahin, a few mounds of rubbish and some scattered ruins still mark the place where once stood one of the greatest and richest cities of all antiquity. The Egyptian name of the city was Menefer the good or beautiful abode, from which the Greek name Memphis, by which we designate the city, was derived. Every city of ancient Egypt had two names, a common or profane name and a sacred name, derived either from the name of its god or from some mythological event located at it. The sacred name of Menefer was Hetka Ta, the abode of the spirit of Ta. It was defended by a citadel called Anbuhech, the White Wall. The city itself was probably far older than the time of Mena, but in transferring the capital to it, the king naturally greatly enlarged it and came to be considered first its benefactor, and later on its founder. What we know of this king has come to us through the Greek historians and Manetho. All that is usually ascribed to the founders of empire is ascribed to him. The legends related of him are mostly absurd. He is said to have founded the Temple of Ta at Memphis, which was the first Egyptian temple, to have first organized the temple ritual, and to have introduced the cult of the Apis bull, all of which stories are alike incredible. As above noted, Memphis and its cult existed long before Mena's time. He is also said to have invented the alphabet. The most absurd story 
is that told by Diodorus, who relates that the king had once upon a time, when pursued by his own hounds, fled into Lake Maris, and had been brought to shore by a crocodile, and in gratitude for this rescue, he had built Crocodilopolis on the lake shore, had instituted the crocodile cult, and given over the lake to these Saurians. Then he had built a pyramid here for his tomb, and had founded the celebrated labyrinth. In reality, the lake did not yet exist in these early times. Having been built by Amenhotep III, almost two thousand years later. Crocodilopolis, the pyramid, and the labyrinth were built by this same pharaoh. Footnote. The word pharaoh, which was taken over into the modern languages from the Bible, is derived from the Egyptian word perea, the great house, a common designation of the king. End footnote. Almost as absurd is the legend that he was an effeminate king, devoted to the pleasures of the table, and had first taught his subjects to take a reclining posture while eating. In the first place, founders of empire are not made of such stuff, and in the second place, the custom in Egypt was not to recline, but to sit at table. The king is also represented as a patron of poets. More trustworthy is what Manetho tells us of this king. He was a mighty warrior who campaigned in Libya and was killed by a hippopotamus. This agrees well with what we would expect of a founder of empire. He was a warlike ruler and was killed while hunting. According to Manetho, he ruled about sixty years. Teta, whom the Greek writers called Atathis I, succeeded Mena. According to the extract from Manetho, made by Africanus, he ruled fifty-seven years. According to that made by Eusebius, he reigned only twenty-seven. Manetho relates that he built the citadel of Memphis and wrote a work on anatomy. This latter notice is to some extent confirmed by a passage of the medical Papyrus Ebers, in which a hair restorer is said to have been invented by Shesh, the mother of our ruler. A two-headed crane is said to have appeared in his reign, a phenomenon that presaged a long period of prosperity. Of Atet, Aetathus II, whom Manetho called Kenkenes, nothing is known beyond the fact that he ruled thirty-two years. In the reign of Atta, the Oenephes of Manetho, who ruled twenty-three years, a great famine prevailed in Egypt. He is said to have erected a pyramid at Kochome, near Saqqara. Hesepti, the Usafaides of Manetho, who ruled twenty years, is quite a literary character among these kings. A remedy for leprosy, which was afterward copied in a medical papyrus preserved in Berlin and in the Papyrus Ebers, is said to date from his reign. Numerous copies of the sixty-fourth chapter of the Book of the Dead assert that this chapter was discovered in his reign, and not in that of Mycerinos, while all copies agree that the 130th chapter dates from this reign. Merbapen, the Miebidos of Manetho, reigned nineteen years. He must have been quite an important ruler, for the list of kings discovered at Saqqara begins with his name. Sementa, the Sememsis of Manetho, ruled eighteen years. It is related that many miracles took place in his reign, 
and that a great plague almost depopulated the land. Of Kebhu, the Bienches of Manetho, we know only that he ruled twenty-six years. Section 2. The Second Dynasty. Nadarbau, the Retjau of the list of kings found at Abydos, the Boethos of Manetho, reigned thirty-eight years. Manetho relates that during his reign an earthquake at Bubastis swallowed up many people. Kakau, the Kaichos of Manetho, reigned twenty-nine years. According to Manetho, he introduced the cult of the Apis bull at Memphis, that of the Menevis bull at Heliopolis, and that of the ram at Mendes. This legend is incredible and unhistorical. These cults were all as old as the cities in which they were practiced, and antedated the union of the two countries by many centuries. Ba and Netter, whom Manetho calls Binothris, reigned forty seven years. He seems to have been an important lawgiver. If we can credit the account of Manetho, it was this pharaoh who first legalized the succession in the female line. This was of great importance throughout the course of Egyptian history, for according to this law, a woman could sit on the Egyptian throne, and many a dynasty based its right to the throne on the law of female succession. Of Watchness, the Tlas of Manetho, we know only that he reigned seventeen years. Sent, called Sethanes by Manetho, who ruled forty-one years, is said to have revised a medical treatise written in the reign of Hesepti. Perabsen, possibly the Chires of Manetho, reigned seventeen years. Neferkara, the Neferceres of Manetho, is said to have ruled twenty-five years. Under him, Manetho says the Nile ran honey for eleven days. Maspero, following Mariette, places in this dynasty some monuments which are certainly older than the times of the fourth dynasty. They are few in number, but show certain striking peculiarities which prove that they belong together. But we cannot fully verify this very plausible hypothesis until we have more of these monuments. For the present, it is certainly better not to ascribe them to any particular period, but to say merely that they are older than the times of the fourth dynasty. The same may be said of the great Sphinx of Giza, the age of which is unknown. Section 3. The Third Dynasty How the Second Dynasty Came to an End and the Third Ascended the Throne We Do Not Know In fact, our knowledge of the first three dynasties is limited to the names of the rulers and a few legends. Neferkasokar was the first king of this dynasty. Manetho calls him Necherophes and ascribes to him a reign of twenty-eight years. The same historian relates that in this reign the Libyans revolted, but as the battle was about to begin, they became frightened at seeing the moon apparently greatly enlarged and fled from the field. Tosorthos ruled twenty-nine years. Manetho relates that he was a great builder and had perfected the system of writing. He was also a great physician, and for this reason had been identified with Asclepius by the Greeks. Of the other rulers of this dynasty, we know only the names. Huni, the last of these kings, 
the Kerferes of Manetho, who ruled twenty-six years, was the immediate predecessor of King Snefru, the founder of the Fourth Dynasty. Section 4. The Fourth Dynasty. The Pyramid Builders. About 2830 through 2700 B.C. Snefru. 2830 through 2806 B.C. The founder of the Fourth Dynasty ascended the throne about 2830 B.C. The change of dynasty seems to have been peaceably accomplished. Papyrus Pris, the only text that refers to it, remarks, quote, Then King Huni died, and King Snefru became a beneficent ruler over the entire land. End quote. He is the first king from whose reign monuments have come down to us. He and his successors built for their tombs great pyramids, forming a line miles in length, from Giza on the north to Medoum on the south. King Snefru, in all probability, is buried in the pyramid of Medoum, about which lie the tombs of many of his courtiers. The Egyptian name of the pyramid was Che. Its builder was Henka. Of historical events of this reign, we know but little. A legendary papyrus, preserved in St. Petersburg, tells of an incursion of the Asiatic Bedouins, known as Amu. To guard against these inroads, a line of forts was established stretching across the Egyptian part of the Isthmus of Suez. This string of forts is frequently mentioned in the texts, and its official name, Anbu Heku, Wall of the Princes, gave rise to the mistaken impression that the Egyptians had built a wall across their eastern frontier. One of these forts, named after King Snefru, Ea Snefru, is mentioned in the memoirs of a noble who lived over a thousand years later. But King Snefru was not content with repelling the inroads of the Asiatics. He was bent on enlarging his empire. On the Sinai Peninsula, there were located rich copper and malachite mines, which the Egyptians worked in very early times. Whether Snefru was the first king who opened these mines, or whether they had been opened to the Egyptians by some previous king, we do not undertake to say. But it is a fact that he is the first king of whom monuments have been found on the peninsula. Inscriptions at both of the great mining camps at Sarbut el Kadem and Wadi Maghara tell of the king's campaigns against the Bedouins of the region, who were called Mentiu Satet, and who seem to have seriously resented the encroachment of the Egyptians. They were, of course, beaten, but could never be wholly subdued, and gave much trouble in later reigns. Snefru died after a prosperous reign of twenty-four years. Chufu 2806 through 2782 B.C. When Snefru died, he left to his oldest son and successor a great and flourishing kingdom. This king is the Cheops of Herodotus. He is the builder of the largest of the three great pyramids of Giza, the measurements of which are side of square base, originally 764 feet, at present 746 feet. Perpendicular height, originally 480 feet, now 450 feet. And height of slope, originally 611 feet, at present 568 feet. Inside of this great mass of solid masonry, there is the chamber in which the sarcophagus of the king was deposited. 
this chamber is approached by a series of narrow passages, which were, after the sarcophagus was in place, blocked up in a very ingenious manner. The Egyptian name of this pyramid was Chut. I may here mention some general facts which hold good for all the pyramids of Giza. Each one had connected with it a funereal temple dedicated to the memory of the king buried in the pyramid. All of the pyramids were built as planned, a fact that the recent measurements of W. Flinders Petrie have demonstrated beyond a doubt. Thus, the old theory that every king, when he ascended the throne, began a pyramid of moderate proportions and gradually enlarged it as he found he had the time, is exploded. The reader will find a full expose of these facts in Mr. Petrie's admirable book, The Pyramids and Temples of Giza. About each pyramid lay a number of smaller pyramids, probably the tombs of the members of the royal families, as well as the tombs of the nobles that had lived at the court. This king was a great builder. The temple of the Lady of the Pyramids, Isis, and the foundation of the Temple of Hathor at Dendera are attributed to him. Two cities, Menet Chufu, the modern Minya, north of Hermopolis, and Chufu Kebet, bear his name. Like his predecessor, he was compelled to make a campaign against the Mentiu Satet on the Sinai Peninsula, who it seems had again begun to molest the Egyptian miners. The classical accounts of this king are all unreliable. Herodotus gives him a reign of fifty years, and Manetho says he reigned sixty-three, while we know from the Turin Papyrus that he ruled only twenty-four years. The classical historians would also have him appear as a great tyrant who closed the temples in order that the Egyptians might all labor continuously at his pyramid, and who, when money failed him, prostituted his own daughter in order to raise funds. The chief responsibility for these stories rests on Herodotus. Manetho attempts to reconcile history and legend by relating that the king, whom he calls Sophus, had repented in his old age and had written a book that was regarded as sacred. Rodadef, 2782-2759 through 2759 B.C. The son and successor of Chufu, who ruled twenty-three years, did not build the pyramid. Why he departed from the custom begun by his two predecessors, we cannot say. Perhaps the forces and resources of the kingdom were otherwise employed. We know, however, absolutely nothing of this comparatively long reign. Chafra, 2758-2750 through 2750 B.C. The Chephren of Herodotus is the builder of the second great pyramid of Giza, the Egyptian name of which is Oer, the Great One. This pyramid is somewhat smaller than that of Chafra's father, Chufu, but it is still of respectable size. Its dimensions are length of side of square base, originally 707 feet, now 690 feet. Perpendicular height, originally 454 and one quarters feet, now 447 feet. Inclined height, originally 572 feet, at present 563 feet. Like all the other pyramids of Giza, this one is built of blocks of limestone taken from the quarries of Tura, Egyptian name Rueu, 
in the hills on the east bank of the Nile, opposite Memphis. All the pyramids were built so that their sides resembled the great steps, and then these steps were filled in with granite blocks, so placed that they formed a smooth, continuous, inclined surface. Part of this coating of granite is still left on the upper part of this pyramid. Before this pyramid, a little to the south of the Great Sphinx, there stands a large temple built of granite and alabaster, which was most probably erected at Shafra's order. The fact that it stands in front of his pyramid proves conclusively that it was built after that structure. In a well in the interior of this temple were found the fragments of nine exquisitely wrought diorite statues of the king. Seven of these are at present in the Museum of Bulak, one of them being almost unharmed. How these statues got in the well we do not know. The temple itself is also a mystery. It may have been Shafra's funereal temple, but it may just as well have been erected to the Sphinx, the image of Reharmachis, or to any other deity. Of him also, the classical historians relate that he was a great tyrant, who systematically oppressed his subjects in order to be able to complete his great pyramid. But there is absolutely no foundation for these stories. He died after a reign of only eight years. Menkaure, 2749-2724 through 2724 B.C. The Mycerinos of Herodotus succeeded Chafra. Herodotus tells us this pharaoh was celebrated for his great piety and righteousness, and the Egyptian monuments bear this out. They tell us that he sent out his son, Hordedef, to inspect the temples of the land, and that while on this tour of inspection, the prince had discovered the sixty-fourth chapter of the Book of the Dead at Hermopolis, Chimunu. Some copies of the thirtieth chapter of the same compilation state that it also was found in this reign. Several later texts mention this prince. The celebrated minstrel's song quotes one of his sayings, and a letter written in the time of Ramses II speaks of the difficulty of understanding his writings. The story, related by some Greek authors, that the oracle of Buto had predicted to him that he would die young, and that he had consequently spent day and night in dissipation in order to double his life, is utterly untrustworthy. His tomb is the third and smallest of the pyramids of Giza. Its dimensions are Side of square base, 354 and a half feet Perpendicular height, originally 218 feet now 203 feet. Height of incline, originally 278 feet, now 261 feet. The order to erect this structure and the account of the work are given in an unfortunately extremely mutilated inscription in one of the tombs of Giza. The name of the pyramid was Heri, Although a systematic attempt to destroy this pyramid was made in 1196 A.D., it is the best preserved of all the pyramids of Giza. In the chamber, Vise found the stone sarcophagus and fragments of the wooden mummy case of this king. The former was lost in a shipwreck. The latter are preserved in the British Museum. How long this pharaoh ruled we cannot say, as the Turin Papyrus has a break at his name. We must, therefore, for the present, take the years given by the most trustworthy of the classical writers, 
Manetho, who states the king ruled twenty-five years. Shepseskaf, 2723-2701 through 2701 B.C. Of this king we know very little. An interesting description was found in the tomb of his favorite, Tashepses. This man was born in the reign of Menkaure and was educated together with the royal princes. His career as an official falls almost entirely within Shepseskov's reign. This king gave his favorite, his daughter Meache, in marriage and heaped honors upon him. It is a characteristic fact that neither in this biography nor in any other inscription of this time do we meet with any mention of warlike expeditions. The monuments, however, make frequent mention of the king's trips through the country, of festivals, and of buildings erected by the pharaoh. Herodotus tells us that the successor of Mycerinos, whom he calls Asychus, built a pyramid of brick and enlarged the southern peristyle of the Ta Temple of Memphis. Diodorus, who calls him Sassychus, mentions him as one of the five great lawgivers of Egypt. One of his alleged laws is mentioned by Herodotus, allowing a debtor to pawn his father's mummy. In case the mummy were not redeemed, he would lose for himself and family the right of burial. Diodorus also states that this pharaoh regulated the ritual and invented the geometry and the art of observing the stars. Of these stories, it is safe to accept only what relates to the building operations of the king. According to Manetho, he ruled 22 years. Two kings, Sebercheres and Tamphthys, are mentioned by Manetho as belonging to this dynasty, but their names have not yet been found on the monuments. Section 5. The Fifth Dynasty, 2700 through 2560 B.C. The change of dynasty seems to have been peaceably accomplished, for we find that men who had held office under the preceding dynasty were retained by the kings of the new house. Possibly, the direct male line had died out, and the new line came to the throne by the right of female succession. Userkov, 2700-2693 B.C. The first king of this dynasty was the immediate successor of Shepseskaf, as is proved by the inscription of Sechemkare, who held official positions under kings Chafra, Menkare, Shepseskaf, Userkaf, and Sahure. All we know of this pharaoh is that he ruled seven years and was buried in a pyramid called Abasu. Sahure, 2692-2680 through 2680 B.C., had to repel inroads of the Mentiu Satet, who had again begun to molest the Egyptian miners on the Sinai Peninsula. He founded the city of Persahure, north of Esne, and built a temple to the goddess Sochet, the wife of Ta, in Memphis. His pyramid, Cheba, lies north of Abusir. Sahure ruled twelve years. Neferarkare, 2679 through 2672 BC. The successor of Sahure is called Kaka in the list of Abydos. He died after a reign of seven years and was buried in a pyramid called Ba. Of Shepseskare, 2761 through 2759 BC, we know only that he reigned twelve years. Of Ates, we know nothing. Neferbare reigned probably ten years. 
Akauhor is another ruler of whom we know absolutely nothing. An, whose pronomon was Userenre, was the first king to adopt a throne name. Hitherto, the kings had kept the names they had borne as princes, but now the kings took a new name on ascending the throne. This name was always compounded with the name of the god Ra, and was the official name of the ruler, by which he was designated in all state documents. The name of Ra was chosen in all probability because this god was considered as the first divine king of Egypt. The king, however, retained his old name, placing before it the title Sa-Ra, son of Ra. Thus, An's name now was King of Upper and Lower Egypt, Usur en Ra, the son of Ra, An. Not content with these two names, the pharaohs took three other names on ascending the throne, answering to the three titles, Horus, Lord of Both Lands, and Horus Nubti, that is, Horus the Conqueror of Set. In olden times, the kings used one and the same name with these three titles. Thus, the full name of Amenemhat I was the Horus Nem Mesut, Renewer of Births, Lord of Both Lands. Nem Mesut Horus Nubti, Nem Mesut King of Upper and Lower Egypt, Sehotep Abra, the son of Ra, Amenemhat. In later times, the pharaohs took a separate name with each title. Thus, the full name of Ramses II was Horus, the strong steer, beloved of Mat, lord of both lands, he that protecteth Egypt and subdueth the barbarians, Horus Nubti, rich in years, great in victories, king of upper and lower Egypt, Ra Usur Mat Setep En Ra, that is, Ra, strong in truth, chosen of Ra, the son of Ra, Ramesu Meri Amon, Ramses, beloved of Amon. Frequently, other titles are added, and the titulature becomes a hymn on the king. An warred on the Sinai Peninsula with the Mentiu Satet. He died after a reign of ten years. Menkauhor ruled eight years. All we know of him is that he, too, worked at the copper and malachite mines of the Sinai. Dedkara Asa ruled twenty-eight years. In the fourth year of his reign, he sent an expedition to Wadi Maghara on the Sinai. He is the first pharaoh whose name we meet with in the quarries of the Wadi Hamamat, although undoubtedly, already, King Chafra worked them. Unas was the last king of this dynasty. With his name, the Turin Papyrus concludes a division and sums up the number of years since Mena, in all 650. It thus would seem that his death marked an epoch in Egyptian history but our information about this period is so meager that we cannot say what great event can have taken place at this time. Unas had been appointed co-regent by his father, Asa. He does not seem to have undertaken any warlike expeditions. He was, however, a great builder, erecting a temple to the goddess Hathor near Memphis. In the Fayoum, there was a city called Unas after him, and probably founded by him. The diorite he needed for these works he quarried in Hamamat. After a reign of thirty years, the king died. Section 6
the Sixth Dynasty, about 2560 through 2400 BC. Teta was the founder of the new dynasty and seems to have been the immediate successor of Unas. It would seem, however, that the new dynasty did not gain the throne without a struggle. Two kings are mentioned who belong about in this time, Ati and Imhotep, both of whom quarried stone in the Wadi Hamamat. They were most probably pretenders to the crown. Teta triumphed over all his rivals and ascended the throne about 2560 BC. Whatever struggle there was seems to have been short-lived and is not mentioned in the inscriptions. These inscriptions are chiefly those of nobles, and though they are, despite their brevity, accurate biographies, recounting the possessions and offices of the nobles they treat of, they touch on matters of state only incidentally. Of the history of this king, we know absolutely nothing. Manetho has preserved a legend that he was murdered by one of his bodyguard. According to the same historian, he ruled thirty years. This pharaoh was buried in a pyramid near Saqqara, which was opened in 1881. The Egyptian name of the structure was Dedasu. The opening of this pyramid was of the greatest importance for religious history, but of none whatever for secular history, the walls being covered with long religious texts containing not the slightest historical allusion. After Teta, the list of Abydos mentions a king Osir Kara, of whom we know nothing. Perhaps this was the king's throne name and was put here by mistake. Meri Ra Pepi, 2530-2510 through 2510 B.C., who ascended the throne about 2530 B.C., is the greatest monarch of this dynasty. Pepi was the immediate successor of Teta, but we do not know whether he was related to his predecessor or not. Pepi's empire embraced all of Egypt and the Sinai Peninsula. In the eighteenth year of his reign, he sent an expedition to the Wadi Magara and was compelled to punish the Mentiu, who had again become troublesome. In the same year, he also sent an expedition to Rohanu, Wadi Hamamat, to quarry stones for some temples he was erecting. His name also appears in the sandstone quarries of Gebel Silsila, and he is the first king of whose operations here we have any tidings, though assuredly the quarries had been worked by many of his predecessors. We know that he built in Tanis, and an inscription on the walls of the temple of Dendera relates that he had found the old plan of this building prepared in King Chufu's time. He also founded a city, the governor of which, Beba, is buried at Shech Said. The greater part of what we know of his reign is gleaned from the inscription of a noble named Una. This noble began his career under King Teta in minor offices. Under Pepi, he rapidly gained distinction, rising to high offices. Early in Pepe's reign, he was made judge and acquitted himself so well in a very delicate case that he was given the exalted title of Only Friend to the Pharaoh and was appointed governor of the Nubian district. He now conducted, in conjunction with a justice of lower rank, a case brought by the king against Queen Amset. The case was a very delicate one, and conducted with the utmost secrecy. We do not hear the cause of action, or the outcome of the case. 
the king was highly pleased with Una's conduct of this case, and heaped new honors upon him. The Amu Heriusha, as the Egyptians called the Syrian Bedouins, at this time began to make inroads on Egyptian territory, and it was determined to punish them. A vast army was collected from all parts of Egypt and Nubia, drilled and disciplined under the direction of Una. With this army he marched against the enemy, and in five successive campaigns completely routed them. Their strongholds were taken and destroyed, their crops were burned, their cattle driven off, vast numbers of prisoners were taken, and their country was left completely devastated and almost depopulated. Pepe died soon after the close of this war, after a reign of twenty years, and was buried in his pyramid, which bore the name of Menifer, the same as that of Memphis. This pyramid, which lies near Saqqara, was opened in 1881. Its walls are covered with long religious inscriptions. Meren Ra Horem Saf, 2509 through 2502 BC. On Pepe's death, his son Meren Ra ascended the throne. Of him we know little outside of what Una tells us. This noble was made a prince by the new ruler and appointed governor of the south. In this capacity, he highly distinguished himself. He made two enumerations of the south, that is, twice took the census of his province, a thing that had never been done before, and that gained him great praise from the king. He was then ordered to bring a granite sarcophagus and fittings for the king's pyramid from the quarries at Elephantine. The fact that only one man of war was needed to escort six transports and six other vessels is a significant proof of the extent of the Egyptian power in these early times. We have already seen that Pepe I conscripted troops from the Nubian districts bordering on Egypt. In an expedition undertaken somewhat later, Una pressed Nubian tribes into his service to cut timber and build boats. Most probably, these tribes had been subdued already by King Chufu when he opened the granite quarries on the first cataract. These tribes most probably stood in a relation of semi-dependence to Egypt. They certainly retained their tribal relations and their autonomy, but were compelled to serve in the Egyptian army in case of war, and to assist the expeditions that were sent to Aswan. Outside of this, we know of this reign only that the king made a tour of inspection on which he visited the quarries of Aswan, and that he sent an expedition to the Wadi Hamamat. According to Manetho, he ruled only seven years. He was entombed in his pyramid, which was named Chanofer. This pyramid was opened in 1881, and it was found that the walls were covered with inscriptions analogous to those found in the pyramid of his father. In the sarcophagus chamber was found the carefully embalmed and well-preserved mummy of the king, which was brought to Bulak. The body is that of a young man, which well accords with the short reign ascribed to him by Manetho. Neferkare, Pepe II, 2501 through 2411 B.C. On Marenra's death, his brother, Neferkare, ascended the throne. He corresponds to Manetho's King Phiops, who ruled one hundred years, as the Turin Papyrus gives Pepe II over ninety years. All that we know of him is that he sent an expedition 
to the copper mines of Wadi Maghara on the Sinai. This king was buried in a pyramid near Saqqara, the Egyptian name of which was Menanch. It was opened in 1881 and contained the same texts as the others. The close of this dynasty is shrouded in darkness. We know a few of the names belonging here, but of not one of the kings after Pepi II do we know the history. Thus, we hear of a king ment em a king Nefrus, and a king Ab. Neitaker, the Nitokris of the classical authors, belongs in this dynasty, though we cannot give her her exact place. Her name is mentioned on none of the monuments, but many a legend is related of her. Herodotus tells us that after a reign of scarce one year, King Menthesophis was murdered, and his sister and wife, the beautiful one with the rosy cheeks, succeeded him. She resolved to avenge her husband and brother. To this end, she had a great hall built underground, which was connected with the waters of the Nile. The river was prevented from entering by mighty floodgates. To this hall she invited all who were implicated in the murder of her husband to a banquet. When this was at its height, she herself opened the floodgates, and the waters of the Nile streaming in, all the guests perished. Then, to avoid the vengeance of the murderer's friends, she threw herself into a large chamber filled with glowing coal and was burned up. The same historian further relates that in her reign of seven years she had enlarged the pyramid of Mycerinos and had coated its apex with granite. There is as little foundation for one of these tales as for the other. The latter story is disproved by the fact that the third pyramid shows no traces of having been rebuilt or enlarged. An Arabic legend is also connected with Nitokris, or rather with the third pyramid. To the present day, the Arabs dwelling about the pyramids believe that the ghost of the southern pyramid hovers about it in the shape of a beautiful naked woman, whom she sets eyes on, her smile infatuates. But she is a great coquette, alternately attracting and repelling her victim until he becomes insane and wanders aimless through the land. Many and many a one, say they, has seen her, especially at noon and sunset, hovering about her pyramid. From the seventh dynasty to the close of the twelfth, the transition period and the Middle Empire, about 2400 through 1930 B.C. Section 1 the Transition Period, Dynasties 7 through 11. This was a period of frequent revolutions. King after king ascended the throne, but it was a long time before a king arose who succeeded in securing a firm hold on the reins of state. It is next to impossible to give even a chronological list of the kings who ruled in this period, which must have covered some two hundred years, and perhaps more. It is owing to this gap, and one that we shall meet with later, that the chronology of the earlier periods of Egypt is so very uncertain. From conditions existing in the times of the Twelfth Dynasty, it would seem that the great hereditary princes of the realm, the Nomar Choi, succeeded in winning some considerable independence during this period. It is but natural that in a time when the kings felt anything but secure on the throne, they should seek to enlist the support of the nobility, 
and be ready to purchase that support by according them greater privileges than they had hitherto enjoyed. These nobles were a very shrewd lot, and no doubt made the best of the bargain by selling their support to the highest bidder. It was in all probability this inordinate strengthening of the nobility that finally led to the rise of the Theban princes and to their accession to the throne under the founder of the eleventh dynasty. This was significant for the entire future of Egypt, as Thebes controlled the destinies of the kingdom for over a thousand years. Manetho gives only a list of dynasties for this period as follows. Seventh Dynasty Memphitic Seventy Kings in Seventy Days According to Eusebius, Five Kings in Seventy-Five Years Eighth Dynasty Memphitic Twenty-Seven Kings in One Hundred Forty-six years. Ninth Dynasty, from Hera Cleopolis, twenty-seven kings in four hundred nine years. Sinchelis, four kings in one hundred years. Tenth Dynasty, from Hera Cleopolis, seventeen kings in one hundred eighty-five years. Of the names, Manetho gives only that of King Akthos, the founder of the Ninth Dynasty, of whom he relates that he was the most barbarous and inhuman king that had hitherto ruled in Egypt. He committed many crimes, and was finally stricken with insanity, and killed by a crocodile. It is a probable conjecture that Manetho wishes to convey the impression that this king was a foreign invader. In all probability, the Amu Heriusha, whom Una had so effectually crushed, had been left alone by Mary Ra's immediate successors, and had again gathered sufficient strength to renew their attacks on Egypt. If this is so, the attack must not have come until after Neferka Ra's long reign. It seems that this time the barbarians had it all their own way and had finally succeeded in conquering the country. This hypothesis receives some confirmation, however slight, from the fact that a semi-legendary papyrus mentions combats with the Heriusha under kings Chiruti and Ameno. Judging from the names, Ameno was probably one of the kings of the eleventh dynasty, and these battles were then fought in delivering Egypt from the foreign invader. Section 2. The Middle Empire. Dynasties 11 and 12. The eleventh dynasty. With the founder of this dynasty, the Theban princes ascended the throne of Egypt. These kings seem to have delivered Egypt from the yoke of the foreign invader, the war possibly being begun by Chiruti and Ameno, though we nowhere find any mention of this fact. The first of these princes mentioned in the lists of kings is the Erpeti, that is, hereditary prince, Antef. The three succeeding kings are designated as Hor, and the fourth successor of Antef is the first one to bear the full titulature of Egyptian kings. From this fact, the conclusion has been drawn that the first Antef was merely prince of Thebes, that his next successors had gradually enlarged their sway until they ruled over all of Upper Egypt and had assumed the title Hor, signifying ruler of Upper Egypt, and that finally 
the fourth successor of Antef, had succeeded in conquering all of Egypt, and had consequently assumed the full titulature of the Egyptian kings. This conjecture is entirely unwarranted. It is probable that these rulers delivered Egypt from the yoke of the foreign invader, but any attempt to read the history of the war from the titles of these kings is futile. The founder of the dynasty, Prince Antef, in all probability, was the man with whom the national movement began, though he possibly died before other princes had recognized his authority, and owes his place in the list of kings to the fact that his dynasty based their claim to the throne on him. To translate the title of Hor as ruler of Upper Egypt or as duke is not admissible. Hor was one of the titles of the Egyptian kings. The word signifies Horus, and this title was given the king because he was looked upon as the Horus on earth. The order of succession of these kings is not certain, and we therefore deem it advisable to group them according to their names. This will give us two groups, one of kings whose names were all the same, Antef, and another of kings whose names were all the same, Mentuhotep. Any other arrangement would be equally arbitrary, while lacking the clearness of this. The Antef Kings Antef Ea, that is, the Great with the throne name Ra Sechem Upmat, is the only king of this line, of whose family relations we have any knowledge. A note on his sarcophagus informs us that his younger brother and successor, Anantef Ra Sechem Her Hermat, had the sarcophagus made. This sarcophagus is in the Museum of the Louvre, it is of gilt wood and is ornamented with wings folded protectingly about the deceased. An inscription found in Abydos mentions buildings erected by him in this city. A pyramidion mentioning the name of his wife, Mentuhotep, was discovered at Kurna. The record of a criminal procedure against Theban tomb robbers informs us that he was buried in the necropolis of Thebes. The gilt wood sarcophagus of Anantef is in the British Museum. His silver gilt diadem is in the Museum of Leiden. Nub Cheper Ra Anantef is mentioned on a statue as the conqueror of Asiatics and Nubians but the texts do not give any detailed accounts of his campaigns. His tomb at Dra Abul Nega, opposite Thebes, was discovered by Mariette in 1860-1861. The stell found in the funereal chapel dates from his fiftieth year, so that we know he reigned fifty years and consequently must have lived at a time when the country was tranquil. At the same place, fragments of two obelisks erected by this pharaoh were found. An Ea, the Great, is one of the kings whose tombs are mentioned in the criminal procedure above alluded to. One of the hieratic copies of the Book of the Dead alleges that the 130th chapter was discovered in his reign. The Mentuhotep kings belong to the same family with the Antef kings. Nebhotep, Mentuhotep, is known only from a stell found at Kanasso, on which he is depicted as adoring the local divinities of that region 
who throw all peoples under his feet, that is, give him power over them. From this we must infer that Nebhotep carried on wars in Nubia. Of Ra Nebtawi Mentuhotep, we know only that he sent an expedition to the quarries of the Wadi Hamamat to quarry a sarcophagus for him. On this occasion, he caused a great reservoir to be cut in the rock so that the men might not die of thirst. Raneb Chepru Mentuhotep reigned over forty six years, as is proved by the tombstone of a certain Meru who died in the forty sixth year of this reign. We know of him only that he quarried stone in Aswan. This pharaoh must have been a ruler of some consequence, for his name is mentioned in all of the lists of kings, and in several lists his is the only name of a king ruling before the Hyksos invasion that is mentioned. Seanch-ka-ra was the last king of this dynasty. A very interesting inscription, graven on the rock in the Wadi Hamamat, relates the story of one of his expeditions. In the eighth year of his reign, three thousand men, under command of Henu, started from Kebti at the mouth of the valley. The expedition had a twofold object. First, to quarry stone for the monarch's tomb and sarcophagus, and second, to visit the shores of Pawent, that is, the southwest coast of Arabia and the Somali coast on the African side of the Red Sea on a trading expedition. Henu accomplished both objects successfully. To facilitate the provisioning of so large a detachment, a number of stations was established, and wells sunk along the line of march. Arrived at the quarries, one detachment of the expedition settled down to work, while the other continued its march to the sea, which it reached at about the place where Kossar now stands. From here, Hanu sent out a fleet, no mention is made of the building of ships, to the shores of Pawent, awaiting their return at Kossar. The fleet brought back all the products of this country, consisting of incense, precious stones, and other valuables. Meanwhile, the stone cutters had done their work, and the expedition returned to Egypt. This expedition is memorable in that it proves that this pharaoh was firmly determined to establish a regular trade with Pawent. The undertaking was in a certain sense a pioneer expedition, the duty of which was to survey the road from Kebti to the Red Sea, and, by the establishment of watering stations, to make it practicable. The first king, of whom we know that he followed in Seanch Ka Ra's footsteps, was Amenemhat II. The Twelfth Dynasty, 2130 through 1930 BC. The Eleventh Dynasty had been a period of strife. In it, Egypt had been delivered from the domination of the foreign invader. The kingdom had been reunified, and the work of reorganizing the government had been begun. So well had the last rulers of this dynasty done their work that Seanch Ka Ra could undertake the work of opening a road through the Wadi Hamamat from Kebti to the Red Sea, and of laying the first foundations of a direct commercial intercourse with the coast of southwestern Arabia and the Somali coast. 
to what extent the work of reorganization was completed when Amenemhat I ascended the throne, we do not know, as but few monuments of the kings immediately preceding him have come down to us. Of the times embraced by the Twelfth Dynasty, we have, however, a fair knowledge. Though the buildings erected by the kings of this dynasty have disappeared, yet the numerous inscriptions that have been preserved in all parts of Egypt contain records of their doings. Much of our knowledge of this period we owe to the tombs discovered at Beni Hassan and Bersha, but even here it is not yet possible to give details or to fully understand all the conditions that led to the rise and the fall of this house. Sehotep Abra Amenemhat 2130-2100 through 2100 B.C. Reader's Note A map of Ethiopia is shown. End note About the year 2130, King Amenemhat I ascended the throne of Egypt. What claim he had to the crown we are not told, but in all probability he was related to the last king of the preceding dynasty. The change of dynasty was not accomplished without severe internal dissensions. Several inscriptions allude to these disturbances, but give no details. The new pharaoh was equal to the occasion. He defeated the rebels, and then set to work to reorganize his kingdom. One of his first measures was to curb the power of the nobles who had become semi-independent. The principle of heredity he dared not abolish, but he regulated the succession. When an old Nomarchos died, the king chose his successor from his heirs at law, and thus bound the new prince to his person. He also personally superintended a new survey of the whole country. It would seem that, during the periods of anarchy, foreign domination and restoration, following on the decline of the old empire, the Egyptian kings had not possessed the leisure or the power to adjust disputes concerning boundaries which had arisen among the nobles. The stronger had preyed upon the weaker, and many a prince had seized the occasion of enlarging his domain. Amenemhat made a tour of inspection through the country, personally hearing complaints and readjusting the boundaries. He thus succeeded in reorganizing his kingdom in a very short time. And, when order was once restored, he was the man to keep it with an iron hand. This policy enabled him early in his reign to turn his attention to foreign affairs. He marched against the Libyan tribe of the Matiu and conquered them. He also warred on the Asiatic frontier against the Bedouins of the Syrian desert. In the twenty-ninth year of his reign, he led his forces into Nubia and entirely subdued the Oaua, a tribe that had begun to give trouble. Like all of the pharaohs, he was a great builder. Traces of his work have been found at Tanis, Abydos, Memphis, and Karnak. The relics of his work found at Karnak are of great importance, as they prove that the great Temple of Amon was founded by this ruler. The stone needed for these buildings was quarried in the limestone quarries of Tura, Ro Au, opposite Memphis, in the diorite quarries of the Wadi Hamamat, 
and in the granite quarries of Asuan. In the sixteenth upper Egyptian nome, he built a city called Hat Sehotep Ab Ra, as also a fort called Amenemhat Ded Tawi. This pharaoh had in later times the reputation of being a great sage, a papyrus written about one thousand years after his time, said to be a series of precepts addressed to his son, Usertesen I, tells the story of his accession to the throne and relates some other events of his reign. This interesting papyrus, which is said to have been composed by the king himself, is preserved in the British Museum. In the twenty-first year of his reign, Amenemhat, in all probability, with the purpose of avoiding a civil war over the succession, appointed his son, Usertesen, co-regent. This practice was imitated by most of his successors. The pharaoh died in the thirtieth year of his reign, and the events related and allusions made in the memoirs of a prince of this time force on us the suspicion that he was murdered. Cheper Ka Ra Usar Tesen 2099 through 2065 BC. When Usar Tesen I ascended the throne, about 2099 BC, he succeeded to a mighty empire, firmly united in its various parts, and presenting a bold front to its hostile neighbors. Already, as co regent, Usar Tesen had distinguished himself in the field, and his warlike ardor did not abate when he sat on the throne as sole ruler. He was compelled to take the field against the Libyan Bedouins, whom he subdued. In the forty-third year of his reign, he invaded Nubia, and penetrated as far as the second cataract. Here he set up a stele on which he enumerates the names of eleven conquered Nubian tribes. Of these names, nine are preserved. 1. Hu 2. Kas 3. Destroyed 4. Shemek 5. Chasa 6. Sheat 7. Asherkin 8. Owa Owa 9. Chamar 10. Destroyed 11. Amau It is very unfortunate that we have no detailed accounts of these wars. We know only where the king warred and read the names of the conquered nations. But here our knowledge ends. This pharaoh opened the copper and malachite mines of the Set Mefkat, Malachite land, as the Egyptians called the Sinai Peninsula. He also quarried stone in the Wadi Hamamat. The most important of the buildings erected by this pharaoh were, of course, at Thebes. He built the priests' quarters at Karnak, which were restored in the reign of Ramses IX, and had his statue placed in the temple yard. A very fine colossal statue of this king, which was found at Tanis, is now in the Museum of Berlin. In the third year of his reign, according to the text written on a roll of leather preserved in the same museum, the pharaoh began work on the Temple of Ra at Heliopolis, as his father was then still living, and he was merely co-regent. Amenemhat I appears as the directing spirit, while Usertesen seems to have exercised executive functions. 
The temple was called Het Cha Sehotepab Ra, that is, the Shining Temple of Amenemhat I, while a portion of it was named after Usertesen. The only trace left of this temple are two obelisks erected by Usertesen, one of which is still standing, while the other is fallen and in fragments. A peculiarly shaped obelisk, rounded at the apex and showing undoubted traces of the fact that it was once capped with metal, was found, broken in two, at Begig in the Fayum. Owing to the fact that the Fellahin of the region look upon it as sacred, it could not be removed. The king also built in Abydos. In his forty-second year, Usir Tessin appointed his son, Amenemhat, co-regent. Two years after he died, having ruled in all forty-four years, of which he shared ten with his father and two with his son, and ruled thirty-two alone. Nubka Ra Amenemhat, twenty sixty-four through twenty thirty-one B.C., ascended the throne as sole king. About twenty sixty four B.C., he was a ruler of no special prominence, but he was well able to keep together the great kingdom left him by his father. In the twenty eighth year of his reign, this king sent an expedition under command of Chent Cha Oer to Arabia and the Somali coast, Pewent. The expedition was a success. This is the first time since the reign of Seyanch Kara that we hear of a government expedition sent to this country. Like his father, he worked at the Sinai copper mines and built at Sarbut el Chadem a temple to Hathor, who was the tutelar deity of this region. He also operated the quarries of the Wadi Hamamat. In the thirty-second year of his reign, he appointed his son Usir Tessin co-regent, and died three years later, having ruled in all thirty-five years, two years as co-regent of his father, thirty years alone, and three years together with his son. Cha Cheper Ra Usir Tessin, twenty thirty through twenty fourteen B.C. Of Usir Tessin the second, who came to the throne about twenty thirty B.C., we know but little. Almost all our knowledge of his reign is confined to what the great inscriptions in the tombs at Beni Hassan and Bersha. Tell us of the social conditions of the time. In the first year of his reign, he sent an expedition to the Wadi Gasus, a branch of the Wadi Hamamat, which runs in a slanting northeast direction to the Red Sea. This expedition most probably went to Pewent. In the fifth year of his reign. He sent an expedition under Mentuhotep to Aswan, and it would seem from his inscription that the tribes dwelling about the quarries had given trouble and had been subdued. This pharaoh built at Memphis and Tanis, at which latter place a statue of his wife Nefert was found. In the times of the twelfth dynasty. It was a customary thing for Syrian Bedouins to cross the Egyptian border and seek permission to pasture their herds on Egyptian soil. A migration of this character, which took place in the sixth year of this reign, is represented on a celebrated painting found in the tomb of Khenemhotep, the nomarchos of the sixteenth. Upper Egyptian gnome.
This painting represents the arrival of thirty-seven Asiatics, who came before that noble, bearing costly presents, among which was a specially valuable eye salve, seeking his protection and asking permission to settle on his territory. The painting has become widely known through the attempted identification of the people here depicted with Abraham and his party. This attempt, however, is futile. The Bible relates that Abraham came to Egypt on a similar errand and that his stay in this country was advantageous to him. The account of the Bible shows a good knowledge of the conditions under which such migrations were made and is certainly based on all the recollections of the race, some parts of which, no doubt, did dwell in Egypt under these conditions while they were yet in the nomadic state. Manetho calls this king Sesostris and attributes to him the conquest of the world, but as yet no monuments have been discovered that bear out this statement. As Sesostris is the usual designation of Ramses II with the classical writers, it is, however, just possible that the copyists of Manetho got things slightly mixed. The king died after a reign of nineteen years, three of which he shared with his father. Cha Ka Ra Usertesen 2013 through 1987 BC, who succeeded his father about 2013 BC, is one of the greatest figures of Egyptian history. He it was that finally subdued Ethiopia. The victories of Usertesen I had placed the southern boundary of the realm at the second cataract. Usertesen III immediately proceeded to strengthen this frontier and make it the basis of his operations. Having defeated the hostile tribes of the region, he built two forts on opposite sides of the Nile, one at Semna and one at Kumna. On this cataract, and in the eighth year of his reign, erected a boundary stone warning all Negroes from coming down the river on their boats unless they were bringing cattle or merchandise to market at He, Semna, or Aken, Kumna. In the sixteenth year of his reign, the pharaoh set out on his second campaign against the Nubians. He completely devastated the country, destroyed the crops, drove off the cattle, and took numerous prisoners. Despite this great victory, the Nubians were not yet completely subdued. In the nineteenth year of his reign, the king was again compelled to take the field against them, and again he completely defeated them, taking large numbers of prisoners and devastating the country. After this, the tribes seemed to have submitted and remained tranquil, for during the rest of this epoch we hear of no new outbreaks. The king was an active builder. We have already mentioned two of his great works. He also built in Thebes, in Heracleopolis Magna, in Abydos, in Tanis, and in Amada. He was, moreover, the first founder of the temples on the island of Elephantine, where he erected a temple to Satet and Anuket, two of the local deities of the region. Near the island he founded a new city, which he called Heru Cha Kara. It is interesting to note how posterity honored this great monarch. Almost six hundred years after the king's death, Tutmosis III erected a temple to him at Semna, and seems to have attempted 
to make him a local divinity of this region. He also appears as a god in the temple of Kumna, in that of Dosha, and at other places in Nubia. Usertesen died after a reign of twenty-six years. Mat en Ra, Amenemhat, nineteen eighty-six through nineteen forty-two B.C. About nineteen eighty-six B.C., Amenemhat the third, one of Egypt's greatest pharaohs, ascended the throne. This king was not a great warrior and conqueror, but he was the projector and builder of an important work that was of far greater value to Egypt than would have been the conquest of a dozen or more of the border tribes. His fame rests on the immense reservoir he built in the western part of the 21st Upper Egyptian Nome. This reservoir, according to all appearances, was built and not dug. A vast dam was erected, enclosing a large area in this part of the country. The exact extent of the reservoir we have no means of ascertaining, nor do we know exactly what part of the district known today as the Fayum was enclosed in its dams, some remains of which have been discovered. The object of this vast reservoir was to regulate the inundation of the Nile. It received and stored up for future use vast quantities of water. Just how this was accomplished, or where the floodgates were, or what canals led to and from the reservoir, we do not know. The great work is now in ruins, and we have no description of it as it was in the days of its builder. As stated on a previous page, this work gave to the district in which it was erected the name of Tashe, Lake Land, the modern name of the region, Fayum, being derived through the Coptic Fayum from the ancient word Payom, the sea. In this reservoir, Amenemhat erected two pyramids. At Ilahun, on the northern outlet of the reservoir, a city, in all probability, founded by the pharaoh, he built a pyramid in which he was buried. On the northeastern bank, he erected the great building known as the Labyrinth, about which the Greeks tell so many stories, and which was originally a temple, dedicated either entire or in part to the crocodile-headed god, Sebak, the head of the local pantheon of this region. The city of Crocodilopolis, the Egyptian name of which seems to have been Shedet, lying on the west bank of the reservoir, was the capital of Tashe, and was no doubt also founded by this ruler. The Greek name of the work, Lake Maurus, was most probably derived from the Egyptian word Meri, lake. Despite the fact that the building of the reservoir and the cities lying about it must have taken up a great part of his time, Amenemhat still was able to erect buildings elsewhere. He certainly did not forget Thebes, and we hear that he built in Abydos and Memphis. Several expeditions, one of which the king led in person, were sent to the diorite quarries of the Wadi Hamamat. He also continued the working of the copper and malachite mines of the Sinai, and had a grotto cut into the rock at Sarbut el Chadem. Of interest are the notes regarding the rise of the Nile found on the rocks at Semna and Kumna, which prove that the Nile rose twenty-seven feet, three inches 
higher at these places during this time than it rises today. Toward the close of his reign of forty-four years, he appointed his son, Amenemhat, co-regent. Ra Ma Cheru Amenemhat, 1941-1932 through 1932 B.C. This pharaoh, the fourth of his name, who ascended to the throne about 1941 B.C., was apparently a weak king. All we know of him is that he worked the copper mines of the Sinai and had, like all kings of his line, the rise of the Nile carefully recorded at Semna and Kumna. He married his sister, Sebak Nefru Ra, whom he appointed co-regent. Together they ruled about nine years. The close of the dynasty is shrouded in darkness. The decline of the Egyptian kingdom and the Hyksos domination, about 1930 to 1530 BC. This period is one of the darkest in the history of Egypt. Very few monuments have come down to us from this epoch, and almost all we know of the entire 400 years or more is the names of the kings, and in some cases the length of the various reigns. Of some of these rulers, we know from the monuments found how far their power extended, but here our knowledge ends. We know further that in this period the Egyptian kings were dethroned by foreign invaders coming from Asia and known to us as the Hyksos, and that these foreigners held Egypt in subjugation for many years. Who they were and how long they remained in the country we have no means of knowing. The only review of this period that any ancient writer has given us is that copied from Manetho. Thirteenth Dynasty, from Thebes, sixty kings in 453 years. Fourteenth Dynasty, from Coes in the Delta, seventy-six kings in 484 years. Fifteenth Dynasty, Hyksos, six kings in 260 years. Sixteenth Dynasty, Hyksos, unknown kings in 251 years. 17th Dynasty, from Thebes, unknown kings, in unknown years. The number of hypotheses concerning this epoch is legion, but not one is supported by facts and monuments. The times of the 13th and 14th Dynasties seem to have been troublesome. The kings of the former ruled, according to Manetho, only about seven and a half years on an average, while those of the latter only about six years, while the members of the first Hyksos dynasty ruled, on an average, forty-three and one-third years. The entire period is evidently set down as too long by Manetho's copyists, who give over one hundred and forty-two kings in over fourteen hundred and forty-eight years. The monuments do not permit us to assume so great a gap in the history as five hundred and eleven years between the close of the fourteenth dynasty and the beginning of the new empire about 1530 B.C. There have come down to us from the genealogies of nobles who lived early in the 18th dynasty that after a few generations give names which certainly belong to contemporaries of the 13th and 14th dynasties. It is very probable, if not certain, that the last kings of the 14th dynasty were contemporary with the earliest Hyksos kings, and we know that all of the kings of the 17th dynasty were contemporaries of the last Hyksos kings. If we must state the duration of this period in years, we would say that it cannot have exceeded 400 years, of which 150 years would give about the duration of dynasties 13 and 14, and 250 years the duration of the Hyksos domination. Section 1. The Thirteenth Dynasty The new dynasty, which was founded by King Rahutawi, seems to have been closely connected with the Twelfth. Already at the close of the preceding dynasty, we find the crocodile god of the Fayum, Sebak, in ascendancy, owing to the extensive works erected by the last kings of that dynasty in the Fayum. Names containing that of Sebak as a component part begin to appear about the same time, witness that of Queen Sebak Nofru Ra. This custom has become prevalent in the new dynasty. 
It is further significant that two kings of this line adopted the throne name of Amenemhat I, Sehotep ab -Ra. A long list of kings of this house has been preserved, but of scarce a single one do we know more than the name. As above remarked, the times seem to have been troublesome and rife with insurrections and usurpations. Of Seanch Abra, Ameno, we know that he built at Karnak, two altars dedicated by him to Amon Ra having been found here. Section 2 The Fourteenth Dynasty Ransanib, the eleventh or twelfth successor of Rahutawi, the founder of Dynasty 13, founded a new dynasty. The greater part of his successors have left us monuments, and the fact that these monuments have been found in all parts of Egypt, from Tanis to Semne, and even far to the south of this place, proves that these pharaohs had control of the entire country, though at times they must have found it quite a difficult task to hold their own. Accordingly, we must not picture them to ourselves as exceedingly mighty monarchs. They were nothing of the kind. They merely succeeded in holding together the mighty kingdom of the Twelfth Dynasty. They have left us only short inscriptions and statues that are, it is true, sometimes of colossal proportions and of superior workmanship, but that could easily have been executed in a short period. Manifo states that this dynasty came originally from the town of Coes in the Delta, but where he got this information is a mystery to us. Sechem Chutawi Ra, Sebak Hotep III, has left us several records of the rise of the Nile at Semne and Kumne. The sixth king of this line, Semench Kara Mermenfitu, is generally supposed to have been a usurper, but this supposition is based merely on the fact that his name, Mermenfitu, means general and is very doubtful. Of him there are extant two colossal statues that once adorned the Temple of Ptah at Tanis. Both of these were later on usurped by the Hyksos king Apepi, and still later Ramses II put his cartouches on one of them. At the same time, a third statue of this ruler was found. Sechemuach Tawi Ra, Sebak Hotep IV, was the son of a private citizen named Mentuhotep and the princess Fuhenen Abu, the daughter of Queen Nenna. It would thus seem that Sebak Hotep IV based his claim to the crown on his mother. Chaseshesra Neferhotep, the son of a private citizen named Ha Anchef and his wife Kimat, was one of the mightiest of these kings, retaining the crown eleven years. The Temple of Abydos was specially favored by this ruler. A long inscription found at this place relates the following story. Quote, one day King Neferhotep was seized with a desire to see the books of the god Atum, a solar deity. Receiving permission, he entered the temple library and studied them. Hereupon he resolved to restore the entire temple. End quote. A good resolution, this, and one he carried out. One of the most interesting monuments of his reign is an inscription on the rocks of Aswan, representing him and his entire family, consisting of his parents, Prince Sahathor, Prince Sebakhotep, and a relative named Nebhotep. A sandstone block found at Karnak, which, by the by, proves that he built here, is of great interest, as it bears on the one side the name of Neferhotep, and on the other that of Sebakhotep, his son and second successor. It would seem from this that Sebakhotep had been appointed co-regent by his father in order that his succession might be assured. A small granite statue of the king was found at Tanis. After the short reign of Sahathor, who seems to have died soon after his accession, Khanefer Ra, Sebakhotep V, ascended the throne. He was a powerful monarch, who ruled over the entire land. A colossal statue of rose-colored granite representing this king, on which Ramses II afterward cut his cartouches, was found at Tanis. A second statue was found at Bubastis, and a third on the island of Argo, far south of the second cataract. His name is frequently found on the walls of the Temple of Karnak. According to the classical authors who call him Kanefres, he died of elephantiasis. Chaankhra, Sebakhotep VI, is mentioned on the walls of the Temple of Karnak and on several smaller monuments. Chahotep Ra, Sebakhotep VII, ruled, according to the Turin Papyrus, four years, eight months, and twenty-nine days. Wah Abra, 
uh, Ab, reigned ten years, eight months, and eighteen days. And mer nefer I, reigned thirteen years, eight months, and eighteen days, as far as we know, longer than any other king of this dynasty. mer ra said Akhotep VIII, has left us a statue. Several important tombs at Siut date from this time. Of the remaining kings of this dynasty we know nothing. Little by little we lose grasp of the historical connection, and all that is left us is a mere list of names, with here and there the statement that a certain king ruled so and so many years. The tombs of Siut that date from this time all show that the nobles here buried were rich and powerful. They have the same value for this period as those of Beni Hassan have for the Twelfth Dynasty, but are not nearly so well preserved and contain but few historical allusions. Section 3. The Hyksos Domination, about 1780 to 1530 BC. The Fifteenth Dynasty. The Fourteenth Dynasty succumbed to an invasion of Asiatic Bedouins, who gradually succeeded in driving the Egyptian kings south. It is highly probable, however, that the pharaohs yielded only after a long and bitter struggle. The only account we have of the Hyksos invasion is that copied from Manetho's book by Josephus. This account is as follows, quote, At the time when King Timaeus ruled in Egypt, God, for unknown reasons, became incensed at the Egyptians. A people coming from the east suddenly attacked the land and easily conquered it. The ruling class were taken prisoners. The cities were burnt down and the temples devastated. All the inhabitants were treated in the most hostile and barbarous manner. Some were slain, and the wives and children of others were sold into slavery. At last these barbarians elected one of their own number, named Salatus, king. He made Memphis his capital, levied taxes in Upper and Lower Egypt, and garrisoned a number of towns. The strongest garrisons were laid in the eastern forts, as he feared the Assyrians, who were at that time very powerful, might attack Egypt. Finding in the Saitic, mistake for Sethroitic, Nome, a city favorably located east of the Bubastic branch of the Nile, which, owing to an old legend, was called Avarice, he built a great wall around it and put in a garrison of 240,000 men. To this city he came in the summer, partly to direct the distribution of food and pay, and partly to frighten the enemy by constantly drilling his men. After a reign of nineteen years he died, and the following were his successors. Benon, who ruled forty-four years, Apachnus, who ruled thirty-six years and seven months, according to Africanus, sixty-one years, Aphobus, also called Apophis, sixty-one years, Annas, fifty years and one month, and Aseth, forty-nine years and two months. These six kings were the first rulers of the people that lived in constant strife with the Egyptians and sought to exterminate them. The whole people had the name of Hyksos, i.e. shepherd kings, for Hyk signifies in the old language king, and Sos shepherd, and still has this meaning in the Demotic. Some say they were Arabs, in another copy of Manetho, however, there is the note that the syllable huk does not signify king, but that the entire word means prisoners of war. This latter explanation seems to me, adds Josephus, the more plausible and better in accord with ancient history. End quote. The last note given by Josephus was certainly not found in the original work of Manetho, but was added by some later copyist, provided it be not an invention of Josephus himself. This writer's object in quoting this passage from Manetho in his History of the Jews was to prove that the Hyksos and the Jews were one and the same people, and thus to demonstrate the great antiquity and nobility of the Jewish race. Now, there was one thing that bothered him. The Hyksos entered the land as conquerors, while the Jews, according to the Old Testament, entered it peacefully. Josephus, therefore, bethought himself of this not over-ingenious compromise. On the other hand, Manetho's etymology is correct. Het does mean prince, and hyk may well be corrupted from this word. And sos certainly is a corruption of shasu, or shas, which was the name commonly applied in this period to the nomads on the Asiatic frontier. I must in this connection remind the reader of the fact that the Greeks had no k and no sh, and were compelled to render the former as k, 
and the latter as s. The only difficulty lay in the fact that huk represented the singular hek, while the plural heku would have been the proper form. But it has been demonstrated that the form hyksos is a mistake for hykussos. While Manetho is right here, he has made some terrible slips in other parts of his narrative. His most glaring mistake is that he speaks of a powerful Assyrian empire in about 1780 BC, at a time when Assur was a small and unimportant town that could scarcely hold its own against its near neighbors. Even 300 years later, Assyria was so weak that when Thutmosis III had defeated the Syrian kings, it sent him tribute. Another bad slip is the story about avarice. Assuredly, the Hyksos did not conquer Egypt in order to be able to garrison a town on the borders of the desert. Only the bare facts of Manetho's narrative are available for historical purposes, and these are that a vast horde of Asiatic Bedouins, this is the best rendering of Shasu, invaded Egypt, and after a long struggle succeeded in conquering the country. What race these Bedouins belong to we cannot say, nor have we any idea of their appearance. The monuments at Tanis, and formerly attributed to them, have long since been proved to belong to another epoch of Egyptian history. Their religion was, of course, different from that of the Egyptians. An Egyptian text treating of the expulsion of the Hyksos states that they worshipped the god Sutech. This is the name applied by the Egyptians to the god of the foreigners, and is often a translation of the Semitic Baal. Thus the Baalim of the various Cheta towns are designated as Sutechu, plural of Sutech. As god of the foreign enemies of Egypt, Sutech is identified with Set, the enemy of Horus and principal of evil, and it is but natural that this god should be looked upon as the tutelar deity of the hostile foreigners. In later times, when the power of the new empire declined, Sutech, as the powerful god of the mighty enemies, was considered a very potent divinity, and found many worshippers in Egypt. The names of most of the Hyksos kings are compounds of the name of the god Set, but some are compounds of the name Ra, showing that the Hyksos were to some extent influenced by Egyptian religious thought. The Sixteenth Dynasty the Hyksos did not always remain uncultured barbarians, but with time began to adopt the civilization of Egypt. Egyptian officials were put in charge of the various departments. Egyptian literature, science, and art were encouraged. Under King Aweser-Ra, Apepi I, was compiled a mathematical treatise of which a copy, written in the twenty-third year of his reign, has come down to us. a penen ra Apepi II, is known from several monuments. The reign, or rather death, of King Apehtiset, Nubti, is used as an era in an inscription of the time of Ramses II, which is dated 400 years after King Nubti. This would place Nubti in the 17th century, somewhere between 1700 and 1630 BC, as the inscription unfortunately does not give the year of Ramses' reign. Of the other Hyksos kings, we know the names only. Section 4. The Seventeenth Dynasty. Beginning of the Struggle for Independence. Toward the close of the Hyksos domination, there ruled in Thebes a line of kings who were in all probability descended from the last kings of the Fourteenth, or perhaps of the Thirteenth Dynasty. They are the rulers of the Seventeenth Dynasty, who began the combat with the Hyksos. A legend preserved on a papyrus belonging to the British Museum, Salie I, relates the story of the outbreak. King Apepi, the Hyksos ruler, who was an ardent worshipper of Sutech, sent messengers to the Egyptian king of Thebes, Ra Sekhenen Ta'a, bearing certain propositions regarding religious matters, which Ra Sekhenen rejected. There had also arisen misunderstandings regarding a well lying on or near the border, in regard to which no agreement could be reached. This brought on the war. Ra Sekhenen is called throughout the story Prince of the Southern City, i.e. Thebes, and it would seem from this that the Hyksos had either never reached that city, or the country had been reconquered so far north as Thebes. At all events, the Theban kings were independent rulers, and resented the Hyksos king's attempt to assert any claim of sovereignty over them, and they boldly took up the cause of Egyptian liberty. Long years the war lasted, and the Hyksos were slowly driven north. The kings who distinguished themselves in this war 
were Ra Sekhenen Ta'a the First, Ta'a the Second, the Great, Ta'a the Third, the Brave, and Kames, the husband of Queen Ahhotep, and father of Ahmes the First, the final liberator of Egypt. In 1881, the mummy of King Ra Sekhenen was found in a shaft at Deir el Bahari. An ugly gash on the head of the mummy proves that the king died a violent death. In all probability, he was killed in his struggle for the liberty of his country. From the expulsions of the Hyksos to the close of the 18th dynasty. With this dynasty begins the period commonly known as the New Empire, which embraces the 18th, 19th, and 20th dynasties. The dynasty is memorable in several respects. In the first place, the first great campaigns against Asia were undertaken in this time, and Egypt was thus made a conquering power. And, in the second place, a great religious reform which is of special interest to us moderns, was attempted by one of the rulers of this line. 1. Ahemes I. How long the war between the kings of Thebes and the Hykos lasted we can not tell, but it is safe to assume that it began late in the 17th or early in the 16th century B.C. An inscription on the tomb of Ahamis, one of King Ahamis admirals, gave us an account of the closing scenes of the great struggle. It would seem that the predecessors of Ahamis had driven the Hykos into the delta, and that they had thrown themselves into the city of Hatur, Avaris in the northeastern part of the delta, which they strongly fortified. After several battles had been fought on land and water in the neighborhood of the city, the pharaoh laid siege to it, and after a protracted resistance, the town finally fell into his hands. Thus, about 1530 BC, Egypt was finally cleared of the foreign invaders that had held the land in subjugation for centuries. The fleeing high coast had gone to Asia, pursued by the pharaoh. Crossing the boundary, he proceeded against the town of Shkarkan, which is mentioned in Joshua 19.6, as belonging to the territory allotted to the tribe of Simon, and captured it in the fifth year of his reign. He then invaded Foentia and gained several victories. These successes secured the Egyptian frontier from inroads of the Asiatics for a number of years. This was not, however, the only result of this successful war. Ahami's Asiatic campaign had shown the Egyptians the way into Asia, and many of his successors gained their laurels in this country. The wars had also trained generals and armies, and Ahem's successors saw to it that neither deteriorated. A new spirit had come over the once peaceful people, and army after army set out on warlike expeditions. Amon and Mentu, the great gods of Thebes, became war gods in whose names the kings fought their wars, and into the temples of Amon poured the lion's share of the booty won in war and the tribute wrung from conquered nations. The entire character of the wars, too, was changed by the introduction of the horse from Asia. The home of the horse was most probably the Turanian steppe. It was introduced into Egypt by the Hykos. Horses were not used in this time as beasts of burden, but only in war and on the chase. They were not used for riding, but only to draw the two-wheeled chariots. 
These chariots were imported into Egypt from Syria, where chariot building was a flourishing industry. The very word for chariot, merkabet, is of Semitic origin. The new arm entirely changed the character and dimensions of battles. Moreover, chariots and horses were expensive, and the charioteer required special training. These two circumstances favored the formation of standing armies and increased the advantage the greater states had over their smaller neighbors. These facts will account for the successes the Egyptians won over the Syrian states in the ensuing countries. Ahemes had scarcely finished his Asiatic campaign when he was compelled to take the field against the Chentnefer, a mountain tribe of Ethiopia. In a great battle, this tribe was utterly routed, and the king, glad of his easy victory, was already returning home when the news reached him that the Ethiopians had again invaded the country and were even desecrating the temples of the gods. Rapidly returning, he fought the battle of Tenta Da in northern Ethiopia, again completely routing the enemy. Not dismayed by these repeated defeats, the Ethiopians a third time returned to the attack under a leader named Tenta An, but a third time they were defeated, and this time with such frightful loss that they did not again venture to attack their successful opponents. In these wars, the above-mentioned Admiral Ahimes, who had begun his career as adjunct of this king, but had rapidly earned promotion, greatly distinguished himself, and received the gold for bravery several times. The gold for bravery was a reward paid to the distinguished soldiers and civilians out of the public treasury, and consisted of magnificent gifts of gold in the shape of discs, bees, lions, etc. Ahimes received these gifts on seven different occasions. There are indications in the inscription of Ahimes that the pharaoh had to put down a rebellion in the south. This rebellion probably stood in some connection with the Ethiopian wars, but we know none of the details. In fact, we never hear much of the civil wars of Egypt, of which there were no doubt many. They always alluded to in general terms, and the details are never entered into. Having now secured Egypt against foreign invasion, and having quelled probably dangerous rebellion, Achmes was free to devote the remainder of his reign to internal improvements. He ruled over twenty-two years. How much of this time was taken up by his wars we do not know. At all events he had abundant time to strengthen his reign, and to make Thebes, his capital, the greatest city in the land. It was no easy task that was set this pharaoh. Everywhere the temples had suffered from neglect, and during the late wars from the depredations of the high in the north and the Ethiopians in the south. Achmes was, however, equal to the task. He immediately set to work and began the restoration and rebuilding of all the temples in the land. His own city of Thebes was the special object of his care. The city had been the capital of the land for several centuries and already the kings of the twelfth dynasty, five hundred years and more before Achmes time, had laid the first foundations of its future greatness. They had laid, too, the first foundations of the great national temple of Egypt, the Temple of Ammon at 
Karnak. This temple was enlarged by our king. The city steadily grew from this time on, and in the course of a few decades became the greatest city of the land, and consequently of the then known world. The story of the rise, decline, and fall of Thebes is an integral part of Egyptian history. When Ahmes died, after a reign of over twenty-two years, he was buried in the Thebian necropolis, on the west bank of the Nile, opposite the city at Dra Abul Nega. His mummy, encased in a wooden casket, was recently discovered at Del Ibrahi, together with a large number of other royal mummies. 2. Amenhotep the first, Amenophis. Ahmes was succeeded by his son, Amenhotep the first, the early part of whose reign was shared with his mother, Ahmes Neferi Ari. The queen was, after her death, worshipped as a divinity, an honor accorded all kings but very few kings. Early in this reign, the Ethiopians again became troublesome, and the pharaoh marched against them. He crossed the frontier, and in the battle that ensued, captured the opposing general with his own hand. The victory won, the Egyptian army overran the country, and it would seem that some detachments even advanced as far as Moro. Ethiopian capital. The southern campaign was brought to an abrupt close by the news of trouble on the northern frontier. In a remarkably short time, the king arrived at the seat of war, Libya, and defeated the enemy. This king, like his father, was frequently compelled to invade Asia, but on the whole, this reign was more peaceable than the preceding one. Amentohope was a great builder and continued the work of improvement and restoration begun by his father. He died after a reign of 22 years. His mummy was found at Dir e Bahari. 3. Thutmosis I. The son of Amenhotep I was a very young man when he ascended the throne, and the conquered nations sought to take advantage of this fact to regain their independence. Immediately after his ascension, the Ethiopians began war. The pharaoh crossed the frontier, and after defeating the enemy in a decisive battle, overran and plundered the country, drove off the cattle, and carried large numbers of the inhabitants into slavery. This was the usual way of conducting an Ethiopian campaign. It was, as a rule, no more than a raid, made to punish the Ethiopians for a similar raid on Egyptian territory. Tutamotus varied the usual program by hanging the body of the Ethiopian leader by the heels to the stern of the royal ship. Tutmosis now instituted a new Ethiopian policy. The configuration of the land was much the same as that of Egypt, and it was not over difficult to introduce the Egyptian system of government in the land. Accordingly, he divided Ethiopia into a number of districts over which he placed governors while over the entire region he set a governor-general with the title of Prince of Kush. What the duties of this official were is not clear. In all probability he was a sort of viceroy invested with civil and military power and responsible to the king alone. This official held a high position at the court and was, in later times, not unfrequently a royal prince. Colonists were sent out, 
temples built and forts erected and garrisoned. The chief of these forts were He Sema and Aquin Kuma, which had been built by the great conqueror of Ethiopia, Ursetin the Third. They were no doubt greatly strengthened by Tutamosis. Ethiopia was then secured and even made a province of Egypt, but the mountain tribes continued to be troublesome all through Egyptian history. Early in this reign, too, a rebellion broke out in the district of the city of Buto in the Delta, and so serious did it become that the pharaoh was compelled to proceed against it in person. He succeeded in quelling the outbreak, and at once marched against Asia. Crossing the Arabian Desert and Palestine, he entered the land of Rutenu, Syria. Here an army had been drawn up to check his advance, but he defeated it with frightful slaughter and took large numbers of prisoners. He then advanced to the Euphrates River, on the banks of which he set up two stelae to commemorate his victories and mark the boundaries of his realm. Hereupon the Egyptian army retired, and herein lay the radical fault of the Egyptian foreign policy. This fault cost them dear, for they were compelled to send army after army into Asia. In fact, the Asiatic campaigns were mostly plundering expeditions on a large scale. The Egyptians defeated the native army in a decisive battle, overran and plundered the country, carried off a large number of prisoners, imposed a tribute, and retired. No attempts at colonization were made, and no garrisons were left in the conquered lands. They were left entirely to themselves, provided only they paid their tributes regularly. Only in the larger states were the kings compelled to give up their children and other relatives as hostages, the Egyptians binding themselves in case a king died to send home his successor. The great danger to Egypt lay in the fact that while it took the Egyptian armies months and often years to subdue the Asiatics, the subdued land might all be lost and, and the combined forces of the enemy be at the frontier in a few weeks, and then it would again take months and often years to regain the lost ground. Though Tadamosis was a great warrior, he found ample time to devote to internal improvements. His wars had furnished large numbers of slaves that were put to work building temples in all parts of Egypt. Tebes was, of course, specially favored. After a short reign of only nine years, he died, leaving three children, two, Tutamosis II and Mud Kaurud by the queen, and one Tutamosis the third by a concubine, his daughter Mud Kara, who seemed to have been his special favorite, he had proclaimed co regent shortly before his death. Four Tutamosis the second Tutamosis the second succeeded to a mighty empire but he seems to have been a weak character, entirely controlled by his strong-minded and utterly unscrupulous sister and wife, Maka Ra, the co-regent. His reign was very short and uneventful, and there is abundant ground for the suspicion that his sister had caused his untimely death. As usual, he fought with the mountain tribes of Nubia and the nomads of Syria, but he accomplished nothing that could give him any claim to fame. The mummy of this ruler it was also found at Dur-il-Bahi. 
Number five, Ma Ka Ra, Hatches Pest. This Greek queen, who was sometimes called Kanemi Amon, is renowned not for any great wars, but for a commercial expedition she sent to the shores of Pawent, a name applied by the Egyptians to the shores of the southern portion of the Red Sea, i.e. to southern Arabia and the Somali coast. A fleet of five great ships was fitted out and sent to the shores of southern Arabia. The ruler of the country, Parahu, received the Egyptians, who were no unknown guests on these shores. With genial hospitality, the expedition was a complete success. The ships returned home laden with the products of these shores, consisting of incense plants which the queen attempted to transplant to Egypt, balsams, cosmetics, ebony, ivory, gold, leopard skins, and all sorts of animals, example baboons, greyhounds, and giraffes. The entire undertaking bore a mercantile aspect, and while Ma Ka Ra speaks of the goods brought back as a tribute of the land of Piwant, she evidently stretches a point. Par Eku certainly did not look upon the matter in this light, and no doubt considered the transaction a commercial success. How often these expeditions were repeated we do not know, but it would seem that the connections with Perwent were maintained for some time, as the annals of Tutomosis III frequently mention the tribute of the land of Perwent. Ma Ka Ra was not the first Egyptian monarch to enter into relations with this country. We have already seen that Si A Ka Ra, the last king of the 11th dynasty and two kings of the 12th dynasty, had already maintained connections with Piwant. The expedition was, however, of great importance and must have greatly stimulated the trade between the two countries, as no doubt the Egyptian merchants followed in the footsteps of their queen. So important did Ma Ka Ra justly deem the expedition that she had it represented on the walls of her beautiful funeral temple at Dur el Bahi on the west bank of the Nile. This temple is one of the most remarkable of all in Egypt. It lies directly opposite the great temple of Karnak, with which it was connected by a broad avenue flanked with sphinxes. The temple is built on four terraces, between the third and fourth of which there is a beautiful flight of stairs. On the first terrace was the courtyard, ornamented with columns that have almost entirely disappeared. The third terrace is by far the finest, bearing a beautiful hypostyle, the rear wall of which is the limestone rock against which the temple is built. On this wall is represented the expedition that is made this reign memorable. The pictures are executed with the most scrupulous care, even the fishes of the Red Sea being carefully drawn and easily identified. They must be reckoned among the finest specimens of the art of this period. How long this queen ruled in conjunction with Tutmosis II, we do not know, nor can we say how long she ruled alone. It would even seem from the monuments that she never was the sole ruler, Tutmosis II having, shortly before his death, appointed his half-brother, Tutmosis III, co-regent. The queen was proud and overbearing and seems to have felt sorry she was a woman. She frequently had herself 
represented on the monuments in all the full official dress of the king even down to the false beard and no doubt she frequently wore this garb on state occasions her half-brother she hated very cordially showing her hatred in no pleasant manner and he cordially reciprocated her sentiments it is very probable that she died a violent death and that tutmosis the third had a share in her murder six men chepper ra tutmosis fourteen eighty to fourteen twenty seven b c in the twenty-second year of his official reign, Tutmosis III, the greatest of all the great conquerors Egypt has produced, became, through the death of his half-sister, sole ruler of Egypt. One of the first acts of his independent reign was to obliterate from all public monuments, as far as possible, the name of his half-sister. This was a revenge on an obnoxious predecessor, which was quite popular with the pharaoh, and one that the great queen herself had visited on her brother and husband, Tutmosis II. As soon as Tutmosis had rid himself of his sisterly co-regent, he began a long series of brilliant campaigns in Asia. On this continent, the conquered nations had quietly paid tribute during the two preceding reigns, and barring some minor disturbances, had all remained quiet, but now they made a new attempt to throw off the galling yoke of Egypt. The pharaoh acted promptly. Crossing the Arabian desert, he entered Gaza, which city had remain loyal to him from here he advanced slowly northward against the syrian confederation all of the princes of palestine and syria were combined against him and had taken a strong and well-chosen position in front of the strongly fortified city of megadu here Tutmosis attacked them, and despite the fact that they had decided advantage in position, utterly routed their forces. Part of the defeated army escaped into Megiddo, part took to the hills behind the town. The pharaoh now invested the city, which surrendered after a brief resistance. After the surrender, the enemy came down from the hills and made a spirited attack on the Egyptians, but they were repulsed with serious loss. These victories regained for Tutmosis all of Palestine and Syria. The rulers of the various states brought tribute and delivered up 38 of their relatives and eighty-seven of their children as hostages, under the usual stipulation that on the death of a king, his successor should be allowed to return home. The war gave Tutmosis a vast amount of booty and seventeen hundred and ninety-six prisoners. Even the distant king of Assur, Assyria, a country that was just beginning to assert itself in Mesopotamia, began to fear for his possessions, and for two years sent tribute. In the following year, the 23rd, one of the Syrian princes sent the pharaoh his daughter as a present. After the first campaign, fourteen others were undertaken. In the time between the 25th and 28th years of the reign, several minor expeditions entered Syria. The 29th year was marked by another coalition of Syrian princes, and the pharaoh immediately set out to quell the new rebellion. The king of Tunip, 
a state in northern Syria, stood at the head of the new confederation, and in his country the decisive battle was fought. As usual, the enemy was defeated. The city of Tuap was besieged, taken, and plundered, and the country overrun. After their defeat, all of the rebels again returned to their allegiance, paid tribute, and gave hostages. On his way home, the king surprised and captured the city of Aradus, which he sacked. Meanwhile, a division of the army under Amen M. Hib had addressed to the city of Carchemis, which was captured and plundered, and returning had joined the king at Tyre. In the thirtieth year, new disturbances seemed to have occurred, for the pharaoh again entered Palestine. This time the point of attack was the Chita capital, Quadesh, on the Orientes River. This town met with the usual fate. Aridus was again taken and sacked, and Tyre suffered the same fate after a short siege. The following two years were devoted to a great campaign in Palestine. The fortress of Anritu on Lake Nazarana was taken and sacked after a short siege, and the entire country was overrun, as was also part of Syria. In the 33rd year of his reign, Tutmosis again invaded Syria and this time advanced to the Euphrates River. Sailing down the stream, the pharaoh proceeded against the king of Nekarin, Mesopotamia, who had massed his forces near the, his capital, Ni. These forces were defeated, and Ni was taken and sacked. Sailing still farther down the river, Tutmosis took a number of forts, he then returned to Ni nee and instituted a great elephant hunt, on which occasion a hundred and twenty of those noble animals were killed. In the following year, another rebellion broke out in Syria, where three cities lying in the district of Anaukasa had formed a coalition. Again, the pharaoh invaded the country punished the rebels and returned home with a long string of captives and laden with booty. In this same year, one of the Ethiopian princes sent the king his daughter as a present. In the following six years, only two campaigns of importance were undertaken. The first of these was against the Syrian fortress of Arena. In the 35th year, the second was against the fortress of Anu Kasa, in the same country which city had given trouble before, three years later. In the 41st year of his reign, the king set out on his last Asiatic campaign. Marching along the sea coast, he first took the fortress of Arantu, and then Entering Palestine, captured several cities. Entering Syria, he next took the town of Tenep, and hereupon marched against Quadesh, which seems to have been the soul of the new coalition. He defeated the Cheta army before the city, which he then laid siege to. A Mesopotamian army which made an attempt to raise the siege, was utterly routed and left 691 prisoners in the hands of the victor. Quadesh was now stormed and sacked. This ended all opposition to Egyptian rule in Asia. The backbone of the country was broken. Tutmosis has left us long lists of names of captured cities and conquered nations contained hundreds of names.
but only very few of these can be identified with names of cities occurring elsewhere, and we are utterly in the dark as regards the situation of most of these cities and countries. The extent of these conquests has been greatly exaggerated. On the whole, the Amanus Mountains and the Euphrates River seem to have been the boundaries of the conquered region. Although the king certainly did cross the Euphrates twice and did defeat the armies of Mesopotamia and take Mesopotamian cities, he did not succeed in holding these conquests. That he reached the city of Nineveh is very doubtful. Ni may be the Egyptian name for Nineveh, but in all probability it is the name of a city lying much farther up the river on the other side from the country of the Shela. Its king seems to have been allied with the Syrian countries with which Tutamosis was at war. It is noteworthy that the king in the thirty-third year of his reign set up two stelae on the banks of the Euphrates near Ni. By the side of those he set up his father, Tutamotus I. The coast of Phoenicia was under Egyptian control. Aradus, Samaria, Joppa, and Tyre submitted only after a siege. The other cities seemed to have yielded without a struggle. It was obviously to their advantage to stand under Egyptian rule, for Egyptian rule meant Egyptian protection, and the wily Phoenician merchants soon found that they could reap greater commercial advantages from their connection with Egypt. The Phoenician colonies in Cyprus, example, Asabi, also submitted voluntarily and paid tribute, though standing in no danger of evasion from Egypt. This ready submission secured for them great advantages. The protection of Egypt, an unbroken connection with the motherland. As Egypt did not interfere in their internal affairs, the Phoenician cities of the mainland and of Cyprus cheerfully paid tribute. The material prosperity of Egypt was greatly augmented by the successes of this king and all the tombs even those of the humbler citizens, gave evidence of this fact. Generals and soldiers enriched themselves in these Asiatic campaigns as well as the pharaoh. The lion's share of the booty and tribute, however, went to Ammon, the great god of Thebes. In the name of Ammon, Tutum Monus had undertaken his campaigns, and with the aid of the god he had won his victories, and in gratitude to him the king erected the mighty buildings at Karnak, on the walls of which he proclaimed these victories. But the other gods were not forgotten. In all parts of Egypt the king built, restored, or completed temples. Of special importance was the temple of Sema, which was dedicated to the defied king Ertsin III, the conqueror of Ethiopia. In the fifty-fourth year of his reign, the mighty ruler died and was succeeded by his son. The mummy of this king was found in a shaft at Del El Badi. The monarch was a small man. The mummy is only five foot two inches long, but with a determined cast of features somewhat resembling that of Napoleon the first. Seven, Amenhotep the second, Amenophis, 
1427 to 1422 B.C. One day after the death of his father, Amenhotep II ascended the throne. Already as crown prince, he had shown his ability in subjugating the nomadic tribes that dwelt in the mountains between Nile and the Red Sea, and compelling them to pay tribute. Immediately after his coronation, the new pharaoh invaded Asia and gained a series of brilliant victories. It seems that a new rebellion had broken out, and that the distant city of Ni alone had remained loyal. For when he entered this town, the inhabitants received him with demonstrations of great joy. The campaign came to an end with the capture of the fortress of Akati. His next campaign was directed against the country of Tekshi in Syria, where he fought against a mighty coalition. Seven native kings were killed and the land was again subdued. The bodies of the dead kings he took with him to Egypt. Six of them he had hung up on the walls of his capital, Tebes, and one on the walls of Napta, as a warning to the Ethiopians. Like all rulers of the dynasty, he was a great builder. He died after a short reign of only five years. 8. Tutamosis IV 1421-1414 to 1414 B.C. Of the son and successor of Amiahop, we know little more than he ruled only seven years. He fought in Ethiopia, Phoenicia, and Syria, probably quelling minor revolts and repelling invasions of nomadic tribes. In the first year of his reign, he caused the great Sphinx of Giza to be freed from the sand which had accumulated about this vulnerable monument. 9. Amen Kahop III, 1413-1377 B.C. In the fifth year of his reign, Amenkahop III, the son and successor of Tutmosis IV, invaded Ethiopia and easily subdued a number of rebellious Nubian tribes. The victory did not amount to much, but the pharaoh made a great fuss over it, having it recorded on several stelae. This reign marked a new era in their relations with Asia. A number of tablets was recently found at Tel el Armana, which contained letters addressed by Asiatic kings to the kings of Egypt. A number of these is addressed to Amenhotep III. The most interesting one is that from King Dusharata of Midani, example, Sat. Tarina of Niharn, i.e. Mesopotamia, in which Amentahop is called the son-in-law of Dushrata. This Dushrata is no doubt identical with the king Sartana of Niharen, who, in the tenth year of this reign, sent Amniahop, his daughter, Kerpipa and 317 ladies for the pharaoh's harem. Although already happily wedded to Queen T, one of the most beautiful women in all antiquity, the pharaoh had no recourse but to make the princess his legitimate wife. This marriage was, in all probability, entered into after the final ratification of a treaty concluded between the two monarchs. And, in fact, the treaty concluded between Amenophis's son, Chuenten, and Dushrata distinctly refers to this previous treaty. It is a curious fact that the letters addressed to this king 
and to his son are written in Assyrian. The king was a passionate hunter, and an inscription engraved on several scarabi relates that in the first ten years of his reign he killed a hundred and two lions. Like all his predecessors, Amendehop was a great builder. He was the builder of the celebrated temple of Amon Ara at Luskor. The two celebrated statues of Mammon on the west bank of the river opposite Thebes belonged to this monarch. They stood originally in front of the pylon of his temple in the necropolis, but every trace of the temple has vanished. The statues were erected at his orders by the architect and sculptor Amenhotep, the son of Happy. They are of hard red crystalline sandstone quarried at the De Jebel de Ahmar, example, Du Deshar, in the desert northeast of Memphis. The Greeks took the statues for those of the Ethiopian king Memon, mentioned by Homer, and explained the sound produced by the northern statue as the greeting of Memon to his mother Eos. The explanation of the sound is very simple. The upper portion of the statue was broken, and when the sun rose, the change in temperature caused the particles of stone in the crack to split, and this splitting produced a musical sound. After the statue was repaired by Septimus Severus, reigned A.D. 193-211, to the sound was no longer heard. 10. Amendiohop the Fourth, Chunaten, thirteen seventy six to thirteen sixty four BC. This pharaoh is to us one of the most interesting of ancient monarchs, as the first promulgator of monotheism. The Egyptian people up to this time had possessed no uniform religion, but a large number of religions had existed side by side, some being recognized throughout the land, others having only local import, while one religion, that of the national capital, was the official religion of the government. At this time, Thebes was the capital of the land, and the Theban religion was the government faith. Consequently, the head of the Theban pantalon Amon was the official head of the national pantheon, but there had arisen in Heliopolis, example, on the great seat of the Ra religion, already in early times a movement towards a solar monotheism, and in Chittenden's reign this movement was victorious. The new king was a fanatical adherent of this doctrine. He moreover seems to have stood entirely under the domination of the Heliopolitan priests and gladly lent his hand to accomplish their purposes. A new official religion was accordingly proclaimed. This was a solar monotheism. The new god was with a studied avoidance of the old names called Aten, the solar disk, and was proclaimed to the nation as the sole and only God. If this had signified merely a change in the official religion of Egypt, and not in the very inmost nature of the religion, the people would have heeded a little and gone on praying to their own local gods, and officially recognizing the new head of the Pantathalon, as they had done herefore. But here was a complete and utter religious revolution, pronouncing all the old faiths heretical and supplanting 
them by a faith the nature of which the people did not and could not understand. A propaganda of this character, no doubt assisted by attempts to convert the people by force, naturally led to discontent, and it was probably owing to this that the reformers graciously permitted the solar divinities Horius, Ra, Radharmachus, and some few others to continue in existence, explaining them as forms of their new and only god Atem. Ammon, however, was persecuted in the approved orthodox manner. Wherever he could, Amiotop, or, as he now called himself, Chutan Aten had the name of this hated divinity obliterated from the monuments, even in the names of his predecessors. After the Reformation, Chutanen left the tainted city of Tebes, the stronghold of the old Ammon cult, and built himself a new capital to the north of this city, and called it Chut Aten the horizon of the solar disk. The ruins of this town, which was never completed, lie at a place called tel e Armana, and are of peculiar interest as they together, with the tombs in the necropolis of the city, give us a life-size picture of the court of this fanatical and half-graced king. One of his peculiarities was to substitute for the conventional style of Egyptian sculpture a more realistic style. The pharaoh himself was hideously ugly, owing to a body deformity, and he commanded his artist henceforth to depict him in his real shape. Naturally, his wife, who seems, by the by, to have had quite a lovely face, and daughters who were pictured as equally ugly, and the courtiers, as true courtiers would, aped royally, and had themselves depicted in the likeness of their king. Unfortunately, the Reformation proved a failure, and we know but little of the new faith. Long and beautiful hymns full of feverent devotion, addressed to Aten, have come down to us, as have also various representations of religious ceremonies. The new god is always depicted as a solar disk, the rays of which terminate in hands, but the monuments do not give us any deeper insight into the new religion. There was in this reign no trouble with Asia. This was a result of the diplomatic negotiations begun under Amendehop III and concluded by this pharaoh. Treaties of peace were conducted with Dushrata of Metandi, Salarna, king of Nehran, i.e. Mesopotamia, Berna Burasha, king of Kardushna, Babylonia, and Ashru Balit, king of Assyria. All these treaties contain references to former negotiations with Amnihop the Third. They are all written in Assyrian and are quite difficult of interpretation, though the general import of these documents can easily be given. After a reign of only twelve years, Chutanen died, and is not at all doubtful that he lost his life in a revolt, brought on by his fanatical attempts to convert the people to his new faith by force. He had no son, but seven daughters, who were married to Egyptian nobles. Disputes over the succession immediately arose and the country was plunged into all the horrors of a civil war. 11. The struggle for the succession, 
about B.C. 1363 to 1340. How long the Civil War lasted, we cannot say, nor do we know exactly in what order the various kings that followed Chutnan succeeded one another. In all probability, the next successor at Chutnan was Sena Ka Ra Sanchet, the husband of his favorite daughter, Maratan. He was throughout his short reign a firm adherent to the faith of his father-in-law, but the revolution that had dethroned his father-in-law proved fatal to him also. He was disposed by the priest, I, who was originally a firm adherent to the Aten religion. I was a brother of one of Chutenden's nurses and had risen rapidly at court until he attained the position of Lord Equerry, one of the highest offices in the gift of the crown. At the time, A dethroned Sen Chet. The reaction was at its height, and A was not the man to swim against the tide. He therefore returned to the old faith and the old capital. But he had nothing outside of this to recommend him to the people, and so his apostasy availed him little. Four years after he had wrestled the crown from Sanchet, he was overthrown, and dead and Amon, the husband of Chutenden's third daughter, and Chinese Pa Aten, who now changed her name to Anchites Amon, ascended the throne. Like his predecessor, he was an opposite from the Aten religion, but this policy availed him as little as it had his antagonist. After a reign of only four years, he lost his throne and his life and with him the last of Chutentan's heirs sank into the grave. After his death, the confusion became worse than ever. King after king ascended the throne, but they all fell before they had tightened their grasp on the reins of state. How long this state of affairs lasted we cannot say. But in our opinion, the entire period from the death of Chutnan to the end of the Civil War cannot have embraced less than about twenty or twenty-five years. At length, Har M. Keb, who was in some way, possibly through his wife, Mutnetjem, connected with the royal family, succeeded in restoring order and with him begins the 19th dynasty. Haremheb, 1340-1320 B.C. About 1340 B.C., Haremheb succeeded in restoring order in the kingdom. His accession to the throne marks a new era in Egyptian history, that of the 19th dynasty, in which Egypt, though its armies no longer marched to the Euphrates and became a terror of the Mesopotamian rulers, yet succeeded in making a part of Asia an integral part of its empire. The preceding dynasty had produced great conquerors, who stand unrivaled in the annals of the land of Kemet. This dynasty produced rulers who were great warriors, and, but for events which had occurred in Asia during the latter part of the dynasty 18, would have equaled the two great Tutmoses in extent of conquests, and who were besides great organizers. How they succeeded in incorporating Palestine, Phoenicia, and southern Syria in the kingdom, we shall presently see. The great mistake of these rulers was that they little by little substituted Libyan mercenaries for the national armies that had hitherto been the sole reliance of Egypt, and we shall have occasion to trace the grave results of this mistake. A long inscription on a statue of Haremheb, preserved in Turin, gives us an account of his early life and relates how he came to the throne. He was brought up in the city of Hatsuten 
and already in his early youth was highly honored. He was a member of the family of Tutmosis III, whom he calls the father of his father, i.e. his ancestor. When he was still a very young man, the ruling pharaoh, whose name is not mentioned, appointed him to a high position in the 18th Upper Egyptian Nome, Saped, which was his home. As he made a good record in this position, he was made Adin, i.e. general, and in this position he received the tributes of the foreign princes, and all the princes had to bow down before him. After he had held this position for a number of years and had shown great ability, he was appointed Nomarcos of Saped. This position he held when, as the text puts it, Horus and Amon decided to place him on the throne. Horemheb certainly had a good right to the succession, being a lineal descendant of Tutmosis III, but his chief claim lay in the fact that he had succeeded in triumphing over all the usurpers that had arisen after the death of the last pharaoh of Chuanatan's line. On the close of the civil war, he proceeded to Thebes, where he married the royal princess Mutnetjim and was crowned king. His campaigns were chiefly in the south, where he put down a number of rebellious Nubian tribes. We also know that he conducted several campaigns in the north with the usual success. It would seem, too, that the connections with southern Arabia and the Somali coast were kept up, for the inscriptions mention the tribute of the prince of Puent. Haremheb tells us that he restored the temples of the land from the delta to Nubia, and increased the numbers of their slaves and the amounts of sacrificial offerings. Of the temples, those of Thebes, on Heliopolis, and Memphis were specially favored. Haremheb died after a reign of about twenty years. Section 2, Ramses I, 1319-1317 BC Very little is known of Haremheb's son and successor, Ramses. He made several raids into Nubia, and shortly before his death appointed his son, Seti, co-regent. He died after a reign of only two years. His mummy was among those found at Deir el-Bahari. Section 3, Seti I 1316 to 1289 BC. The son and successor of Ramses I was one of the greatest and most warlike of all the Egyptian kings. Already in the first year of his reign, he was compelled to invade Asia, starting from the Chetem, i.e., Fort of Tiar, which lay on the freshwater canal that formed the eastern boundary line of Egypt. He first attacked and easily defeated the Shasu i.e. the nomadic tribes dwelling in the Arabian desert, and then entered Canaan, defeated the inhabitants, took their capital, and erected and garrisoned forts, and dug wells in the conquered country. It is evident that the pharaoh desired to hold the land permanently, and thus to secure Egypt against all further inroads from Asia. This rapid success of the Egyptian army spread terror over all Syria, and the Syrian princes submitted peaceably and paid tribute. Several strongly fortified towns, however, held out and had to be taken by force of arms. Among these were Kadesh, a city of the Amorites, in the district allotted to the tribe of Naphtali, that must not be confounded with the Kadesh on the Orontes, the capital of the Cheta, and the fortress of Genuam. Seeing these Egyptian successes, Mautinur, the king of the Cheta, naturally thinking he would be attacked next, determined to take a hand in the game. He was defeated, but Seti gained no permanent advantage over him. If we possessed the monuments of this Cheta king, we certainly would read of victories gained over the Egyptians. Seti now returned home. At Tiar, he was met by a procession of priests and nobles, who conducted him to Thebes in triumphal procession. The successes of this pharaoh must not be overestimated. All he succeeded in doing was to conquer the land lying between the Egyptian and the Cheta frontier. The petty sovereigns of southern Syria fell an easy prey to him, but the mighty Cheta king succeeded in checking his advance. The lists of conquered lands and cities are very unreliable, many of the names having been copied from the lists of Tutmosis III. In the later years of his reign, Seti was compelled to march against the Tehenu, i.e. the Libyans, who had again begun to make inroads on the western frontier. The Libyan tribes, who were savage and warlike, 
had for centuries almost constantly been at war with Egypt and, though at first easily defeated, had in the course of time become very dangerous foes. In this reign, they began a series of invasions which were repelled only with great difficulty. Seti was compelled to defeat them again and again before he succeeded in subduing them for the time being. These tribes soon assumed the same position as regards Egypt that the German tribes in later times held as regards the Roman Empire. They began as enemies and invaders, and, with time, finding it profitable to serve the pharaoh, entered the Egyptian service as mercenaries. These mercenaries soon supplanted the native troops, and in several centuries gained such controlling influence that, some 400 years after Seti's time, their commander-in-chief, Sheshank, could grasp the scepter and ascend the throne of the pharaohs. The Tehenu tribes that entered the Egyptian service in this and the following reigns were the Mashawasha and the Kahak. In connection with these tribes, there appears now, for the first time, the tribe of the Shardana. Large bodies of these Shardana entered the service of Egypt under Ramses II and a poem celebrating this monarch's victory over the Cheta states that they were originally prisoners of war. The armament of these men was peculiar. They carried small round shields, or bucklers, and a long sharp pointed lance, and wore helmets with a round ball on top. They also had full beards, while the Egyptian soldiers wore no beards at all. In later times, they are called people of the sea, their home must consequently have been some coast district or island of the Mediterranean. We have no reason whatsoever to identify them with the Sardinians. In all probability, they were a tribe that dwelt on the northern coast of Africa. The architectural activity of this ruler was confined chiefly to Thebes, where he built at the temple of Amon ra at Karnak. Here he began the magnificent hypostyle, which was completed by his son and successor. In the necropolis of Thebes, on the west bank of the Nile, he restored two funeral temples, that of Makara at Dar al-Bahari, and that of Tutmosis III at Medinet Habu. He also began a funeral temple dedicated to his father, Ramses I, at Abd el Kurna, which was completed by Ramses II, who dedicated it to Seti in conjunction with Ramses I. The king also restored temples in all parts of Egypt. The mines of the Setmafkat, i.e. Malachite region, as the Egyptians called the Sinai, he held and operated. The quarries in Egypt proper were, of course, in full operation, and the gold mines of Ethiopia were worked. Of these gold mines, there has been preserved, in a Turin papyrus, a map which, though crudely drawn, is easily intelligible, the oldest map extant. Before his death, Seti appointed his young son Ramses co-regent, but this appointment was merely nominal. Ramses certainly never exercised the functions of this office. He himself conceived it in this spirit, never dating his reign from his appointment, as the kings of the Twelfth Dynasty had done, but from his actual accession to the throne as sole ruler. Seti died after a reign of about 27 years. The mummy of this ruler was found in a shaft at Dar al-Bahari, where it had been hid to protect it against the tomb robbers that invested the necropolis in the times of the priest kings of Dynasty 21. The features are strongly marked and give evidence of great mental vigor and strength of will. Section 4. Ramses II, 1288 to 1221 BC. This king has long been overestimated by those who followed Greek tradition in Egyptian history. That this tradition is utterly untrustworthy has been pointed out in the introduction, and its utter worthlessness is here glaringly illustrated. The Greeks called this king Sesostris and made him the representative of Egyptian greatness. The name of Sesostris is undoubtedly authentic, being a corruption of Sesetsu, a name applied to this king in a critical letter written either in his reign or shortly afterward. He has been declared the greatest of all the pharaohs, while in reality, he is to be placed after several others. Of all the greatest was undoubtedly Tutmosis III. Next after him we can place his father, Tutmosis I. Then come Usertesin III, the conqueror of Ethiopia, and Seti I, who conquered Libya 
and prepared the way for Ramses II in Asia. We give now a brief summary of the Greek accounts of this king, and the reader can then himself compare them with the authentic history gleaned from the monuments of this reign, which, with the exception of the very suspicious lists of conquered nations, are entirely trustworthy. Herodotus and Diodorus Siculus are the principal sources for the Sesostris legend. According to them, Sesostris was educated together with all boys born on the same day with himself. While yet crown prince, he was sent against the Ethiopians and subdued their entire country. Then he marched against Libya and conquered the greater part of that country. His father dying soon after, he determined to conquer the world. Raising an army of 600,000 infantry, 24,000 cavalry, and 27,000 chariots, he put them under command of the 1,700 boys educated together with him. This vast army first marched against Ethiopia, and conquering the entire country, levied a tribute of gold, ebony, and ivory. Why conquer Ethiopia, which, according to the same authority, he had already conquered? He then fitted out a fleet of 400 sail, the first Egyptian fleet, and penetrating to the land where the cinnamon grows and the straits of Babel Mandeb, conquered the land of the Ichthyop Fagoi and erected Stella there. Then he crossed to Arabia and overran that country and the Asiatic coasts as far as India. In proof of this, they state that up to their time there were to be seen in that country many ramparts of Sesostris, as well as numerous imitations of Egyptian temples. His land forces crossed the Ganges and conquered India. He next overran the country of the Scythians up to the Tanais River, the modern Don River. Here a part of his troops remained, and from them are descended the Kalchoi. According to Pliny's version, however, Sesostris did not succeed in invading the country, but was defeated by Saulakis, king of Colchis. The king next entered Europe and overran Thrace. Here his army was almost entirely broken up by hardships and starvation. At length, after nine years of continued warfare, he returned home laden with booty. In all of the conquered lands, Sesostris set up Stella. Some of these monuments, alleged to have been erected by him, were shown to Herodotus in Ionia and Syria. Manetho relates that, when Sesostris set out on his campaigns, he had appointed his brother, Harmaeus, regent during his absence. After the king's return, Harmaeus revolted, but was defeated at Pelusium. The Egyptian account differs materially from this. In Libya, Ramses fought only as crown prince under his father's leadership. The monuments do indeed mention campaigns in Ethiopia, but these were most probably directed only against the mountain tribes that made constant inroads on the civilized portion of Ethiopia. The country proper was an integral part of Egypt, and had been so for centuries, and it was entirely unnecessary to reconquer it. The great seat of the war in this reign was Asia. In the second year of his reign, the pharaoh started on his first campaign in this region. It would seem that disturbances had occurred in Palestine and the land of the Amorites, and that this campaign was necessary to restore order. Several cities had to be taken, but, on the whole, the restoration of Egyptian supremacy in the countries recently so severely visited by Seti I cannot have been an over-difficult task. As usual, it seems that the fortresses alone offered any resistance, and after they had fallen, the rest of the country submitted peaceably. At the close of this campaign, Ramses erected a stele on the banks of the Nahar el-Kaleb, north of Beirut. His second campaign, on which he set out in the fifth year of his reign, after careful preparation, was directed against the Cheta, the old enemies of Tutmosis III and Seti I. It may be well here to give a brief sketch of the rise of this people. There were two peoples named Cheta, one in Canaan and one dwelling between the Orontes and the Euphrates. The latter is the people we refer to here. Already in the time of Tutmosis III, they seem to have been an important and influential nation. The Cheta were the soul of the last great coalition formed against this pharaoh, but in these early times Egypt still proved the master. After the death of Amenhotep III, the Egyptians were too much occupied with internal affairs to interfere in Syria, 
and, in the time between the death of this ruler and the accession of Seti I, falls the rise of the Cheta. Of the combats in which they gained this ascendancy we know nothing, but it would seem that their kings, Sapalel and Marusar, who preceded Mautinur, the contemporary of Seti, had succeeded in gaining the ascendancy over all the states of northern Syria, the Rutanu Haru, Upper Rutanu of the Egyptians, northern Mesopotamia, and of that portion of Asia lying north of their domain. We do not, however, know whether they merely stood at the head of a confederacy composed of these states or had really conquered them. When Seti I invaded Asia, Mautinur felt sufficiently strong to oppose him and, though at first defeated, succeeded in checking his advance. This success naturally increased the prestige of the Cheta, and when Ramses II attacked them, they seem to have been able to call to their aid all the peoples of northern Syria and northern Mesopotamia and some of the peoples of Asia Minor. The forces of this mighty coalition were massed in front of Kadesh, the Cheta capital, where they awaited the Egyptian advance. Led by treacherous guides, the advance guard of the Egyptian army, which was under the personal command of the king, fell into an ambuscade near Kadesh and were all but annihilated. They were, however, rallied by Ramses, whose personal prowess, as he tells us, alone turned the tide of the battle. And when the rest of the army, which had been hastily summoned, arrived on the battlefield, they were just in time to join in the pursuit of the fleeing foe. The enemy were driven into the Orontes River, e.g. Arunta, and suffered terrible losses. One of their generals, the prince of Chaleb, Aleppo, was almost drowned. Again and again Ramses reverts to this victory. The poem and the representations commemorative of it he had inscribed on the walls of several temples. Undoubtedly, it was an act of great personal bravery, and the pharaoh had a right to be proud of it. But the victory was fruitless. Kadesh was not taken, and if Ramses says that Mautinur had turned about and adored him, this can refer only to negotiation concerning an armistice. At all events, the war went on as before, and evidently with wavering success, though we hear but little of its further course. Once, we find the pharaoh fighting far north in the region of Tunep in Naharan, Mesopotamia. But how he came there we do not know. He did not retain this advanced position long, however, but was driven back, for in the eighth year of his reign he fought in Palestine, taking the towns of Meram, Karpu in the region of Bet Anat, and Dapur in the country of the Amorites. He also took the town of Shapur and finally reconquered Askarun, Askalon, which had thrown off the yoke of Egypt. During this war, Mountainur died and Chetasar succeeded him. The Cheta War was finally closed in the 21st year of Ramses's reign by a treaty of peace and alliance. This treaty proves that perfect equality existed between the two nations. Both kings bound themselves to keep the peace and be good and faithful allies. The treaty refers to one in force in the time of Sapalel and Matanur, concluded possibly with Seti I or one of his two predecessors. It expressly states the obligation of either king to come to the assistance of the other, if so required. It further defines the obligation of either king to return refugees. Thus was concluded the first treaty of peace and alliance, the full text of which has come down to us. That treaties had been concluded between the kings of Egypt and the Mesopotamian rulers we have seen in the preceding chapter. To strengthen this treaty, Ramses married the oldest daughter of Chetasar, acknowledging her as his legitimate wife and queen, the princess adopting the Egyptian name of mat nefru ra Thirteen years later, Chetasar, accompanied by the prince of Kedi, paid his royal son-in-law a visit. The terms of the treaty seem to have been strictly kept by both countries, as they were weary of a war that drained their resources and brought no result to either. Of the boundary between the two nations, nothing is said in the treaty, but it would seem probable that Egypt retained Phoenicia, Palestine, and southern Syria, while the Cheta were free to extend their domain northward. The Cheta made good use of their opportunities, all through Asia Minor and as far north as Smyrna, we meet with monuments that were erected by this people. Ramses could not extend his sway any further than the boundaries of the Cheta. He now set to work to secure the conquered country. 
In all parts of Palestine and southern Syria, forts were erected and garrisoned, and it would even seem that special officers rode through the land on tours of inspection. The power of Egypt had greatly weakened, and she was no longer what she had been three centuries earlier. The lists of conquered lands which this pharaoh had inscribed on the temple walls are utterly unreliable, being copied in great part from those of Tutmosis III. Thus, he mentions as conquered, among others, Assur, Assyria, and Sangar, Chaldea, countries with which this pharaoh had no relations whatsoever. That a very active commercial intercourse between Egypt and Asia was brought about by the new relations between Egypt and the Asiatic nations is self-evident. Egypt powerfully influenced Asia and was powerfully influenced in return. Syrian divinities, Baal and Astarte, were taken into the Egyptian pantheon. Setsutech, who to the Egyptians represented the tutelar divinity of the foreigners, gained greatly in prestige, owing to the successes of these same foreigners. But the chief influence was on the language. The influx of Semitic words into the Egyptian at this time is something wonderful to behold. It must have been considered elegant and a proof of great learning to larder one's writing with these foreign words and phrases for some of the texts of this period teem with them. The peace which closed the Asiatic War in the 21st year of Ramses's reign left the pharaoh 46 years to devote to internal improvements. The king directed his attention chiefly to building, and there is scarce a town in all Egypt in which he did not build, complete, or restore temples. But despite this great activity, he does not seem to have been thoroughly satisfied with his work for he usurped many temples erected by his predecessors. The usurpation of monuments was a common practice in ancient Egypt. The usurper proceeded in a very simple manner. He erased the name of the real builder and substituted his own for it, thus making it appear as if the monument in question owed its existence to him. This had been done before Ramses's time, but none of his predecessors possessed the same finesse in this class of work. He thus succeeded in arrogating to himself many temples that had been built years and sometimes centuries before his time, and it is often owing only to the fact that the men charged with the work did it very slovenly, and left the name of the real builder standing in some obscure corner, that we are enabled to discover the imposition. Tanis, a city lying near the northeastern boundary of Egypt, shared with Thebes the honor of being the residence of the pharaoh. The various departments of the government were located at the latter city, but Tanis offered Ramses unrivaled facilities as a basis of operations for his Asiatic campaigns. A king who spent so many years warring in Asia would naturally find it of great advantage to fix his residence at a place so near the frontier. Tanis thus owes the larger part of its glory and prosperity to this pharaoh. He it was that built the vast granite temple, as many as fourteen obelisks and several statues of the king have been found here. Memphis also came in for a share of the king's favor. It was made one of his residences, and its temple of Ptah was greatly enlarged. But the great city of this reign was Thebes, of which we may well here give a brief sketch. This city, the Egyptian name of which was Ueset, was situated on the east bank of the Nile, its site being still marked by the ruins of the great temples of Karnak and Luxor, both of which were dedicated to Amun-Ra. Between these two temples lay the city proper. The temple of Karnak had its own names. One of these was Apet, the other Nestawi, throne of both lands, i.e. Egypt. On the west bank of the river lay the necropolis, or cemetery of Thebes, in which its kings, courtiers, and citizens lie buried. The rulers of the Middle Empire were interred in low pyramids built on the plain. Those of the New Empire were interred in tombs hewn into the living rock of the hills that skirt the valley of the Nile on the west. The temples dedicated to the cult of the pharaohs of this latter period were built in the valley. Thus a long row of funeral temples extends through this plain. The temple of Der el-Bahari, built by Makara, that of Ramses I and Seti I at Kurna, the Ramesseum, built by Ramses II, the temples of Tutmosis III and Ramses III at Medinet Habu, and many others. This district was devoted to the use of the dead and of those who cared for them. 
masons, carpenters, embalmers, and laborers of every description, connected with what the French called les pompes funèbres, had their homes here. In this necropolis, Ramses was very busy. He first completed the funeral temple at Kerna, begun by his father, and then erected a wonderful Ramesseum, a temple dedicated to Amun-Ra and commemorative of the pharaoh's victories. On the east bank of the river, he completed the wonderful hypostele of Karnak, which his father had begun, and otherwise improved and decorated the main building, besides erecting a building south of the pond belonging to the temple enclosure, and a pretty extensive temple east of the great temple. This pharaoh was especially partial to grotto temples, of which he built quite a number, e.g. at Bet Wali, Garaf Hussein, Wadi Sabua, and Abu Simbel. The last mentioned temple was the best of this class. It is the largest and most beautiful grotto ever cut from the living rock by the hand of man. The classical authors, Strabo, Pliny, and others, ascribe to Sesostris the beginning of a canal connecting the Nile with the Red Sea, which Necho is said to have continued and Darius to have completed. The canal from Cairo to Suez was afterward again opened by Amru, the Mohammedan conqueror of Egypt, but 140 years later, it was again closed by order of the caliph Abu Diyar el Mansur. In fact, there existed already in the times of Seti I a canal which, starting from the Nile near Memphis, ran through the Wadi Tumilat to Lake Timseh, and thence to the Red Sea. This canal is represented for the first time in an inscription of Seti I, where the return of that conqueror from his Asiatic campaign is depicted. It is pictured as full of fishes and crocodiles. The canal bears the unassuming name of Demat, canal. A bridge led over it near the Chetem, fort, of Tiar, that covered this part of the frontier. When this canal was dug, we cannot say to a certainty. It existed in the time of King Seti I, and may have been dug by him, but it may just as well be considerably older. It was dug originally either for purposes of irrigation or as a defense against the Asiatic Bedouins. We scarcely think that it served any commercial purposes in these early times. The canal is frequently mentioned by foreigners. Thus, the Bible mentions it as the Brook of Egypt, Nahal Misraim, Numbers 34.5, Joshua 15.4, Isaiah 37, etc. And, in the Assyrian inscriptions, it is called the Brook, Nahal, where there is no river, Naru, because it was not a natural but an artificial waterway. It is considered by these texts as the boundary line of Egypt. The pharaoh died in the 68th year of his reign, having previously appointed his 14th son, Meren Ptah, co-regent. A word about the monarch's family may here be in place. He had several legitimate wives and many concubines. Consequently, he could also boast of a large number of children. One list mentions 162 of these by name, 111 sons and 51 daughters. The mummy of the king was found at Dar al-Bahari. It shows a striking resemblance to the beautiful statue of the king preserved in the Museum of Turin. Ramses must have been, in his younger days, quite a handsome man, and even in old age his features preserved a determined cast. Section 5. Mer en Ptah, 1220-1212 BC about 1220 BC, the last great ruler of this line ascended the throne. His history is not over-eventful. The empire was at peace with the world. In the south, the Egyptians held as much of Ethiopia and Nubia as practicable, their only object being to control the Nubian gold mines and to secure the southern frontier against invasion. In Asia, the advance of the Egyptian arms had received a decided check at the hands of the Cheta, and the Treaty of Peace and Alliance concluded in the 21st year of the preceding reign had put an end to all chance of war in that quarter. Canaan, Palestine, Phoenicia, southern Syria, and the Sinai were secure. The last-named country had been under Egyptian control for several thousand years, and the others were secured by numerous forts established by Seti I, Ramses II, and Meren Ptah. With Puent, 
There never had been war, and there was no chance of war now, as the commercial relations between the two countries continued profitable to both, and would only have been disturbed by a war. There was only one quarter from which a war could threaten, and that was Libya. We have seen that the Libyans had frequently given trouble before, but that the campaign of Seti I had effectually checked them and had put a stop to their inroads for a long while. After this campaign, we find that many Libyans entered the service of Seti I and Ramses II. It is hardly credible that they remained in the service after Ramses's wars were over. In all probability, they returned home and told their countrymen of the wealth of Egypt and of the immense booty to be won there. Returning from the successful campaigns, they no doubt brought home what seemed to them great riches, and this aroused the greed of their countrymen. Ramses himself they dared not attack, but after his death they prepared to invade the land. Numerous Libyan tribes from the sea coast and the interior, the Labu, Kahak, Mashawasha, Akawasha, Turasha, Raku, Shardana, and Shereshka, combined their forces with those of the frontier tribes, and, under the command of King Maroi, the son of Didi, entered the western delta in the fifth year of the new reign and advanced, plundering the country, as far as Per Bairo, Byblos, south of Bubastis. It was their evident intention to settle here and, if need be, to purchase the right to settle here with their blood. King Meren Ptah was notified of this invasion, but he hesitated to take active measures. At last he got an army together, but was deterred from accompanying it by a dream. Meanwhile, the enemy had advanced to Per Aru Shepses, a town near Heliopolis, which city their forces now threatened. At this place the Egyptian army met them, and in the battle that ensued completely routed and almost annihilated their forces. The Egyptians then plundered and burned down the fortified camp of the enemy. This victory left in the hands of the Egyptian army vast amounts of booty and a great number of prisoners. Meren Ptah was a great builder. On the Egypto-Syriac frontier, he erected two forts and continued the work begun by his predecessor at Thebes, Tanis, and other places. He died after a short reign of only eight years. Section 6, Close of the 19th Dynasty, 1211-1180 to B.C. Seti II, 1211 to 1209 BC, a son of Meren Ptah, succeeded his father on the throne. Inscriptions and papyri of his reign are constantly bragging about his great victories, but not one of these is ever specially mentioned, nor do we know of any campaigns of this king. Evidently, these laudatory hymns are mere pieces of meaningless flattery. He died after a reign of only two years. A period of anarchy followed on his death, during which several usurpers succeeded in gaining the ascendancy for a short period. Of these monarchs, we know only a few. Amun Messes and Sa Ptah, Meren Ptah II, were in latter times regarded as illegitimate. Undoubtedly, they were usurpers. A Syrian, Arsu by name, succeeded in making himself king for a short while, but whether he came to the front as leader of one of the hostile factions, or was an invader, we do not know. At last, Setnecht, the founder of Dynasty Twenty and father of Ramses III, succeeded in restoring order about 1880 BC, or perhaps a few years earlier. The Close of the New Empire and the Period of Decline Dynasties 20, 21, and 22, about 1180 to 800 BC. Section 1, the 20th Dynasty, and close of the new empire, 1180 to 1050 BC. With this dynasty closes the period called the new empire and begins the period of decline. The epoch, known as the New Empire, had begun auspiciously, and for several centuries the pharaohs of the 18th and 19th dynasties had succeeded in making and keeping Egypt the first power of the then known world. 
at the close of each dynasty. There had occurred periods of anarchy, which were, however, of short duration and entailed no serious consequences. The kings had nevertheless made a number of serious blunders, and the effects of these blunders began to show themselves in this period. The first of these was the great power which had been given to the priests of Amun-Ra after the suppression of the reform movement. We have seen how the Bootsi won in the Asiatic wars poured chiefly into the coffers of Amun-Ra. The monies paid into his treasury were managed by the priesthood, a fact that is very significant. This priesthood was responsible apparently only to itself and consequently vastly enriched itself. Add to the power of great wealth the control of vast estates and consequently an immense patronage and the enormous influence the priesthood generally has over the masses. And you can readily see that sooner or later this priesthood must become very dangerous to the state. In this dynasty, there must be added yet another factor. The vast influence the clergy gained over the weak and incompetent kings that ruled after Ramses III. It is no wonder then that they should finally succeed in snatching the scepter from the weak hands of the lost Ramseses. The second serious blunder was their Libyan policy, which we have outlined in Chapter 6, Section 3. Satnacht ruled only a very short while, but he appointed his son, Ramses, co-regent shortly before he died. Ramses III, 1180-1148 BC, the Ramseses of the classical authors ascended the throne about 1180 BC. This pharaoh anxiously imitated Ramses II, even giving his sons the same names as those borne by the sons of his great predecessor, and appointing them to the same offices the latter had held. He was not, however, the equal of Ramses the second in war, though he almost excelled him in Paradosio. The lists of conquered lands are just as untrustworthy as those of Ramses II, and must be entirely disregarded in writing the history of this period. The only authentic sources are the accounts of specific campaigns, and on these alone is based the following account of his wars. The early part of this reign seems to have been taken up by cares of state. The land had, it is true, been pacified by Satnacht, but still the reorganization of the state was by no means compelled when Ramses came to the throne. In one of his edicts, this pharaoh gives orders to cleanse the temples of Upper Egypt of all that the gods hate, to restore the truth, that is, orthodox faith, and to destroy the lie, that is, heterodoxy. It was owing to this unsettled state of the country that he could not undertake his first campaign, which was an extremely important and absolutely necessary one before his fifth year. Meanwhile, matters looked bad in the Delta. Libyan hordes, under their princess, Didi, Mashakin, Tamar, and Jatmar, had entered the Delta possibly during the period of anarchy, which followed on the death of Seti II, and had penetrated to the main stream of the Nile, here, they occupied the banks of the river from Karbana to Memphis. In the fifth year of his reign, Ramses at last 
had sufficiently settled the eternal affairs of his kingdom to allow of his turning his attention to foreign affairs and he accordingly marched against the libyans after some hard fighting he succeeded in driving them out of the country some three years later the pharaoh was involved in a more serious war the peoples of the sea the Shardana, Turusha, and Shakarusha, who in all probability dwelt on the north coast of Africa and seem to have been great pirates, united with the Zakari, Prusta, Danauna, and Washiwash, four other seafaring peoples, in a grand raid on the Asiatic coast. They advanced down the coast by land and water bringing with them their women and children, and all their possessions, on carts drawn by oxen, all the Syrian people, the Sheta, the Kidi, Karamish, Aradis, and Aresa, were subdued, and then the mighty stream poured into Palestine, which was mercilessly devastated. Up to this time, Ramses had been looking on an unconcerned spectator, rather rejoiced than otherwise at the downfall of Egypt's old enemies. But as soon as Palestine was invaded, matters assumed a different aspect. Palestine was an Egyptian province and could not be sacrificed. Accordingly, in the eighth year of his reign, Ramses proceeded against the pirates with a large army and a great fleet. The decisive battle was fought on the coast of Syria, both on land and on sea, and the enemy was utterly routed and almost annihilated. Vast numbers of prisoners were taken. The people concerned in this attack were all seafaring. The Shardana, Churusha, and Shakarusha we have met before as allies of the Libyan tribes that attacked Egypt in the times of Merenpetah. They dwelled most probably on the north coast of Africa. That these tribes here appear together with tribes coming most probably from Greece and Asia Minor is no argument against this, for these tribes were bold pirates ready to join in any enterprise that promised booty. Though we can state with a considerable degree of certainty that the other four tribes came from Greece and Asia Minor, we cannot assign to each one its proper home. That Greek tribes took part in this expedition is made extremely probable when we remember that the Odyssey mentions raids of this character made by Greek pirates on the Egyptian coast. The threatened invasion was thus happily averted, and the Egyptian domination over Palestine, Phoenician, and southern Syria considerably strengthened. In these countries, the kings of the preceding dynasty had erected and garrisoned forts in order to keep the inhabitants under control. Ramses III went one step further he tried to force the Egyptian religion, or rather the religion of Amun-Ra, on the Asiatics. A great temple was erected in this region to Amun-Ra, to which, in the language of the official record, all the peoples of Shell, Syria, bring their tribute. Incidentally, an expedition against the Shesu, Bedouins of Sir Adam, is mentioned. Three years after the great victory over the pirates, the king was again compelled to march against the Libyans, the Mashawasha under their chief Mashashar, united with the Temhu and Libu, and invaded the western delta. The pharaoh easily defeated them in a great battle fought on the frontier. Large numbers of the enemy were killed, numerous prisoners were taken, and rich booty was won. These four wars seem to have been all that Ramses was engaged in. We see that they were all defensive wars, and this is quite a change from the aggressive policy 
pursued by the kings of dynasties 28 and 19. After the close of the Second Libyan War, the kingdom was at peace with the world, and Thubia and Nubia remained tranquil. The trade with Pewent was reopened and a fleet sent there returned laden with the products of its tropical coasts and brought back with it ambassadors from the various rulers of the region. The copper and malachite mines of the Sinai were operated. The land seemed to have arrived at the highest point of tranquility and prosperity. Thus, at least, the official inscriptions and papyrus, Harris I, the official record of this reign, would have us believe. In reality, matters were not so pleasant. In the immediate vicinity of the pharaoh's capital, in the necropolis of Thebes, there was almost constant trouble with the laborers. These men were in the government service and were to receive regular monthly rations, but the payment was far from regular, and very often they had to strike for them. Thus we know of one gang of laborers that struck for their pay three times inside of half a year. In the twenty-ninth year of this reign, on these occasions they would leave the necropolis in a body with their wives and children, and would not return until their demands had been ascended to. The first strike lasted five days, and at one stage of the proceedings, matters assumed so serious an aspect that the military had to be called out. The men finally received their dues and returned to work. On the second strike, which occurred a month later, the men marched to the gates of the city, where the governor of Thebes met them, and after some discussion paid them half of their dues, whereupon they returned to the necropolis. Two months later they struck again, but were soon pacified. This record, which no doubt represents the experience of these unfortunates, not only during this half a year, but during the entire reign, stands in strange contrast to the accounts given by the official documents. From another source, too, we learn something more of the real condition of affairs. This is a papyrus giving the minutes of a criminal procedure against several members of the royal family and several high civil and military officers for high treason. Several ladies belonging to the royal harem headed by Queen Tay, who had a son called Pentower, as the minutes hint. He bore another name, probably he was a son of the king, formed a conspiracy against the pharaoh. In all probability, the conspiracy had for ultimate object the placing of this prince on the throne after his father had been murdered. Most of the harem officials were implicated, the head overseer of the harem even conducting the correspondence for Tay, the commander of the troops stationed in Ethiopia, whose sister was in the royal harem, was won over an order to revolt against the pharaoh and invade Egypt. Many other officials and army officers were implicated. The conspiracy was, however, betrayed, and the conspirators were arrested. A special commission of eleven vested with extraordinary powers and even permitted to pass sentence of death was appointed to try this conspiracy case. The commission began its labors, but soon it was found that three of its members had been corrupted, having attended a banquet given them by some of the accused ladies. They were tried found guilty and sentenced to have their ears and noses cut off. After this unpleasant interlude, the commission succeeded in accomplishing its labors without further interruption. The conspirators were found guilty and sentenced to death, the nobles being permitted to commit suicide and the others being executed. In this reign, the power of the priesthood greatly increased 
We have already touched on the causes of this, but there was no pharaoh who did more for the priests and their temples than did Ramses III. The larger part of the great papyrus Harris I is taken up with lists of presents given the various temples. The temples of Amun-Ra, of course, received the lion's share of these rich gifts and attained to an unheard of wealth proportionately with the wealth of their temple. The wealth and influence of the priests increased. This was the great mistake of this reign. But we must say in palliation that Ramses was but carrying out the policy of his forefathers. Ramses was a great builder. In all parts of Egypt we find his name connected with the temples and other monuments. His chief attention was directed to Thebes and the Delta. At Thebes he made additions to the great temple of Amun-Ra and restored some of the temples of the necropolis. Following the example of his great namesake Ramses the second, he built in the necropolis a temple dedicated to Amun-Ra and commemorative of his victories. Behind this temple were the vast treasury vaults in which were stored up the great masses of gold, silver, precious stones, copper, etc. Dedicated to Amun-Ra, and on the walls are inscribed the records of the immense wealth here deposited. It is probable that these treasures represent the state treasury, placed under the protection of the god rather than the presence made him. Before the gates of the temple stood a two-story house, probably destined to be the residence of the pharaoh and his attendants, on his visits to this city of the dead. At Tel Yehuda, in the delta, he built a temple of limestone, alabaster, and granite. Many of the other temples were repaired by him, and it seems to have required no small amount of labor to keep the temples of Kemet in constant repair. The king died in the thirty-second year of his reign, shortly after having proclaimed his son Ramses IV co-regent. The successors of Ramses III, 1148-1050 BC. The late king had managed to keep Egypt on much the same level as it had occupied under Ramses II, but under his successors the prestige of the once all but almighty ruler of the world rapidly declined. The following pharaohs were all weaklings who could scarcely hold their own at home and dared not to interfere in the foreign affairs. Under them the priesthood that had been greatly favored by Ramses III rose to a commanding position and the last kings of this line were mere puppets in the hands of the Thepan high priests. These rulers cover about a century, but all this time we have but few monuments of historic value, and two of the most important documents we possess of this time show it in no pleasant light. Ramses the fourth, the sixth, the seventh, and the eighth were brothers. Ramses the fifth was a usurper. The very fact that a usurper could ascend the throne after the son of Ramses III shows that there was something wrong somewhere. It is true that we possess a stele on which Ramses IV, 1148 to 1137 BC, mentions the fact that the Syrian Rentu brought tribute, but this is not significant for southern Syria had been for some time an integral part of the kingdom. Ramses IV sent a great expedition to the Wadi Hammamet quarries in the third year of his reign, to quarry stone for temples. He also worked the Sinai copper mines of his buildings, but little remains. He seems to have been a man of promise, but like most men of his character, he did not keep his promises and appears as one of the weakest monarchs of his line. 
He died or was dethroned after a reign of only eleven years. Ramses the fifth, eleven thirty six to eleven thirty two B.C. Though strong enough to wrest the crown from its legitimate holder, was not able long to retain the position he owned to himself alone, for he reigned but four years. In about eleven thirty one B.C. Ramses the sixth, one of the legitimate heirs of Ramses the third, succeeded in outsetting the usurper, but he was otherwise of little account. We do not even know how long he reigned. Ramses the seventh and the eighth were alike unimportant. Of the latter, we know only that he reigned about seven years. Of the former, we know nothing. Ramses the ninth holds a rather unenviable prominence among these rulers. Two papyri have come down to us that show how utterly weak and corrupt the government of Egypt was in those days. The first of these contains the minutes of a criminal procedure against a desperate band of robbers that invested the necropolis of Thebes dated from the nineteenth year of this reign some knowledge of the robberies in the necropolis having come to the ears of the governor of thebes he immediately with a view to injuring his enemy the governor of the necropolis reported the case to the vizier this official appointed a commission to investigate the charges this commission made an investigation and reported that of ten royal pyramids examined, only one had been entered and robbed, while all the private tombs had been broken into and stripped of everything that had any value. During the investigation, one of the witnesses, a fellow that bore a desperate character, confessed that he had robbed the tomb of one of the wives of Ramses II and the investigation proved the truth of his story. Eight robbers were tried and found guilty. Great was the joy of the commissioners, who immediately made public the results of their investigation. The governor of the city, however, whose vague charges had in no way been substantiated, was not satisfied, but openly declared the entire investigation a fraud and threatened to bring the matter before the pharaoh. After a judicial hearing, the matter was hushed, both sides evidently fearing an official investigation into the conduct of their officers. There was evidently a good deal of crookedness. The governor of the necropolis was undoubtedly guilty at least of criminal negligence, and the commission did their work pretty carelessly, evidently not caring to expose their friend too much. The second of the above-mentioned papyri is the journal of a gang of laborers employed in the Thepen necropolis. We learn from this document that these men were paid in rations of fish, pulse, grain, beer, fat, and fuel. But these provisions were rarely issued on time and sometimes were not paid at all. In the latter case, the men struck, or, as the Egyptian phrase goes, lay at home, the journal of this party contains the record of two strikes. The first was peaceable. On the second, they marched to Thebes in a body and laid their complaints before the authorities. Their request for pay was granted and they returned to work. These strikes give proof of the corruption that was rife in the government. The men's rations were withheld, not because the state could not pay, but because the officials, charged with the distribution, chose to let the rations disappear. The pharaoh died after a reign of a little more than eighteen years, shortly after proclaiming his son Ramses X co-regent, the last three kings of this line are very unimportant. In the early part of the reign of Ramses X, sixty thieves 
Among them, a number of minor government officials and priests of lower grades were arrested and punished for desecrations and depredations committed in the necropolis. But even the most stringent measures proved of no avail. The great cemetery had grown so enormously that the proper policing of this district was out of the question, and besides, it would seem that the governor of the necropolis and the chief of this police had a finger in the pie and were not over vigilant. Ramses the tenth ruled eight years and was succeeded by Ramses the eleventh, of whom we know nothing. Ramses the twelfth was the last king of this house. Of him we know little more than that he ruled about twenty-seven years. In his reign there lived a high priest of Ammon and general of the army, Hera Ho, who became the successor of Ramses. The king was a mere puppet in the hands of the almighty high priest, and it is not to be wondered at that Hera Ho finally seized the crown. One of these kings, which one we do not know, was the contemporary of the mighty Assyrian king, Tiglath. Piacer the first, and sent him tribute about 1110 BC, a fact that it is characteristic of the weakness of these kings. The 21st Dynasty, the Priest Kings, 1050 to 950 BC. We have here again a period that is very obscure. There is some disagreement among the historians about the order of succession of the priest kings and the fact that Manetho states that the dynasty originated from Tennis has induced some scholars to assume that a Tanitic king had deposed Haraho, the founder of the dynasty. Such an assumption we consider utterly unwarranted as it is not constant with the facts of the case as represented on the monuments. Heraho and all his descendants were high priests of Amun Ra in Thebes, and a long line of Heraho's ancestors occupied the same position. We can trace on the monuments the gradual rise of the high priests of Amun Ra. We find the high priests Rua Amunana and Ramses Necht, mentioned together with the kings on the walls of the temple of Karnak, a distinction enjoyed in the older times only by the co-regent. Under Ramses IX, the power of these priests seems to have been still greater. Evidently the king was a mere puppet in the hands of Ramses Necht's son and successor, the high priest Amenhotep. This dignitary no longer inscribed his name with the name of the pharaoh, but declares in the inscriptions that he erected this or that building in the name of the pharaoh. He rose to the high position of manager of the temple states, thus holding in his hands all the wealth and influence of the great temples of Amun-Ra. Sa Amun Heraho 1050 to 1034 BC, took the deciding step about 1050 BC. He had held high offices of trust and honor under Ramses XII, being, to mention only his most exalted offices, high priest of Amun-Ra, chief architect to the pharaoh, general of the army and head of Upper and Lower Egypt, we see this man thus combined the highest religious, military, and civil offices of the land, and was virtually the ruler. No wonder then that on Ramses' death he pushed aside that king's legitimate heir and placed the double crown on his own head. It would seem, however, that Egypt gained but little by the change of rulers. The new king could do no more than preserve the then boundaries of his kingdom, and when we read in his inscriptions that he repulsed the enemies, 
we must take this to refer to minor compacts with Bedouins, who were constantly prowling about the borders. This pharaoh built Shifli in Karnak, restoring the temple of Chensu, the son of Amun-Ra, and decorating its walls with long religious inscriptions. In one of these inscriptions, he had depicted his entire family, consisting of his wife, Queen Nejimit, his nineteen sons and grandsons, and five daughters. The government seems to have remained quite as weak and corrupt as it had been under the last Ramesside. And no wonder, for Herahu was a descendant of the high priest who so long had governed the land in fact, and he himself had actually ruled the country long before he seized the scepter, so that it was but natural that the old state of affairs continued. Thus the old depredations in the necropolis, instead of ceasing or becoming less, became worse and more desperate than ever. The police of the necropolis were, it is true, not quite efficient, but might have kept their desperadoes in some check had they themselves not been implicated. Accordingly, Heraho bethought himself of some means of protecting the mummies of his predecessors, the mummies of King Razakunin, Ahmus I, Amunhotep I, Tuhutmus I, Tuhutmus II, Tuhutmus III, Ramses I, Siti I, and Ramses II, were for a while moved about from place to place and finally were hid in a shaft at Deir el Bahari, where they could be better guarded. This shaft was opened in 1881 by Maspiro and Bruch Bay, and in it were discovered, besides the mummies already mentioned, those of the early kings and queens of this dynasty. The mummy of this pharaoh was not found here, either because it never was deposited here, or because, like many other objects found in the shaft, it is still in the hands of the Arabs, who discovered and to some extent plundered this improvised tomb before the discovery was brought to the attention of the government. The mummy of Queen Nejimet, cased in a beautiful sarcophagus of gilt wood, was however found here. Whether or not this king is identical with a king Ranatur Chopper set up a Amun, Mari Amun Sa Amun, whose name has hitherto been found only in the Delta, is one of the vexed questions regarding this dynasty. It may be that Heraho used the title of High Priest of Amun as coronation name in Thebes only, while he adopted another coronation name for use in Lower Egypt. But such a course would seem void of sense. Still, we have no cause to assume that two kings, one of Upper and one of Lower Egypt, ruled at the same time. The whole matter must be laid over until further monuments are discovered in proof of one or the other hypothesis. Herahu ruled about 16 years. Herahu's successors, 1033 to 945 BC. Pinetujim I, the grandson of Herahu, ascended the throne about 1033 BC. Pianchi, the father of this pharaoh, had been high priest of Amun-Ra, but he seems to have died before Herahu, so that his right to the throne passed to his son. This king had two wives, Queen Hathur Hend Tawi and Queen Makara, of which latter lady an inscription distinctly says that Amun-Ra had given her the kingdom. It would seem from this that Makara was a Ramses side princess whom Herahu had compelled to add his grandson in order to legalize his usurpation. A very common measure of Egyptian usurpers, 
At all events, it is a very curious fact that while the names of both queens are always enclosed in cartouches, that of Penetjem is without the cartouche in several inscriptions. Again, there appears in number of inscriptions the name of a king, Chepper Cha Ra Penetjem, whose wife was Queen Hathor Hent Tawi. That Penetjem, the high priest of Ammon, and this king are one and the same person. There can be no doubt. The mummy of Queen Makara was like his mummy, and that of Hathor Hent Tawi, found at Deir el Bahri. At the feet of Makara was found the mummy of a very young infant, designated as the Princess the wife of the pharaoh, the lady of both lands, Matem Hayt. It would seem from this that the infant had been declared the legitimate wife of its father immediately after its birth. This precaution was taken to preclude the chance that any usurper could base claims to the throne on a marriage with this infant. The child and its mother died. However, long before any such eventuality could arise. Penetjem reigned 25 years, 1033 to 1008 BC. Ra Chepper set up a Amun. Pasipchanu I, the successor of Penetjem, has left us but few monuments. But from these, we see that, like his predecessors, he was both high priest of Amun-Ra and king of Egypt. One of his sons, named Penetjem, was high priest of Amun-Ra under king amun am apit Menchepper-Ra is another priest king of whom we know nothing. The same is true of king amun am apit Pasipchanu II has but little significance beyond the fact that his daughter, Makara, became the wife of Yusarkin I, the son of Shashanki I, thus legalizing the usurpation of that monarch. Pasipchanu has also some interest for the biblical student. It was in all probability this king who came into connection with King Solomon. He gave Solomon his daughter in marriage and as a dowry captured for the Jewish king the city of Gaza. There was instituted at this time also a commercial intercourse between Egypt and Israel, the latter state facilitating the trade in horses and wagons between the Egyptians and the Hathites and Arameans. The 22nd Dynasty, the Libyan Kings, 945 to 800 BC. The reader will no doubt remember what was said on a former page concerning the Libyan wars of Seti I and Ramses II and concerning the ingress of Libyan mercenaries in these reigns. These mercenaries were called Ma an abbreviation of the name of Mashawasha tribe, and their leaders bore the titles of Or and Ma, that is, Duke of the Ma, and Our A and Ma, Grand Duke of the Ma. They seem to have settled in great numbers in the western part of the delta. The family of one of these leaders that lived in Budapest rose to great power, and finally, one of its members, Shashinki I, succeeded in wresting the scepter from the weak hands of Pasipshanu II, the last of the priest kings. The first member of this family who migrated from Libya to Egypt was the Tehen Libyan Biwawa. He came in about the time of Hera Ho. His son, Mausen already had the title of Grand Duke of the Ma. 
In this position, his son Nabnisha and his grandson Patut succeeded him. Patut's son, Shakshinki, was married to Princess Mahatam Oret, and their son Nemrod married Tentispa. This latter couple lived about the time of King Pindjim. Their son was Shashinki I, who on the death of Nimart succeeded him in the offices of Grand Duke of the Ma and Commander-in-Chief of the Army. Shashinki I, 945-924 BC, the Shishak of the Bible, an inscription in Abydos, shows how highly King Basip Shanu esteemed Shashinki and his family, for it tells us this monarch kept in repair the tomb of the late Grand Duke Namart and prayed to Amun Ra for the success of Shishanki's arms, holding the entire power of the land, the army in his grasp. Shashinki was the real ruler of Egypt, and it was not at all unnatural that he at length, about 945 BC, either deposed King Basib Shanu or took advantage of that king's death to become king in name as well as in fact. Makara, the daughter of the late king, was compelled to marry the crown prince Usarkin, so that he might have a legitimate claim to the throne. That Egypt gained by this change of rulers is an undeniable fact. Immediately after ascending the throne, the new pharaoh issued a stringent edict against all depregations on the property of the dead, the tombs and states set aside for payment of sacrificial offers were considered the property of the dead by priests or other persons. This edict proved that he was determined not to tolerate the state of affairs that had existed in the necropolis under his predecessors. The edict in question prescribes the funeral sacrifices for his father. The king expressly states that he had punished those priests that had stolen from the funeral state. This was no doubt a warning to all inclined to go and do likewise, and seems to have no doubt backed by an effective police, had the desired effect, for we hear of no further robberies in the Theban necropolis in this and the following reigns. Early in this reign, Jeroboam had fled to his court. He returned to Israel only after the death of Solomon, to become king of the ten tribes. It may be that Shashinki assisted him to return and gain the throne, as he had married the pharaoh's sister-in-law Anu. The most important event of Shashinki's reign was his Asiatic campaign. He invaded Palestine, and after overrunning and plundering the country and taking its chief towns, he finally invested and captured the city of Jerusalem in the fifth year of King Rehoboam's reign. The Egyptians sacked the town and carried off, among other things, the treasure Solomon had deposited in the temple. The city is designated as Yad Malik, the royal Jewish city, in the Egyptian inscription treating of this raid. The king appointed his son Abut, high priest of Amun Ra, the fattest office in his gift, thus uniting in his family the highest civil, military, and religious powers of the realm. This pharaoh built chiefly in Thebes. At Karnak, he began the so-called Hall of the Bubastides, which was completed by his successors. He died after a reign of about 21 years, and Yusarkin, his son by Queen Karama, succeeded him. Shashinki's successors, Yusarkin I, Usarkin, ascended the throne about 923 BC, 
He was an unimportant ruler. All we know of him is that he continued the work begun by his father at Karnak, and that his wife Makara conveyed all her rights and domains to her family, that is, her husband and his sons. In consideration of this, her son Shashinki was proclaimed co-regent and appointed governor of the south, but he never ascended the throne having in all probability died before Usarkin. How long this pharaoh ruled we do not know. On his death, take Lot I, son of Queen Tameh Shansu, ascended the throne. Of him we know only that he was married to Queen Caps, and that his son by this lady Usarkin succeeded him. Usarkin II ruled 23 years, and built at Karnak, Budapest, and other places. The following king, Teklot II, was a little more important. In his reign occurred two rebellions, which are, unfortunately, not described in detail. In the eleventh year of his reign, a rebellion broke out, where he does not tell us in his inscription, which was subdued. Four years afterward, another text states that children of the rebels attacked Egypt from the north and from the south, but were repulsed after a long struggle, whereupon they fell into internal dissensions. Unfortunately, these texts do not inform us who these rebels and children of the rebels were. Possibly we find in these rebellions the beginning of the disintegration of Egypt, which was completed at the time the Ethiopian king Pianchi invaded the country. Teklot seems to have been strong enough, however, to keep the land together. In the course of the latter text, there is a notice that on a certain date the sky had become unrecognizable and the moon had assumed a terrible aspect. After a reign of over 15 years, the king died and his son Shashinki III succeeded him. This pharaoh was the last of this line, whose name appears in the inscriptions of Karnak. It would seem that either he or his next successor had been driven out of the capital. He reigned 52 years. The last kings of this dynasty, Pimai, Shashinki IV, and Usarkin III, were in all probability confined to the delta. At the time of Pianchi's invasion, Usarkin III was king of Budapest merely, or perhaps divided the delta with Abut, king of Klisma. The Ethiopians and Assyrians in Egypt Dynasties 23, 24, and 25, 800 to 645 BC. Section 1. Dynasty 23, the disintegration of Egypt and the first Ethiopian invasion. Already under Sheshank III, Thebes seems to have been lost to the Libyan dynasty. The last monument that mentions any king of the 22nd dynasty in Karnak is dated from the 29th year of Sheshank's reign, and after the loss of Thebes, these kings were confined to the delta. Four kings are mentioned in the inscription of King Pianchi, but we know little of any one of them. They are Usarken of Bubastis, probably the same man as Usarken III, the last of the Bubastides, Aaupet of Klisma, Nemart of Khmunu, Hermopolis, and Pefdedbast of Chenensuten, Heracleopolis. Manetho states that Pefdedbast, whom he calls Petubastis, reigned forty years. A notice preserved by Ammian to the effect that in his time the Phoenicians had suddenly attacked and taken Thebes is probably a faint recollection of the Ethiopian invasion. At all events, the inscription of Pianchi, which mentions besides these four kings, sixteen rulers of smaller districts, amply proves that Egypt was at this time completely disintegrated. The Rise of Ethiopia We have seen that for many centuries Ethiopia was an Egyptian province, but it would seem that at the close of the 21st dynasty it gradually emancipated itself from Egypt. 
In the times of the 22nd dynasty, Ethiopia was no longer under Egyptian rule. Several historians have attempted to bring into connection the fall of the 21st dynasty and the establishment of the Ethiopian kingdom, by assuming that the heirs of Paseb Khanu had fled before Sheshank I to that country early in the 10th century before the Common Era, and had founded a theocratic government there. This hypothesis is in some measure confirmed by the name of the first Ethiopian invader of Egypt, Pianchi, a name that occurs also in the times of the priest kings. There is not, however, sufficient proof to assert this as an established fact. Be that as it may, we find that about the time of the 22nd dynasty, Ethiopia had become an independent kingdom. The capital was Napata, at the foot of the Gebel Barkal, where Amenhotep III had erected a temple to Amun-Ra. The centuries of dependence had firmly established Egyptian civilization in Ethiopia. The religion was that of Amun-Ra, though it was carried out to consequences unknown in Egypt. The priests had an almost absolute power. In the name of Amun, the kings went out on their wars. They were entirely dependent on his prophecies and oracles, as interpreted by the priests. They strictly observed the laws regarding cleanliness and all the minute details of the ritual. Thus, they put into practice what had been mere theory in Egypt. A long inscription relates how the king was chosen directly through an oracle of Amun-Ra, thus confirming the account given by Diodorus. The priests had, moreover, the right to command the king in the name of Amun to commit suicide, a pernicious practice that Ergamenes in the 3rd century BC put a stop to. It is then not to be wondered at that the Egyptian priests described Ethiopia to the Greek tourists as a promised land. The titulature of the kings was modeled after that of the pharaohs. The official language of the realm was the Egyptian, with some dialectic peculiarities. The script in the older inscriptions is hieroglyphic. Gradually the language changed more and more, becoming surcharged with Ethiopian elements, and at last it has changed to such an extent as to be completely unintelligible. The script also changed with time. A cursive form known as the Meroitic Demotic script arose, which no one has yet succeeded in deciphering. In this script, most of the Ethiopic inscriptions are written, and it is only after this has been deciphered that we can gain a clear picture of the history of the new Ethiopian kingdom. Early in the 8th century BC, the new kingdom was strong enough to attack Egypt. The disintegration of Egypt offered the then Ethiopian ruler, Pianchi, a fine opportunity of subduing the country that had so long held his native land in subjugation. He invaded Egypt, and seems to have found but little resistance. The inscription which treats of his Egyptian campaign enumerates the twenty sovereigns who at that time ruled Egypt. 1. Usarken, king of Perbastet, Bubastis, in the Delta. 2. Aalpet, king of Tenremu, Klisma, in the Delta. 3. Nemart, king of Khmunu, Hermopolis Magna, Ashmunein, in Upper Egypt. 4. Pefdedbast, king of Chenensuten, Heracleopolis Magna, Ahnes, in Upper Egypt. 5. Tefnacht, prince of Sa, Seis, and Mennefer, Memphis. 6. Sheshenk, chief of mercenaries in Per Usiri, Bucyrus, in the Delta. 7. Ched Amon Alfanch, chief of mercenaries in Per Banebded, Mendes, in the Delta. 8. Ankhor, chief of mercenaries in Pertot Uprohe, Hermopolis. 9. Bekennef, hereditary prince. 10. Nesnaketi, chief of mercenaries in the city of Kasset, Kois, in the Delta. 11. Pedubast, chief of mercenaries in Het Heriab, Athribis, in the Delta. 12. Patenf, chief of mercenaries in Persopt, capital of the 20th Lower Egyptian Nome. 13. Pama, chief of mercenaries in Pasasrek, Bucyrus. 14. Nechthor Nashenu, chief of mercenaries in Percherrer, Fagroriopolis. 15. Padu Hor Samtawi, priest of Horus, in Sechem, Setopolis. 16. Herubusa, prince of Sayut, Siut and Hesawi. 
17. Chet Chiao, Prince of the City of Chent Nefer. 18. Babas, Prince of Cherchao, Babylon, and Perhapi, Nilopolis. 19. A Chief of Mercenaries in Tanis. 20. A Chief of Mercenaries in Ostracine. These kings and princes seem to have offered but little or no resistance to the Ethiopian invader, and to have remained tranquil under his control for some time. But the spirit of liberty was not dead in the land of Kemet. In the twenty-first year of Pianchi's reign, an attempt was made by Tefnacht, prince of Sais in Memphis, who was by far the mightiest of these petty sovereigns, to deliver Egypt from the Ethiopian domination. He succeeded in uniting the many petty rulers of Lower and Middle Egypt under his leadership. Then he sailed up the Nile, and everywhere the cities opened their gates to him. At Chenensuten he met with the first resistance. King Pefdedbast seemed determined to maintain his separate sovereignty under Pianchi's protection. The city was besieged and taken, but Pefdedbast joined the alliance in only a half-hearted manner. The allies now proceeded south, and at Khmunu were joined by King Nemart, who became one of the most useful members of the coalition. They then went against Thebes. Matters were now becoming serious, and Pianchi, on hearing of what was going on, ordered Poa Arma and Ramer Sekni, his lord lieutenants in Upper Egypt, to oppose the progress of the rebellion. They immediately took active measures and began the siege of Khmunu. To aid in their operations, the Ethiopian king had sent an army north. As they approached Thebes on their fleet, they encountered Tefnacht's fleet. A battle ensued in which the Egyptians were defeated. Leaving Ramer Sekni and Po Arma to take Khmunu, the Ethiopians pursued the fleeing Egyptians northward. The Egyptians made a stand at Chenensuten, which city was the key of the Fayum. Here two battles occurred on succeeding days. The first was fought on the Nile. Possibly the Egyptians sought to prevent the enemy from landing. The second was fought on the riverbank at Perpek, a town near Chenensuten. In both these battles, the patriots were defeated with heavy loss. Meanwhile, Khmunu had fallen, and Nemart, hearing of this, determined to retake his capital. Marching rapidly south, he laid siege to the town, and after defeating several sallies made by the Ethiopian garrison, recaptured it. Thus matters stood when Pianchi determined to come north and conduct the campaign in person. Before he started, however, his troops had gained some further advantages, taking several smaller fortresses, of which the most important was Tatehen. This strong fort was taken by storm after a most determined resistance. Among the slain was one of Tefnacht's sons. Finally the king came. After celebrating a religious festival at Thebes, he marched against Khmunu. A regular siege was commenced. A high wall was built around the town, and a shower of arrows and stones was thrown into the city. Three days the town held out, but finally Nemart was compelled to surrender and pay tribute. Pefdedbast of Chenensuten came up the stream and paid homage to Pianchi, bringing him costly presents. His ready submission proved that he had joined Tefnacht much against his will, and inclined the king to be gracious. Pianchi now sailed downstream to Per Sechem Cheperra Illahun, a strong fortress in the northern part of the Fayum, which was surrendered on the first summons. Just north of this lay the stronghold of Meritum, Medum, which seemed inclined to hold out, a peremptory summons leaving the city the choice between immediate surrender and a massacre of its garrison in case of a storm, however, brought the commandant to terms. At the northern boundary of Upper Egypt, there was a strongly fortified city which was also surrendered on Pianchi's approach. This left the way open to Memphis. The city was very strongly fortified. Tefnacht had laid in it a garrison of 8,000 men and then gone north, probably to collect reinforcements. The Ethiopian monarch hesitated about storming the sacred city and summoned it to surrender, offering to enter the city peaceably as his only desire in coming to Memphis was to pay his homage to the gods. But Memphis was the key of the delta, and the garrison was determined to hold out. Besides, Tefnacht's reinforcements could be expected daily. The king therefore ordered his soldiers to storm the town. 
They effected a landing in the harbor of Memphis, and, scaling the walls, were soon masters of the city. Many of the garrison and of the citizens fell in the combat, and many others were carried off as prisoners of war. The city was plundered, but the temples were spared, a guard having been set over them. Pianchi remained in Memphis several days, partly to take part in several religious festivals, and partly to receive the tribute of several princes and grand dukes of the Ma that came here to offer their submission. He next advanced to An Heliopolis, where he attended some other religious festivals, and received the submission of a number of other princes, among them Usar Ken, king of Bubastis. Then he went to Hot Heri Ab, Athribis, where he received the submission of the last remaining rebellious princes except Tefnacht. This leader, deserted by all his allies, determined to make a last stand for freedom. Raising the walls and burning down the treasury buildings of Sais, he retired to the island city of Mest in the Nile, and strongly entrenched himself. Prince Peftubast of Athribis was sent against him with a strong detachment. A battle ensued in which Tefnacht was defeated and his army annihilated. Tefnacht now sent messengers to Pianchi, offering to surrender. The king sent him two ambassadors, in whose presence he swore the oath of allegiance. Two cities that had hitherto held out now also surrendered. The rebellion was crushed. After holding a grand reception of the princes, Pianchi returned home, his ships laden down with the tribute and booty won in the war. Pianchi reigned in all forty years, but he had no further occasion to interfere in Egypt. This was owing to his wise policy. He left all of the old princes in possession of their lands, and thus bound them to his person, as they owed their sovereignty to his grace. Moreover, a disunited Egypt was no menace to him, and the bickerings among the various petty kings could at any time furnish him a pretext for invading the country. That he was determined to prevent the union of these princes was proved by the great campaign against Tefnacht and his allies. He had no idea of holding the country, but retired, after having effectively choked Tefnacht's attempt to unite the various petty states into a great kingdom. Section 2. The 24th Dynasty, Saitic, B.C. 734-728 to Bekenrenf, the only king of this dynasty, seems to have succeeded in doing what Tefnacht had attempted over nineteen years before. According to Diodorus, who calls him Bokhoris, he was the son of Tnefachthos, who is no doubt identical with Tefnacht. For about six years he ruled undisturbed by the Ethiopians. All we know of him from the monuments is that he buried an apis at Memphis in the sixth year of his reign. In Ethiopia, Kashta had succeeded Pianchi. This monarch was married to Shepen Apet, a daughter of King Usarken of Bubastis. Their son, Shabaka, succeeded him and immediately determined to conquer Egypt. He could lay a certain claim to the Egyptian throne, as his mother was a daughter of the last Bubastide king. In invading the country, he defeated Bekenrenf, Manetho states that he burned him alive, and compelled the various petty kings to acknowledge his sovereignty. Section 3. The 25th Dynasty, Ethiopians, the Assyrian Invasions, 728-645 to BC. Shabaka the Sabakon of the Greeks, Saw of the Bible, and Shabe of the Assyrians, 728 to 726 BC. Herodotus relates that Sabakon, the Ethiopian, had conquered Egypt and had left it after a reign of fifty years in consequence of a dream. Diodorus comes nearer the truth when he states that four Ethiopian kings ruled Egypt for thirty-six years. Shabaka took the title of King of Upper and Lower Egypt, but appointed his sister, Amenerdas, who was married to a man named Pianchi, regent of the country. The Greek authors praise this ruler highly. He is reputed to have abolished capital punishment, substituting hard labor for it. This pharaoh became mixed up in Asiatic affairs. King Hosea of Israel had joined other Syrian monarchs in a rebellion against Salmanasser IV, king of Assyria, and the allies had sent to Shabaka, asking his assistance. The plot was discovered, Hosea was called to Assyria and thrown into prison. 
Salmanasser invested Samaria about 725 BC, but died before the city fell. His successor, Sharrukinu, Sargon II, continued the siege and took the city in 722 BC. Shortly after, a new coalition was formed at the head of which stood King Ilubid of Hamath. This coalition embraced, besides Hamath, Arpad, Semira, Damascus, Gaza, and Egypt. Sargon, however, was too quick for the Allies. Before Shabaka could join them, Sargon met and routed their forces at Karkar. He now moved southward and met Shabaka, who had meanwhile been joined by King Hanno of Gaza at Raphia. The Allies were badly defeated, and Hanno was taken prisoner, 720 BC. Sargon could not follow up his victory and invade Egypt, as events had meanwhile occurred in the north which called him to the new seat of war, but he had gained his purpose. Shabaka was badly crippled, and even sent tribute. This pharaoh died about 716 BC. Shabataka, 715 to 703 BC. The successor of Shabaka is a king of whom we do not know much. Despite the fact that he reigned twelve years, he seems to have done little. In Asia, he did not interfere. Probably the defeat of Shabaka at Raphia had been so complete as either to cripple Egypt for years, or at least to discourage her rulers from attacking Assyria again. Taharqa, 702 to 662 BC. This king was in all probability not of royal parentage, but came to the throne by marrying Shabataka's widow. He was twenty years of age when he ascended the throne. Young and active, he was willing to restore to Egypt its former prestige. Meanwhile, Sargon had been assassinated, and his son, Sin Ahierib, Sanherib, had ascended the Assyrian throne, 705 BC. Immediately, a new coalition was formed against Assyria. Elulius of Tyre, Hezekiah of Judah, and Zidka of Ascalon formed a league and called upon Taharqa for assistance. Marduk Balladin, the Chaldean ruler of Babylon, was also drawn into the league and conducted negotiations with Hezekiah. King Padi of Akaron, who had refused to join the rebels, was deposed and turned over to Hezekiah. This mighty coalition, if properly handled, would have been a match for the Assyrians, but Sanherib was too quick for them. In 701 BC, he entered Syria and subdued Elulius. Then going south, he took Ascalon and Akaron. At Altaku, he met and defeated Taharqa, who had attempted to check him. After taking Altaku and some other towns, Sanherib marched on Jerusalem. Hezekiah submitted, and Badi was restored to his kingdom. The rebellion was not, however, crushed as yet. Hezekiah continued his negotiations with Taharqa, who had returned to Egypt to collect a new army. Sanherib, hearing of this, accused the Jewish king of treason and threatened him with destruction. Relying on Jehovah and the king of Egypt, Hezekiah boldly held out. Jerusalem was besieged. Meanwhile, Taharqa was coming to the aid of his ally with a new army. Sanherib advanced to meet him, but his army was so reduced by pestilence that he had to retire without giving battle. The story of the Bible is well known. The angel of the Lord smote the Assyrian army in the night, and 185,000 men died, whereupon Sanherib had to retire. Herodotus has a somewhat different version of the affair. He relates that after the Ethiopian Sabakon, a pious priest of Ptah, named Sethos, ruled in Egypt. He denied his soldiers certain privileges and thus gained their enmity. When Sennacherib, king of the Arabians and Assyrians, marched against Egypt, they refused to fight, and Sethos was placed in a sad predicament. He prayed to the gods for aid, and they sent out mice that ate up the bows and belts of the Assyrian army encamped about Pelusium during the night, so that the Egyptian merchants and mechanics could easily defeat them next day. The First Assyrian Invasion Sanherib never returned to Palestine. He was assassinated in 681 BC, and his son, Asar Haddon, Ashur Ahiddin, ascended the throne. Trouble between him and Taharqa began in 672 BC, when King Baal of Tyre, relying on promises of assistance from Taharqa, rebelled against Assyria. 
Assarhaddon now determined to put an end to Egyptian interference. A detachment of his army besieged Tyre, while the main body marched against Egypt. The prince of the Bedouins, dwelling on the Egyptian border, gladly furnished camels and water, and thus the difficult march from Raphia to Pelusium was accomplished without serious loss. Taharqa seems to have offered but little resistance, for the Assyrian army entered Memphis, and soon after Thebes also was taken and sacked. Taharqa fled to Ethiopia. After these victories, Assarhaddon styled himself King of Musur, Lower Egypt, Patrus, Upper Egypt, and Kush, Ethiopia. The land itself was left under the control of twenty independent petty sovereigns, as follows. 1. Niku, Nekau, of Mimpi, Memphis, and Sai, Sais. 2. Sharruladari, of Tzirnu. 3. Pisanhu, of Nathu, Natho. 4. Bakruru, of Pishaptu, Persopt, the capital of the Nomos Arabia, the twentieth Lower Egyptian nome. 5. Puknanipi, Bekenneth, of Hathiribi, Hatheriab, Athribis. 6. Nahki, of Chinenshi, Chenensuten. 7. Pitubisti, Pedubast, of Tzaunu, Tanis. 8. Unamunu, of Nathu. 9. Horsiaishu, of Tamuti, Chebnuter, Sebenethos. 10. Puwama, Bimai, of Bindidi, Perbanebded, equals Mendes. 11. Sudzinku, Sheshenk, of Pusiri, Perusiri, Busiris. 12. Tapnachti, Tefnacht, of Punubu, Pernub. 13. Pukunanni Pi, of Ahni. 14. Ipti Hardishu, of Pisati Hurunpi. 15. Nahti Huruantini, Necht Hornashenu, of Pishabdinuti. 16. Bukurninip, of Pahnuti. 17. Ziha, of Ziautu, Siut. 18. Lamintu, of Himuni, Khmunu. 19. Ishbimatu, of Taani, Teni, Fis. 20. Mantipianchi, Mentu Emhat, of Nih, Thebes. It is impossible for us to identify those of the Assyrian names of Egyptian princes and cities, the Egyptian names of which we have not given. The mightiest of these princes was Nekau, Assyrian Niku, Greek Neko, prince of Memphis and Sais, according to Manetho, 671 to 663 BC. He was the favorite of Assarhaddon. At this monarch's request, Nekau changed the name of Sais to Karbel Matati, Garden of the Lord of Lands, and gave his son Psemtek the Assyrian name Nabu Shezib Anni. Shortly after the conquest of Egypt, Assarhaddon resigned the crown in favor of his son Assurbanipal, about 668 BC. The Second Assyrian Invasion This change in the rulers of Assyria encouraged Taharqa to attempt the delivery of Egypt from Assyrian rule. He advanced on Thebes, Assyrian Nil and Mentuemhat, Assyrian Mantipianchi, received him with open arms, hailing him as a deliverer. Memphis was taken soon after, and the Ethiopian proceeded to make himself at home in Egypt. When Assurbanipal heard of this, he at once determined to punish the Ethiopians. He advanced to Karbana, a town north of Memphis, where he met and utterly routed Taharqa's forces. The king himself, who had remained at Memphis, on hearing of this defeat, at once fled to Thebes, which city he abandoned on the approach of the Assyrian army without a battle, about 667 BC. Meanwhile, the Egyptian princes, under the leadership of Nekau of Sais, Sharladari of Tanis, and Pakruru of Persopt, had opened negotiations with Taharqa, inviting him to renew his attack and promising their support. Their letters were, however, intercepted, and the conspirators were arrested. 
proof against them was not wanting, but the Assyrian king evidently thought it wise policy not to punish them. They were left in possession of their holdings, but had to swear allegiance to Assurbanipal. Nekau, the favorite of his father, was sent home loaded down with presents, and his son, Nabu Shezibani, was appointed governor-general of Egypt. Assurbanipal hoped to gain a powerful ally in this manner, and he was not disappointed. In the Greek accounts, Taharqa figures as a great hero and conqueror. Strabo relates that he reached the columns of Hercules, the westernmost point of northern Africa, on one of his campaigns, and according to Megosthenes, he led his army to India, and thence to the Pontus and Thrace. In his inscriptions, he poses as a mighty conqueror. Fourteen Negro tribes are mentioned as subdued in Ethiopia. The list of conquered nations he had inscribed on the walls of the Temple of Karnak is copied word for word from that of Ramses II, and even mentions, among other states, Asser, while we know he was several times whipped by the Assyrians. At Gebel Barkal, he built two temples, and at Karnak he repaired portions of the great temple of Amun-Ra and of the temple of Mut. He died about 664 BC. Tanawat Amun and the Third Assyrian Invasion The stepson of Taharqa ascended the Ethiopian throne about 664 BC. An inscription found at the Gebel Barkal relates that this king had been encouraged by a dream that promised him the crown of Egypt to invade that country. Elephantine and Thebes hailed him as a deliverer. Memphis resisted, but was taken after a battle. It is very probable that Nekau, prince of Memphis and Sais, who died about this time, 664 BC, fell in one of the battles with Tanuat Amun. When he was at Memphis, a deputation of Egyptian princes, headed by Pakruru of Persopt, offered their submission. The others withdrew to their fortresses and refused to yield. Tanuat Amun evidently did not feel strong enough to attack them, and preferred to return to Memphis, where he had long theological arguments with those princes who submitted. When Assurbanipal heard of this new Ethiopian invasion by Urdamani, as the Assyrian inscriptions call Tanuat Amon, he sent an army against him. The Ethiopians immediately withdrew before the approach of the Assyrians and fled to Ethiopia. Thus, about 662 BC, was driven from Egypt, the last Ethiopian king who dared invade the country. Semtek the first, six forty five through six ten BC. We have seen in the preceding chapter how the house of Sais gradually rose in importance. The first Ati, as the Egyptians called the petty sovereigns of the preceding epoch, of this line that succeeded in gaining supreme power even though for a short time only, was Tefnut, the contemporary of Usarken III, king of Bubastis, and the great opponent of Pianchi. How his attempt at unifying Egypt failed, we have already seen. A descendant of his was the Beken Renf, who ruled at least in Lower Egypt for six years. 734 through 728 BC. The next prince we know is Nekau, the favorite of Asarhaddon and Asur Banipal. As predecessors of this Nekau, Manetho mentions Stephanites, ruled seven years, and Nechepsos, ruled six years. The Egyptian names of which princes are unknown. This Nekau seems to have come to his death about the time Tanuat Amon invaded Egypt, 664 BC. Nekau was succeeded by his son Samtek, the Samatikos of the Greeks, who was given the name of Nabu. Ushesib Ani, at Asurbanipal's request. Samtek seems to have been a faithful ally of Assyria for quite some while, but he merely waited a chance to gain his independence. 
he entered into friendly relations with Tanuat Amon, marrying one of his relatives, the Ethiopian princess Shep en Apet, a daughter of Queen Amonardas. As Amonardas had been queen of Egypt, Semtek thus acquired a claim to the throne. At length, the right moment came, about 645 B.C., aided by mercenaries sent him by King Gyges of Lydia, he succeeded in making himself independent from Assyria. It is evident that he succeeded in this only after a struggle, but we have no record of his combats with Assyria. His next enemies were in Egypt itself, though he was undoubtedly the rightful sovereign of the country. Yet the many petty rulers that divided the country among themselves did not submit without a struggle. Semtek, however, succeeded in gaining the ascendancy and uniting Egypt under his scepter. Semtek made Sais his capital. This made Neit, the great goddess of Sais, the official head of the national pantheon, and deposed Amon-Ra, who had held this position, with some interruptions, for about fifteen hundred years. Memphis, the oldest capital of Egypt and part of Semtek's original principality, was also highly favored, and many of the government offices were located there. Thebes was falling into decay. The Assyrian wars had dealt the city a blow from which it never recovered. True, Semtek and some of his successors built here and repaired the great temple of Amon, but the city never again rose into prominence. Of the city of Sais, there remains today scarce a trace. The climate and soil of the delta are not favorable to the preservation of ruins, and after the city had once fallen into decay, all traces of it rapidly disappeared. Mindful of the great debt he owed the Greek mercenaries, Semtek little by little increased them. By this action he incensed the native mercenaries, who had hitherto ruled supreme in Egypt. According to Herodotus, two hundred and forty thousand men of the warriors who stood on the left of the king emigrated to Ethiopia in this reign because they had not been relieved in their garrisons for three years. This story is assuredly untrue, but it reflects the fact that the native troops were highly dissatisfied and were no particular friends of Semtex. The stories that the Greek authors tell us of his scientific experiments to ascertain which people was the oldest of the world, and those that they relate of his efforts to find the source of the Nile, are all alike untrue and legendary. The remark of Strabo that he was one of the greatest conquerors of the world is also false. The king was too much occupied with internal affairs to go in search of foreign conquest. The real fact of the matter is that Semtek was confined to Egypt proper. On the western frontier, he fortified Marea as a defense against Libya. On the Asiatic frontier, he erected the strong fortress of Daphne near Pelusium, and on the Ethiopic frontier, the town of Suen, Aswan, Sayen, was strongly fortified. The fact that the three frontiers were thus put in a state of defense proves that the king did not make any conquests. Herodotus relates that he conquered Asdod 
after a siege of 29 years, but there is no reason to believe this. The policy of this king and of all his successors was to gain the friendship of the Greeks. He gave lands along the banks of the Pelusian branch of the Nile, near Bubastis, to the Ionians and Carians, and in order that they might come into communication with his subjects, he gave them Egyptian boys whom they should teach Greek and who were to serve as interpreters. The Milesians, soon after, entered the Balbitic arm of the Nile and settled a fortified camp, which was called the Milesian camp. Tyrian merchants settled possibly about the same time in Memphis and gave their name to the Tyrian quarter of this city. The king died about 610 B.C., having been prince of Sais and Memphis from 664 B.C. and king from 645 B.C. on. Section 2. Nekau. Greek Neko and Nekau. 610 through 594 B.C. Nekau successfully continued the policy of his father. Herodotus relates that he began the construction of a canal which was to connect the Nile with the Red Sea, and that after a hundred and twenty thousand laborers had perished, Nekau suddenly stopped the work, having been warned by an oracle that he was working for the barbarians. This story is very improbable. A canal connecting the Nile with the Red Sea existed already in the times of Seti I and Ramses II, about 700 years before this time. This canal was mentioned in the Assyrian inscriptions of the 8th century BC, and it is scarcely possible that it could have disappeared entirely in less than a century. Nikau possibly cleared it of sand and widened it. The story of the enormous number of laborers who perished during the progress of the work and that of the oracle are both utterly false. Herodotus relates a story of a great maritime enterprise undertaken at this time, which seems quite credible. He states that Nekau sent out Phoenician ships from the Red Sea to circumnavigate Africa, and that in the third year of their journey they returned to the Mediterranean through the Straits of Gibraltar. The very fact that Herodotus questions, namely that in circumnavigating Libya, that is, Africa, they had the sun on their right hand, proves that they really did accomplish their task. The same historian relates that Nikau kept fleets of triremes in the Mediterranean and the Red Sea. Nikau felt himself strong enough to attempt the restoration of Egyptian supremacy in Asia. Great changes had meanwhile taken place on this continent. Asur Banapal died the king of a great empire, but his successors were not able to hold their own. About 608 BC, Nabu Palasar, whom Asur Banapal had appointed viceroy of Babylon, threw off the Assyrian yoke and founded an independent Babylonian kingdom. Intent on crushing out the Assyrian kingdom, he allied himself with King Kyaxares of Medea, and together they attacked and completely annihilated the Assyrian kingdom. The Medes kept all the land east and north of the Tigris, the Babylonians, Mesopotamia, and Syria. Nekau thought the time had now come to intervene in Asia. Accordingly, in the spring of the year 608 B.C., he invaded the continent. 
he encountered no resistance until he reached Megiddo, here at the very spot where almost a thousand years before Tutmosis III had defeated the Syrian coalition. King Josiah of Judah had drawn up his army, ready to dispute Nikau's advance. The pharaoh, not wishing to lose time in subduing the petty sovereigns of Syria and Palestine, haughtily ordered the Jewish king to give way. Josiah refused, and was arranging his army for the coming battle when he was fatally wounded by an arrow. The king was brought back to Jerusalem, where he died, and was buried amid the wailings of his people, over whom he had ruled for thirty-nine years. Nekau continued his march to Ribla, near Hamath, where he went into camp. Meanwhile, the Jews had elected Joachim, the son of Josiah, king, but Nekau was dissatisfied with their choice and deposed him, giving the kingdom to his older brother Joachim and levying a heavy contribution on the land. Excepting Judea, Gaza was the only state that offered any resistance to the Egyptians. Up to the year 604 B.C., Nekau seems to have had his own way in Asia, but in that year Nabopolassar was ready to meet him. He himself was old and sick, so he sent his son, Nebuchadnezzar, Babylonian Nabuchaduri-Uzur, against the Egyptians. At Carchemish, on the banks of the Euphrates, the two armies met, and Nekau was utterly routed. His army must have been completely annihilated, for he left Syria to the victor, without daring to oppose him again. Nebuchadnezzar probably had the intention of invading Egypt, but the death of his father compelled him to return to Babylon. Nekau did not dare to interfere in Asia again. Time and again, the Jews begged him for assistance in their repeated revolts against the Babylonians. At last, Jerusalem fell, about 596 B.C., and Nebuchadnezzar was free to invade Egypt. But it seems that he was called to other parts of his kingdom, and the threatened invasion did not come until much later. Nekau died in 594 B.C., and was buried, like his father, in Sais. Section 3. Semtek II. 594 through 589 B.C. The only historical event of this short reign was an invasion of Ethiopia. Both Herodotus and Aristeus mention it, and an Egyptian inscription confirms their report. Late in this reign, General Neshor was sent against the Ethiopians, and the war was finally brought to a close early in the following reign. It may be that the trouble with Ethiopia had begun already in Nekau's time, and this would account for his otherwise incomprehensible policy with regard to the Jewish rebellions. The graffiti left on the Colossi of Abu Simbel by the Phoenician and Greek mercenaries that marched with the Egyptian army on this campaign still further confirm the report of Semtek's war in this quarter. Despite his short reign of only six years, this pharaoh was an active builder, restoring and repairing temples in all parts of Egypt, from the delta to Nubia. Section 4. O Habre. Greek, Apries. 589 through 564 BC. Early in this reign, 
Ness Hor brought to a successful conclusion. The Ethiopian War, begun in the reign of Semtek II. Ouhabre thought matters in Asia favored an intervention on his part. In Judea, important changes had taken place in the times of his predecessors. Joachim, the king whom Nekau had appointed, was deposed in 597 B.C. after a reign of eleven years, and Joachim, his son, put in his place by Nebuchadnezzar. Soon after, he also was deposed, and Zedekiah put in his place. Zedekiah, 596 through 586 BC, was not the man the Babylonian king had thought him. He determined, despite the warnings of the prophets, to win the independence of his kingdom. O Habre now came to his aid and began a war with Tyre. Sidon was taken, and a Cypriot fleet that opposed him was utterly defeated. Although thus far successful, the pharaoh withdrew soon after on the approach of the Babylonians. Meanwhile, Zedekiah had begun the war, but Jerusalem was soon invested, and, after a spirited resistance, was taken. July 587 B.C. While Ohabre did nothing to assist his sorely beset ally. Zedekiah was deposed and blinded, and Gedaliah was set on the throne. He was assassinated by a descendant of the family of Ishmael, who was soon after compelled to fly the country. He and his friends went to Egypt, where Ouahabre received them kindly. Soon after, Ouahabre began a war which promised better results. A war had broken out between the Greek city of Cyrene which lay on the northern coast of Africa, west of Egypt, and the Libyans. The Libyan king, Adekram, placed himself under the protectorate of Egypt, and an Egyptian army was immediately sent out to aid him. At the town of Irsa, on the well of Thestis, a battle ensued in which the Egyptian army was annihilated. This account taken from Herodotus is probably correct, but the rest of his account is certainly false. He relates that the Egyptians were furious over the defeat, and declared that Apries had sent out the native troops in order to have them annihilated, so that his rule over the rest of the Egyptians might be the more secure. This is entirely unnatural. In Egypt, the pharaoh was an absolute ruler. He was considered as the son of the god Ra and the incarnation of the god Horus, and it would not have been at all necessary for him to destroy the national troops in order to strengthen his rule. The troops, according to Herodotus, also murmured, and the king sent an officer named Amasis, Egyptian, Achmes, to quiet them. While he was addressing them, a soldier, stepping behind him, placed a helmet on his head and proclaimed him king. The rest of the army shouted their assent, and Amasis, gladly accepting the election, placed himself at their head and marched against the pharaoh. A messenger sent by Apries was sent back with a sarcastic reply. Apries now prepared for battle, and collecting his Greek mercenaries, to the number of thirty thousand, marched against his rival. At Mo Memphis, on the canopic branch of the Nile, the armies met, and Apries was, after a well-contested battle, defeated, captured, and brought to Memphis where he was kept in prison for a while, but was finally delivered up 
to the angry populace and strangled. This story is utterly false from beginning to end, as are also the many anecdotes the Greek writers tell of Amasis. We know, however, that Ouahabre, about six years before his death, appointed Achmes II co-regent. Achmes was wedded to Anchnes Nefer Ab Ra, a daughter of Semtek II, and to Neit Akert, a sister of Ouahabre. These facts completely refute the Greek legends. Why Achmes was appointed co-regent, we cannot say. Possibly the king had no male issue and wished to keep the succession in the family. In the time of their joint reign fell Nebuchadnezzar's invasion. This campaign was undertaken, according to the Babylonian inscriptions, in the 37th year of Nebuchadnezzar's reign, that is, in 567 B.C. The Babylonians found little or no resistance and easily succeeded in overrunning and plundering the whole land as far as Aswan, and then retired either voluntarily or after having been defeated by Nes Hor. Be that as it may, the Babylonians never again entered Egypt. Oua Habre died in 564 BC, after having ruled 25 years in all, 19 alone and 6 in conjunction with his brother-in-law and successor. Section 5 Achmes II Amasis 564-526 through 526 B.C. This pharaoh came into still closer connection with the Greeks than any of his predecessors. The many anecdotes the Greek authors tell of his private life and family relations are all untrustworthy, as are also the reports that Pythagoras, Solon, and Thales visited Egypt in his reign. Solon is even said to have copied from Amasis's laws one of the laws he promulgated at Athens in 594 BC, a statement that is of course absurd. Further, this king is said to have entered into friendly relations with Cleobulus, Bias, and Pittacus and to have foreseen the downfall of Polycrates. All of these stories, which are, by the by, chronologically impossible, have a direct tendency, namely, to prove that all of the knowledge and philosophy of Greece was derived from Egypt. Amasis being the king best known to the Greeks, they placed the Egyptian voyages of their sages in his reign. We have already alluded to these traditions in the introduction. More credible are the accounts the Greek writers give us of his wars. He fought against the Arabians, that is, the Asiatics, and in order to increase the valor of his troops, he had the statues of the chief divinities set up behind their ranks, so that the troops believed the gods themselves were observing them. He next sent out a fleet against Cyprus that succeeded in subduing the Cypriot cities, which remained Egyptian dependencies for some time thereafter. This expedition was most probably undertaken as part of Egypt's work in the great coalition which had been formed for the purpose of checking, if possible, the rise of the new Persian monarchy. This coalition was joined by Egypt, Lydia, Babylon, and Sparta. The object was to attack Persia from three sides at once, and, had the Allies acted in concert and not wasted valuable time over their preparations, they might have crushed Cyrus. As it was, Croesus, moved before the others were ready, 
and all the help he could get from his allies consisted in a detachment of troops sent him by Achmes. In the spring of 546 B.C., he entered Cappadocia, devastated the country, and captured the strong fortress of Teria. Now was the time for Achmes and Nabu Naid, king of Babylon, to act, but it was impossible for them to concentrate their forces and to cooperate properly. Cyrus first moved against Croesus and soon had conquered Lydia, taken its capital, and made the king a prisoner. Fall of 546 B.C. A Persian fleet sent against Cyprus easily succeeded in dislodging the Egyptian garrisons. Achmes now, instead of coming to the aid of his ally, Nabu Naid, remained inactive while the Persians conquered Babylon and took possession of Palestine and Syria as far as the Egyptian frontier. The pharaoh evidently hoped to pacify Cyrus by this inactivity, but he had gone just one step too far and had incurred the determined enmity of the Persians. That the invasion of Egypt did not follow immediately on the occupation of Palestine was owing to complications that had arisen on the eastern frontier. In the wars fought here, Cyrus lost his life, but his successor Cambyses soon punished Egypt for its share in the coalition against Persia. Achmes thought it to his advantage to interfere in Cyrene. Here, King Arcesilaus had been assassinated by Learchus, who had ascended the throne, and supported by Egyptian mercenaries, had instituted a most tyrannical rule. His misrule did not last long. He was assassinated at the instigation of Polyarchus and his sister, Erixo, who placed Battus, the son of Arcesilaus, on the throne. The Egyptian mercenaries now called on Achmes for aid, and he determined to take advantage of these conditions to subdue the city. Before he started on the expedition, however, his mother died, and he was detained in Egypt by the preparations for her interment. Polyarchus, accompanied by his mother Critola and his sister Erixo, now went to Egypt to propitiate the pharaoh. Achmes received them kindly, and praising the energy they had shown, dismissed them, loaded with presents. He now abandoned the expedition against Cyrene, as he was evidently satisfied with the recognition of his sovereignty. The two nations hereafter remained at peace until the downfall of Egypt. Achmes was confined entirely to Egypt. His expedition against Cyprus, though at first successful, had proved in the end a failure. In Asia, he dared not interfere. Ethiopia retained its independence, and his sovereignty over Cyrene was purely nominal. While the kingdom thus did not extend its boundaries under Achmes, still his reign was an epoch of great prosperity. Agriculture and commerce flourished, and it is stated that there were at this time 20,000 inhabited places in Egypt. The Greeks were, of course, greatly favored, and costly presents were made to their temples, among them being a contribution of a thousand pounds of alum, one of the most important raw products of Egypt, to the fund the Amphictyons were collecting for rebuilding the Delphic Temple. Greek immigration was greatly encouraged. The Ionians and Carians, whom Semtek I had settled on the Pelusic branch of the Nile, were removed to Memphis to serve as a bodyguard to the pharaoh. 
in place of the harbor thus lost to the Greeks. The king gave them the city of Naucratis and its surroundings in the neighborhood of the present city of Alexandria. This new city stood outside of the pale of Egyptian jurisdiction and was allowed to make its own laws. The result was that the inhabitants clung to their own Greek customs and institutions with the greatest tenacity and went their way entirely uninfluenced by their Egyptian neighbors. The city being originally intended for Ionians from Teos, its government was modeled after that of the latter city. This town became the center of Greek activity in Egypt. In it was erected the great sanctuary of the Greeks in Egypt. This was the Hellenion, which was built by several Greek cities conjointly. These cities were Chios, Teos, Phosei, Clazomene, Nidos, Halicarnassus, Phaselis, and Mytilene. The reason why so many cities helped to build the Hellenion was that all of the cities that took part in this work had the privilege of sending to Naucratis a supervisor of trade, or as we would put it, appointing a member of the board of trade. Temples to Zeus, Hera, and Apollo were also built by other cities, who thus gained the same privilege as the builders of the Hellenion. Naucratis rose very rapidly, owing to certain laws that gave her a complete monopoly of the trade with Greece. The Greeks soon had colonies in all parts of Egypt, even in the southern portions of the country. The Milesians had a trading post at Abydos, and Samian merchants even settled in the great oasis. Being engaged in no great wars, this pharaoh was enabled to devote considerable attention to the temples of the land. In all parts of Egypt, from the delta to the island of Baige, we find traces of his work. He died 526 BC, after having been co-regent of his brother-in-law for six years and sole ruler for 38 years. Section 6. Samtek III and the Persian Conquest of Egypt, 526 to 525 B.C. When Semtek III ascended the throne of his fathers, the catastrophe that had so long threatened the land at length overwhelmed it. The account of this catastrophe has been preserved to us by Herodotus. The stories that according to Greek traditions, impelled Cambyses to invade Egypt, are all untrustworthy, as they seek to bring Cambyses into relationship with the Egyptian kings and to find the cause of the war in this relationship, while making Cambyses appear at the same time as the legitimate pharaoh. The war, far from having any such cause, as the Greek historians would have us believe, had, in all probability, been determined on already by Cyrus, who was prevented from carrying out this part of his plan by other matters. Cambyses was free to attack Egypt, and he had ample cause for war in the fact that Egypt had been the ally of his father's worst enemies. King Croesus of Lydia and King Nabunaid of Babylon. Accordingly, Cambyses began making active preparations for the war, and everything indicated that he was going to have a hard time of it. The eastern frontier of Egypt was protected by the Syrian desert that skirted it, to cross which was a task of no small difficulty. Recognizing this fact, Achmes 
had concentrated his forces at Pelusium, hoping to gain an easy victory over the Persian army, which no doubt would suffer terribly in the desert and reach the Egyptian border sadly used up. Cambyses did not underrate the difficulty of the undertaking and made the most extensive preparations. A great fleet was fitted out to attack Pelusium by sea, while the army attacked it by land. Just as he was about to start, he received unexpected and timely aid. In the Egyptian army, there was a Holocarnassian officer named Phanes, a bright and able leader, who had had some difficulty with Achmes. In consequence of this, he had fled to the Persian monarch. On the way, he was overtaken by the king's favorite eunuch, but managed to escape. Shortly after this event, Achmes had died, and Semtek III had succeeded him. Phanes not only betrayed to the Persians all the secrets of the state, but he also showed them the means of crossing the desert without great loss. To accomplish this, envoys were sent to all the Bedouin sheiks of the desert, and treaties were concluded with them. They agreed to furnish the army with camels and water, and thus the Persian army was enabled to cross the desert and to reach Pelusium with but little loss. The battle that ensued was waged with great fury, but finally, after both sides had lost heavily, the Persians were victorious, and the Egyptians fled from the field. Pelusium surrendered soon after. A ship was now sent to Memphis, whither the pharaoh had fled, to demand the city's surrender. When it entered the harbor of Memphis, the garrison boarded it, killed the crew, and destroyed the vessel. This breach of international usage met with a severe but well-merited punishment. Memphis was besieged and taken. Ten days after the capture, the punishment came. Two thousand sons of the most respected citizens, among them the son of King Semtek, were executed to atone for the death of the two hundred men that had composed the crew of the ill-fated vessel. The daughter of the pharaoh and the noblest virgins were sold into slavery, and the fortunes of the richest citizens and of the king's friends were confiscated, leaving their former owners beggars. The fate of Semtek was comparatively light, Cambyses even intending to make him governor of Egypt, but he became involved in a conspiracy against Cambyses and was compelled to take poison. Thus ended the last of the Semtex. As a result of the capture of Memphis, the Libyans submitted voluntarily and paid tribute. Cyrene and Barsea also sent tribute, but this the Persian monarch divided among his soldiers, as he hoped to gain far more by capturing these rich towns than he could ever get from them as voluntary tribute. From the Persian Conquest to the Invasion of Alexander the Great 525 through 331 B.C. Section 1 The Twenty-Seventh Dynasty Persians 525 through 414 B.C. Cambyses 525 through 522 B.C. The fall of Memphis seems to have sealed the fate of Egypt. The rest of the country, in all probability, submitted peaceably. The very fact that the Libyans, Barsay, and Cyrene offered their submission 
and sent tribute right after the capture of Memphis, proves that from that time on the Persian monarch was the undisputed ruler of Egypt. Cambyses appointed Aryandi's satrap of Egypt, but seems not to have changed any of the laws and institutions of the land. Shortly after Memphis surrendered, the king paid a visit to Sais, the then capital of Egypt. The stories that Herodotus relates of outrages committed here by Cambyses are unhistorical, being utterly disproved by an inscription on the statue of the hereditary prince, Hor Ucha Sutenet, who had been keeper of the seal, chief scribe of the palace, admiral of the fleet, chief physician, etc., under Achmes II and Semtek III. This man relates that Kambut, Cambyses, came to Egypt and ruled all the land, remaining as king of Egypt and taking the coronation name of Mesut Ra. Hor Ucha Sutenet was appointed by him chief physician and superintendent of the palace. He initiated the king into the mysteries of the goddess Neit and described to him her temple. He now complained of the Persian soldiery that had taken quarters in the temple and begged that they be removed so that the temple might be clean again. The king ordered that the temple be cleansed, that all of her servants be restored to the goddess, and that her festivals be celebrated as of yore. When the king came to Sais, he went to the temple of Neit, worshipped her, and sacrificed to her and all the other gods of Sais. In short, conducted all the sacred ceremonies the same as every former king had done. He also ordered Hor Ucha Sutanet to prepare an inventory of all the temple utensils and to erect buildings for the goddess. We see that the Persian monarch strove to appear as the successor of the pharaohs, a policy he pursued until his understanding was clouded by insanity. Cambyses now determined to conquer the rest of Africa. Three expeditions were planned, one against Carthage, another against the oasis of Ammon, and a third against Ethiopia. The first of these expeditions was never undertaken, as the Phoenicians, who made up the greater part of the Persian fleet, refused to serve against Carthage, and Cambyses, owing to the fact that they had joined him voluntarily, did not dare to force them. The expedition against the oasis of Ammon proved a failure. An army of fifty thousand men started from Thebes and marched through the Sahara to the Greek town of Oasis. After they left the smaller oasis, no news of them ever reached Egypt. In all probability, they perished in a sandstorm. The expedition against Ethiopia was in the main successful, although the Greek historians strove to give the impression that it was a failure. Besides the half-legendary account of Herodotus, according to which provisions gave out on the march, and the men, after eating their beasts of burden, were compelled to resort to cannibalism, we have no full account of this campaign. But the fact that Ethiopian troops fought against the Greeks under Xerxes, and the mention by Ptolemy and Pliny of a town, Cambyson Tamiea, in Ethiopia, prove that the campaign was successful.
Moreover, Strabo and others relate that Cambyses captured the capital of Ethiopia and named it Meroa after his sister. As the army was returning, a sandstorm overtook it near the first cataract, and the greater part of the one hundred and fifty thousand men perished. Only a fragment of the great army returned to Egypt. Cambyses had, however, fully accomplished his object. He had thoroughly subdued Egypt and secured it against foreign invasion. On his return from Ethiopia, a great change came over the spirit of his reign. From early youth he had been subject to epileptic fits, and now he became insane. His insanity seems to have first broken out in Memphis at the festival of the enthroning of an Apis steer. While the king was warring in Ethiopia, the old Apis steer had died, and shortly before his return, a new one had been found. As he entered Memphis, he found, according to Herodotus, the citizens celebrating a great festival. This naturally angered him, as he supposed they were rejoicing over the loss of his army. So he summoned the elders of the city before him, and asked them why the Egyptians were celebrating a festival, now that he was returning after meeting with so severe a loss, and had celebrated no festival when he first came. They replied that a god had been born to the Egyptians, whose birth was always celebrated in this manner and the king had them executed as liars. He then sent for the priests, and on questioning them received the same answer. Now he made further inquiries regarding the god, and finally ordered the sacred steer to be brought before him. When the animal was brought, the king drew his sword, intending to kill it, but succeeded only in wounding it on the thigh. Then he scoffed at the priests, telling them their god was only flesh and blood after all. He now had the priests scourged, and had all persons who took part in the festival killed. The Apis died of his wound soon afterward, and was secretly interred by the priests. While this account is certainly overdrawn, we have no reason to doubt that the killing of the Apis is historical, for this does not seem to have been the only sacrilege the king was guilty of. He is accused of having made fun of the statues of Ta, which represent the god as a dwarf, and of having robbed temples and burned several statues of gods. These outrages were no doubt all committed after he had become insane, for the inscription of Hor Ucha Suten Net proves that in the early part of his reign this king had everywhere sought to imitate the pharaohs. The Greek historians were naturally prejudiced against him, and strove to make him appear as a wild, remorseless tyrant, in glaring contrast to his father Cyrus, whom they depicted as an ideal ruler. The whole history of Cambyses was written by Herodotus from an unhistorical standpoint. His object was to make this reign a grand tragedy. The king was a wild, insane tyrant, and his violent death was a punishment for his many sins against the gods and men. This may be tragedy, but it certainly is not history. Persia itself suffered from the insanity of the king just as much as did Egypt. Cambyses's greatest crime was the murder of his brother 
Barja, whom he had assassinated by Prexaspes. He is also accused of having attempted to murder Croesus, the old friend of his father, and of having killed the son of Prexaspes while drunk. At last the end came. Cambyses had, for unknown reasons, gone to Syria. Here, news of a revolt in Persia reached him. He had, before leaving Persia, appointed Patizathes, a Magian, superintendent of the palace. This man knew of the murder of Barja, and determined to make use of his knowledge. He had a brother named Gaumata, who closely resembled the murdered prince. This brother he placed on the throne, and proclaimed through all the land that Barja had ascended the throne of Persia. Cambyses easily convinced himself that this so-called Barja was a swindler, and determined to suppress the revolt. As he was about to start out on this expedition, he accidentally wounded himself. Tradition asserts in the thigh, the same place where he wounded the apis, and of this wound he died. Before his death, however, he assembled his nobles about his bed, confessed the murder of Barja, and urged them to punish the Median usurper. Darius I, Egyptian Antliush, 521 through 485 BC. For a while, the Persian nobles remained inactive, fearing to divulge the murder of Barja. But finally, in 521 BC, Darius, the son of Hystaspes, who was the next heir to the throne, Cambyses having died childless, with six companions succeeded in slaying the usurper. As Hystaspes declined the crown, Darius now became king of Persia. The new king was compelled to combat with several usurpers in Persia, but Egypt remained loyal. Aryandes, the satrap appointed by Cambyses had been left in office by Darius. He felt sufficiently strong to attempt the extension of the Persian power in Africa. A fine opportunity to do this soon offered itself. When Cambyses invaded Egypt, Cyrene had voluntarily submitted and paid tribute. King Arcesilaus III made about this time a trip to Barsea after having appointed his mother, Feratime, regent. Here he was murdered by some Cyrenaic refugees. As soon as Feratime heard of this, she went to Egypt and asked Aryandes to aid her in punishing the murderers of her son. Ariandes gladly assented, and sent an army under the Egyptian Achmes and a fleet under the Persian Badris against Barsea. Feratime herself accompanied the army. The combined forces reached the city without loss, and the extradition of Arcesilaus's murderers was demanded, but refused. The city was hereupon beleaguered, but held out for nine months, and was then captured only by stratagem. Feratime's revenge was terrible. Her son's murderers were crucified, and their wives were cruelly mutilated. Part of the prisoners taken were handed over to Feratime. Part were sent to Persia, and settled in Bactria by Darius. The army now advanced to Euhesperides, but soon began the retreat. A wrangle between the commanders had led to this retreat, and soon after they started, a messenger came from Ariandes, ordering them home. 
on the retreat, the Libyans are said to have attacked and cut to pieces the rear guard. Ariandes had a definite object in recalling the army. He had planned the foundation of an independent Egyptian empire. The details of his plan are unknown, but he seems to have become dangerous, for he was executed at the command of Darius. Late in the year 517 B.C., Darius himself came to Egypt. Shortly before his arrival, the Apis steer, which had been enthroned in the reign of Cambyses, died, and Darius offered a reward of one hundred talents to whomsoever would find the new Apis. Darius thus returned to the policy inaugurated by Cambyses when he first came to Egypt. Early in his reign, he ordered Hor Ucha Sutenet to fill the complement of temple scribes. This noble accordingly established schools for the scribes and fitted them out with everything that was needful, for Darius well knew that this was the best way of preserving the names of the gods, their temples and incomes forever. He repaired the temple of Memphis and made valuable presents to the temple of Edfu, but his chief work was the building of the temple in the oasis El Karge. We see, thus, that Darius posed everywhere as a pharaoh, and so successfully did he carry out this policy that he completely won the hearts of his Egyptian subjects in a very short while. Like Nikau, Darius determined to re-establish the connection between the Nile and the Red Sea that had existed in the times of Seti I and Ramses II. A stele bearing on one side an inscription in hieroglyphics and on the other side a translation of this in Median, Persian, and Babylonian recounts this fact. This inscription reads, quote, I am a Persian. With the aid of Persia, I conquered Egypt. I gave orders to dig this canal from the river Nile, which flows in Egypt, to the sea which is connected with Persia. Then this canal was dug as I had ordered. But I said, Now go and destroy half this canal from the city of Bira to the sea, because such is my will. End quote. Why this last order was given, he does not say. Diodorus and Strabo, however, relate that his engineers represented to him that if the canal were completed, the Red Sea, which lay higher than Egypt, would flood the country. It is a curious fact that Herodotus regarded the canal as completed, for he says it was four days' journey long and wide enough to allow two triremes to pass in line. It is further noteworthy that Cambyses had already founded a city named Cambyson after him near the route of the canal. Probably he had intended to undertake the work, but had died before it was begun. The most important act of his reign was that he erected Egypt, together with Libya, Barcia, and Cyrene, into the sixth satrapy. This satrapy had to pay an annual tax of 700 talents, or 800 and twenty-six thousand dollars. The fisheries of Lake Moeris were declared to be the property of the crown. The Egyptians had to furnish the Persian garrison of the citadel of Memphis one hundred and twenty thousand bushels of grain annually. Further, they had to furnish salt and Nile water 
for the royal table. The income of the city of Antilla was given the Queen of Persia, according to some accounts for her shoes, according to others for her belts, or, as we would say, for pin money. Late in this reign, four years after the Battle of Marathon, the Egyptians made an effort to regain their independence. They made a man named Chabash king. But before Darius could march against the rebels, he died, 485 B.C., in the thirty-sixth year of his reign. Xerxes, Egyptian Cheshiresh, 485-472 through 472 B.C. When Xerxes came to the throne of Persia, Chabash had firmly established himself in Egypt. He assumed the coronation name of Senentanen, Setep en Ta, and was exercising all the functions of a legitimate pharaoh. In the second year of his reign, he interred an apis, probably the one that was enthroned in the thirty-first year of Darius's reign. Several temples, among them that of Buto, were given large tracts of land. The Egyptian king did not neglect to prepare to meet an attack from Persia, which could be expected every day. The mouths of the Nile were strongly fortified, and everything was put in readiness to repel the expected attack. The rebel king could not, however, hold out against Xerxes. The country was again subdued and Achaemenes, the king's brother, was appointed satrap, with orders to institute a very strict regime. Achaemenes kept his position all his life, and it was probably his harsh rule that led to the revolt of Inaros. In the war with Greece, the Egyptians had to fit out and man two hundred vessels. The crews of which were afterward transferred to the land army and took part in the Battle of Plataea. Artaxerxes, Egyptian, Artaxerxes, and the Revolt of Enaros, 464 through 448 BC. After the assassination of Xerxes, the country was, for a while, plunged into anarchy and divided by wars for the succession, which were finally brought to a close in 464 B.C. by the accession of Artaxerxes. During these wars, the Persians lost control over several provinces, among which was Egypt. As they had taken advantage of the temporary weakness of the Persians, after their defeat at Marathon, the Egyptians now took advantage of the anarchy existing in Persia to make another fight for liberty. Cyrene had, during the past reign, gradually regained its independence, and the Libyans seem to have been left pretty much to themselves since the revolt of Chabash. In fact, it would seem that this rebel was a Libyan, or of Libyan descent. His name certainly is not Egyptian. At the time Artaxerxes came to the throne, a sovereign named Inaros, the son of Semtek, ruled over the Libyan tribes that dwelt on the Egyptian border. This chief determined to free Egypt from the Persian yoke and easily succeeded in inciting the greater part of the country to revolt. The people chose him king, drove out the Persian tax collectors, and raised an army. The first object of the new pharaoh was to secure allies against Persia, he easily succeeding in getting aid from Cyrene. He next turned to Athens, 
and the Athenians concluded a treaty with him, and ordered their fleet of two hundred sail, which lay at Cyprus, to proceed to Egypt. This fleet forced its way up the Nile as far as Memphis, two-thirds of which city had already fallen into the hands of the Egyptians. The citadel, however, was still held by the Persians, and such Egyptians as had remained loyal to Persia. This citadel, the combined forces of the Egyptians and Greeks beleaguered, but all attempts to reduce it failed. Meanwhile, Artaxerxes, hearing of the revolt, had confirmed his uncle Achaemenes as satrap of Egypt, and sent him an army of three hundred thousand men to put down the rebellion. This army entered the delta without encountering any opposition. At Papremus, they were met by the combined forces of the Egyptians and Athenians, and utterly routed. They fled from the field, and the Egyptians, pursuing, a terrible massacre ensued. Only a mere fragment of the vast army succeeded in getting safely behind the walls of Memphis. 462 B.C. Achaemenes himself was mortally wounded, and died soon after the battle. His body was sent to Artaxerxes. The Persian king now began intriguing for the withdrawal of the Athenian troops, offering the Spartans large subsidies if they would attack Athens. Failing in this, he at last fitted out a new army and placed it under command of Artabanos and Megabizos, two brave generals. In 461 B.C., this new army of 300,000 men marched into Cilicia. Here a halt was made, and the Cilicians and Phoenicians were ordered to equip a fleet. Three hundred triremes having been fitted out, they were manned with the best troops in the army. The land forces were put through a careful course of training. Meanwhile, the war had come to a standstill in Egypt. The combined forces of the Egyptians and Athenians still lay before the citadel of Memphis, but could not compel its surrender. At length, in 460 B.C., the Persian army began to move, marching along the coast so as to keep in constant communication with the fleet. The army, at length, entered Egypt without having encountered any opposition. The Allies seem to have been utterly blind to the threatening danger, deeming it improbable that the Persians should again attack them after their terrible defeat at Papremus two years before. They were, however, pretty rudely awakened when they suddenly found themselves face to face with the Persian army. They accepted the proffered battle and were utterly routed. Memphis was relieved, and the Athenians withdrew with their ships to the island of Prosopitis in the Nile. A year and a half they held out here, until the Persians dammed the Nile, and thus beached the Athenian ships. The Athenians, burning their vessels, entrenched themselves and prepared to sell their lives dearly. But the object of the Persians was not to destroy them, but to render them useless as allies of Inaros, and to drive them from Egypt. They therefore concluded a treaty with the Athenians, guaranteeing them a safe retreat. In this manner, part of the Athenian army succeeded in reaching Athens by way of Libya and Cyrene. Inaros was not so fortunate. Wounded and captured in an engagement, he was sent to Persia 
his life being spared. Here, at the instigation of Queen Amestris, who desired to avenge Achaemenes, he was crucified and his companions were beheaded. The war was not, however, ended yet. The Athenians had sent a fleet of fifty sail to reinforce their fleet before Memphis. It entered the Mendesian branch of the Nile, where it was surprised by the Phoenicians and almost completely destroyed, only a few vessels escaping. For several years, Amerteus, Egyptian Amenrut, succeeded in holding his own in the delta. Like his friend and ally Enaros, he sent to Athens for aid, and sixty ships were ordered by Simon to proceed to Egypt from Cyprus. But these vessels were of no avail, for they returned to Athens on hearing of Simon's death. 449 B.C. In 445 B.C., a certain Semtek, Greek Semetikos, seems to have held an independent position in Egypt, for he sent 30,000 bushels of grain to Athens. After the rebellion had been suppressed, Artabanos and Megabysos returned home, and Larsames was appointed satrap. Thanires, the son of Enaros, and Pausiris, the son of Amerteus, were given their hereditary principalities, the former probably Libya, and the latter the western part of the delta. How long these princes reigned, and in what relation they stood to Persia, we cannot say. Herodotus, who visited Egypt shortly after the suppression of the revolt of Enaros, found Egypt tranquil under Persian rule. There was then no trace of an independent Egyptian kingdom, and the only traces of the late troubles were the bleaching bones on the old battlefields. Egypt was again prosperous and happy celebrating its old festivals in the old manner, a striking proof of the elasticity of the people. The reigns of Xerxes II, Sogdianus, and Darius II had but little import for Egypt, 448 through 414 B.C., except that in the latter part of Darius's reign, the Egyptians again revolted, and this time succeeded in gaining their independence under the leadership of Amenrut. Section 2. The Twenty-Eighth Dynasty 414-408 through 408 B.C. Amenrut, Greek, Amerteos Late in the year 415 B.C., Amenrut of Sais succeeded, with the aid of Greek mercenaries, in delivering Egypt from the Persian rule. No details of this successful revolt are known, but it would seem that it stood in some connection with the revolt of Pisuthnes in Lydia, which occurred at about the same time while that of Amorgas in Caria, 413 to 412 B.C., kept the Persian kings busy at home, so that Amenrut was enabled to establish himself firmly on the Egyptian throne. The whole of Egypt soon came under his control, and it would even seem that he was able to take the offensive against Persia. A remark of Thucydides appears to point to the fact that he was allied with Athens in 412 and 411 B.C. In 410 B.C., according to Diodorus, he, together with the king of Arabia, threatened the Phoenician seaboard, and the Persian king sent a fleet of 300 sail against them. 
Despite these successes, he could not hold himself on the throne, but was deposed by the mercenaries. His son was excluded from the succession, and Naif Akrut elevated to the throne, 408 B.C. Section 3 The Twenty-Ninth Dynasty, 408 through 386 B.C. Naif Akhrut I, Neferides, 408 through 402 B.C. The first act of the new king was to appoint his son, Nekthorheb, Nektanebus, co-regent. But this act did not please the people, and Prince Nekthorheb was banished to his city, from which he returned twenty-one years later as king. All that we know of this king is that an apis steer was buried in the second year of his reign. Some blocks bearing his name found at Thebes prove that he built there. Pasamut, Greek Samuthus, 402-401 B.C. According to the Demotic Chronicles, this pharaoh had not served the gods well, and consequently had not been generally recognized. This assertion is not well founded, as the inscriptions prove. Numerous blocks of stone bearing his name, Ra Oeser Setep and Ra Pasamut, found at Thebes, prove that he built at the temple of Amon. Haker, Greek Achorus, 400 through 386 B.C., ruled thirteen years. He had been, like his predecessor, placed on the throne by the mercenaries, and as he was just and looked after the decaying temples, he was retained as king as long as he lived. He was busy repairing temples in all parts of Egypt. Diodorus relates that Haker became involved in the wars between Greece and Persia. At this time, Sparta was at war with the common enemy, and Agesileos sent envoys to Egypt asking for aid. Haker sent him timber for one hundred triremes and five hundred thousand bushels of grain. These stores were forwarded to Rhodos, which city had meanwhile deserted Sparta and joined Persia, so that the present intended for that state came to be used against it. We hear also, through Theopompus, of a treaty of alliance which this king concluded with the Pisidians, but we know not what came of this alliance. Possibly it stood in some connection with a war between Egypt and Persia that lasted from 390 through 387 B.C., and in which Isocrates says the three greatest Persian generals, Abracomus, Tethranes, and Pharnabazos, had fought against Egypt for three years without accomplishing anything, just before the beginning of the Cypriot War. This war broke out in 386 B.C., King Euagoras of Cyprus revolting against Persia and calling on Haker for aid. The pharaoh sent him troops, but before the war was well begun, he died. 386 B.C. Naif Akhrut II, Greek, Neferites, 386 B.C. The son of Haker succeeded his father on the throne with the aid of the troops, but the people did not support him, and consequently the soldiers deserted him and killed his son. They hereupon restored the right, that is, they placed on the throne, 
Necht Horheb, the son of Naif Akrut I, who had been banished and deprived of his right to the succession. The Thirtieth Dynasty, 386 through 349 B.C. Necht Horheb, Nectanebus I, 386 through 368 B.C. The Egyptian monuments teach us nothing of this king's reign. Diodorus has, however, luckily preserved an account of him which proves that he was the most important Egyptian king of this entire period. In his reign, Egypt again took an influential place among the nations of the world. It could defy Persia and could dare to assert its influence in Asia. In this reign falls the Cypriot War that began shortly before the death of Haker. The war had dragged along for several years before Artaxerxes saw the need of specially exerting himself to put an end to it. He now raised an army of 300,000 men, which was put under command of his son-in-law Orontes and fitted out a fleet of 300 triremes, the command of which was given to Terebasis. These combined forces proceeded to Cyprus and at once began to push the war. Euagoras had also made extensive preparations. Nectorheb sent him a goodly army. Hecatombos of Caria sent money. Several Phoenician cities, among them Tyre, joined him. The king of Arabia and other rulers hostile to Persia sent troops. Thus, he managed to get together ninety ships and six thousand native troops, besides the contingents of his allies. His privateers succeeded in cutting off the grain transport for the Persian army, and a mutiny broke out among the troops. Glus, the newly appointed Persian admiral, consequently had to go to Cilicia for grain before undertaking anything. Euagoras received his provisions and large amounts of money from Egypt. He was now enabled to increase his fleet to two hundred sail, fifty ships having been sent him from Egypt. With this fleet, he attacked the Persian ships, and though at first successful, was in the end defeated after a hotly contested battle. The Persians now began the siege of his capital, Salamis. Though he had won a victory on land shortly before his defeat at sea, Euagoras lost courage, and after appointing his son Pythagoras, commander in Salamis, he fled from the island. Escorted by ten men of war, he went to Egypt to solicit further aid. Necht Horheb gave him a sum of money, somewhat less than he had expected, but sufficient for his present purpose, and so he returned home, 383 B.C. He found the siege of Salamis still going on, and as his allies were beginning to desert him, he offered his submission. After a long delay, the decision came that he should remain king of Cyprus as a Persian vassal, and must pay an annual tribute. The war with Egypt continued. Glus, the Persian admiral, revolted shortly after the surrender of Salamis, and allying himself with Egypt and Sparta, began a new war against Persia. He was, however, assassinated soon after, and thus his plans came to naught. Now that he had brought the war in Cyprus to a successful close, the Persian king determined to punish his inveterate enemy, the king of Egypt. 
necked Horheb, knew what was coming, and made his preparations accordingly. He began hiring mercenaries, and as he offered high pay and costly presents, he soon had collected a fine army. As general he called Chabrius of Athens, who accepted the call without first asking the permission of his government, and going to Egypt, conducted the preparations for the war with great energy. Pharnabasos, the Persian commander-in-chief, was also very busy with his preparations. He sent envoys to Athens to accuse Chabrius of alienating the good feelings of Persia from Athens, and to ask the Athenians to send him Iphicrates as general. Chabrius was accordingly recalled, and Iphicrates sent to Persia between 376 and 374 B.C. At length, 374 B.C., Pharnabasos was ready. He had collected an army of 200,000 native troops and 20,000 Greek mercenaries, 300 men of war, and a large fleet of smaller craft. This force mustered at Ake and thence proceeded along the coast toward Egypt. Early in the summer they reached the border, after several attempts to betray the army had been detected and prevented by Iphicrates. Necht Horheb had regular reports concerning the strength and movements of the enemy. His plan of operations was very simple. He relied on the natural bulwarks of the land. All the border forts were greatly strengthened, and the mouths of the Nile were strongly fortified, the strongest fortifications being erected on the Pelusian branch, the one nearest to Asia. When the Persians approached this branch, they found it too strong, and determined to attempt some less strongly fortified branch of the river. Consequently, they put to sea, and soon after appeared on the Mendesian branch, where they landed three thousand men, who advanced on the fort. An equal number of Egyptians sallied from the fort to meet them, but the enemy, being constantly reinforced from their ships, the Egyptians were almost cut to pieces. A small remnant of their force escaped to the fort, closely pursued by Iphicrates' men, who entered the fort together with them. It fell, its walls were razed, and the inhabitants were sold into slavery. Iphicrates, who had found out from one of the prisoners that Memphis was unprotected, advised an immediate advance on that city. Pharnabasos replied that they had better await the remainder of their army, so as to be sure of taking the town. Iphicrates now proposed to go down with his Greeks and take the city. This made the Persian suspicious, and he refused him permission. This quarrel between the Persian leaders gave Necht Horheb time to collect an army at Memphis, and to move with all his force against the Persians in the Delta. Several combats took place, in which the Egyptians were mostly successful, but no decisive battle was fought. Meanwhile, the Nile rose, and soon the entire Delta was converted into a vast lake. Hereupon, the Persians, despairing of success, returned to Asia. Iphicrates, who feared violence on account of his quarrel with Pharnabasos, went straight to Athens. For several years, the army lay in Asia, ready to renew the war at any time, and in 372 BC, Timotheus went to Asia to offer his services to the Persian king. 
Nothing was done, however, and the great campaign against Egypt, so pompously begun, proved, in the end, a dismal failure. Despite the fact that he was almost constantly at war, this pharaoh carefully kept the temples in repair. He built at Edfu, Karnak, Medinet, Habu, Abydos, Bubastis, Memphis, and other places. After a busy and eventful reign of eighteen years, he died. Teher, Greek Tachos, 368-361 through 361 B.C. It would seem that after the death of Nektor Heb, troubles regarding the succession broke out. The list of Manetho gives Tachos, that is, Teher, only two years, and Nectanebus II, Nectnebeth, eighteen years, while the accounts given by the Greek authors go to prove that Tachos still reigned in 361 B.C. It would seem then that Teher had appointed Nectnebeth co-regent in 367 B.C., and that this latter monarch had, in imitation of the older pharaohs, dated his accession to the throne from the time he was made co-regent. According to the Demotic Chronicles, Teher was the son of Nectorheb. According to the Greek authors, he was that monarch's cousin. The Egyptian inscriptions tell us nothing of this king, and from the Greek historians, we know only the events of the closing year of his reign. In 361 BC, a great revolt against Persia broke out in Asia, and Teher naturally assisted the rebels. He collected a large army and fitted out a strong fleet. He also hired great numbers of mercenaries in Greece and made a treaty of alliance with Sparta. The strength of the coalition thus formed against Persia would have been sufficient for its purpose had it not been weakened by treachery. Orontes, the commander-in-chief of the Asiatic rebels, was the first to prove a traitor. And soon after, Riomithres, who had received the aid furnished by Teher, 500 talents, 28,500 pounds of silver, and 50 men of war, followed his example. Notwithstanding this defection, the forces at the command of the pharaoh were quite strong, consisting of 200 splendidly equipped men of war, 80,000 native troops, and 10,000 choice Greek mercenaries. The command of the mercenaries devolved on King Agesilaos of Sparta, who had come over with 1,000 hoplites. The Athenian Cabrius was given command of the fleet, while Teher himself retained command of the native troops. Cabrius was the special favorite of the pharaoh, who is said even to have gone so far at his advice as to levy a tax on the temple estates and on the exports and imports of the country while the war lasted. Agesilaos was less regarded. His coming had been looked forward to with considerable expectation. Preparations had been made for a grand reception, and valuable presents had been ordered. When he did come, he proved quite a disappointment. His small stature and extreme plainness awakened the scorn of the Egyptians, and a number of jokes were circulated at his expense. This naturally enraged him, and though he did his full duty by Teher, there was a coolness between the two kings, which was still further augmented by the fact that Teher, disregarding the advice of the Spartan, proceeded to conduct the war on his own plan. Agesilaos had advised Teher to await the Persians in Egypt, but the pharaoh was determined to take the offensive 
and invade Syria. Phoenicia fell an easy prey to his attack, and the king sent his cousin and co-regent, Necht Nebeth, to take the cities of Syria. These movements were successful, and matters were assuming the most hopeful aspect, when Teher, the general whom the pharaoh had appointed regent of Egypt for the time of his absence, revolted and offered the crown to Necht Nebeth. The latter assented, and soon had won over the army and its officers, and all the people of Egypt. All he needed now was the support of the Greek mercenaries. Accordingly, he sent envoys to Agesileos and Cabrius, soliciting their support. Agesileos dispatched messengers to Sparta, asking how he should act, and receiving the reply that he should do what he deemed most advantageous for Sparta, he declared for Necht Nebeth. Cabrius, who had at first determined to remain loyal to Teher, seeing his colleague desert that monarch, and being unable to help him alone, followed Agesileus' example. He left Egypt, however, soon after, never to return. Teher fled first to Sidon, and thence to Artaxerxes, who not only forgave him his former enmity, but even made him commander-in-chief of the army that was preparing to invade Egypt. For a while he lived at the Persian court, where he spent his time in wild orgies until he finally died of dysentery. The command of the Persian army he never actually took. This pharaoh reigned two years alone, and six years in conjunction with Necht Nebeth. Necht Nebeth, Greek Nectanebus II, 361 through 349 BC. In 361 BC, the last native pharaoh ascended the Egyptian throne. The first act of his reign was to give up the conquests in Phoenicia and Syria and to withdraw within the boundaries of Egypt. The reason for this step was most probably that the internal dissensions had not yet come to a close. A Mendesian had appeared as a pretender to the crown and had succeeded in gaining a large following and raising an army. He even attempted to gain over King Agesileos, but he remained loyal to his ally. Necht Nebeth, carefully avoiding a battle, retired to a fortified town, where his rival beleaguered him. Already the besieged were beginning to lose heart as their provisions gave out when Agesileos saved them. Sallying from the town, he broke the ranks of the besiegers and drew up his troops in the plain, so that both flanks rested on canals. In the battle that ensued, the bravery of the Greeks prevailed over the superior numbers of the Egyptians. The latter were completely routed, the greater part of their number being slain, and the rest flying from the field in wild disorder. Necht Nebeth was now undisputed ruler of Egypt. Shortly after this victory, Agesileos determined to return home. The grateful king loaded him with presents. According to some authorities, he gave him 230 talents, or about $271,400, which he distributed among his troops. On his way to Cyrene, he died. His body was embalmed and sent to Sparta, where it was buried with royal honors, 360 B.C. Meanwhile, the Persians had completed their preparations, and Artaxerxes had appointed his son, Ochus, co-regent. Ochus set out for Egypt, but on hearing the news of his father's death, 
in 359 BC, he returned home. Sometime later, Ochus attempted the subjugation of Egypt, but was defeated by Necht Nebeth, who was assisted by two excellent generals, Diophantes of Athens and Lamias of Sparta. This success of the Egyptians encouraged the Phoenicians and the king of Cyprus to strike a blow for independence. They concluded treaties with Necht Nebeth and at once began extensive preparations. At the head of the Phoenician towns stood Sidon, which soon succeeded in collecting a large army and vast amounts of military stores. Ochus had, however, not been idle. He had collected an army of 300,000 infantry and 30,000 cavalry, and had fitted out 300 triremes and 500 transports. Then he started from Babylon. Before his arrival, two of his satraps, Belasus of Syria and Mazaeus of Cilicia, had in vain attempted the reconquest of Phoenicia. They were defeated and driven out of the country by Tenes, the king of Sidon, assisted by four thousand Greeks under Mentor, who had been sent him by Necht Nebeth. Now came the news that Ochus was approaching, and Tenes lost courage. He sent a trusty messenger to Ochus, asking pardon for his revolt and offering to aid the king against Egypt. Ochus gladly promised full pardon, even giving him costly presents, and after some hesitation pledged himself to this course. We shall presently see how he kept his word. Ochus had, while advancing on Sidon, dispatched envoys to Greece, asking the larger states to join in the campaign against Egypt. Athens and Sparta remained neutral. Thebes sent one thousand hoplites under Lacrates, and Argos three thousand men under Nicostratus, whom Ochus had asked them to send him. The Greek cities of Asia Minor furnished in all six thousand men, making the total number of Greeks in the Persian army aggregate ten thousand men. Ochus now laid siege to Sidon, which was very strongly fortified, and would never have yielded had it not been for the treachery of its king. Tenes persuaded Mentor to join him, and together they succeeded in admitting the Persians into the city. When the Sidonians saw they were lost, they destroyed their fleet, locked themselves up in their houses, and set fire to the city. Over 40,000 people are said to have perished in the flames. This so enraged Ochus that he had Tenes put to death. Mentor and his 4,000 joined the Persian army. The fall of Sidon was disastrous to the allies for all of the Phoenician cities, on hearing of the dire news, surrendered at discretion. About the same time, Cyprus again fell into the hands of the Persians. A detachment of 8,000 Greeks, supported by 40 triremes, under command of the Athenian Phocion and ex-king Euagoras of Cyprus, succeeded in subduing the island very quickly. Salamis alone held out. Euagoras strained every nerve to capture the city, as he hoped to be made king again. Charges were, however, preferred against him, and consequently Pythagoras was allowed to keep the city as a vassal of Persia. The Persians now attacked Egypt. After having suffered severe losses in the desert, they at length reached Pelusium. The Persian troops were drawn up at some distance from the strongly fortified town, while the Greeks camped almost under its walls. 
the city was garrisoned by five thousand men under Philophron. The first attack was made by the Thebans, who waded the narrow canal that separated them from the town, and began a battle which lasted far into the night, but was indecisive. The forces of Nek Nebeth were much inferior to those of the Persians, consisting of twenty thousand Greeks, twenty thousand Libyans, and sixty thousand Egyptians. But he possessed large numbers of river boats, which could be used to great advantage in any combat on the Nile, and moreover, he had erected a string of strong forts along the eastern bank of the Pelusic branch. He lacked, however, a good general. Proud of his previous victories over the Persians, he had neglected to send to Greece for a general. This mistake proved fatal. He had posted half his force in the forts, and with the rest he opposed the advance of the enemy. Before a decisive battle was fought, Nicostratus succeeded in moving his men to a point of vantage, betrayed to him by an Egyptian, and strongly entrenched himself. Seeing this, Clinius of Cos, who was posted nearby with seven thousand men, attempted to dislodge him. The attack was repulsed. Clinius and five thousand of his men fell. This battle was by no means decisive, but now the want of a good general showed itself in the Egyptian army. Instead of sending a stronger force against Nicostratus, Necht Nebeth, fearing that the Persians would all cross the Nile as easily as that commander had, lost courage, and deserting his forts, retreated to Memphis. Meanwhile, Pelusium was being besieged by Lacrates, but it made a desperate resistance for several days. When the garrison heard of the pharaoh's retreat, however, they offered to capitulate. Lacrates promised the Greek troops a safe retreat, and though Bagoas, who commanded the Persian division of this corps, attempted to attack them, he was prevented from doing so by his colleague. Mentor now marched through the delta, promising immunity to all who would surrender at discretion, and threatening all who should resist with the fate of Sidon. Consequently, the Greek and Egyptian garrisons vied with one another in the rapidity of their surrenders. Among others, the strong and important fortress of Bubastis surrendered at discretion, and all the other fortresses of the delta followed its example. When Necht Nebeth heard of these losses, he dared not give battle, but taking the greater part of the monies in the state coffers, he fled to Ethiopia. Thus, about 349 B.C., Egypt, after an independence of sixty-five years, again fell into the hands of the Persians, and from this time forth it was destined to be governed by foreign rulers. Section 5 The Thirty-First Dynasty and the Invasion of Alexander 349 through 331 BC. Of the last three Persian kings, not one was of special importance for Egypt. Ochus was a cruel tyrant, whose acts reminded of the times of the insanity of Cambyses. The Greek authors relate stories of his outrages against the Egyptian religion that accord well with what we know of his character. They recount that the people had once, on a time, nicknamed him Onos, the Ass, and now he determined to have his revenge. The sacred Apis steer was butchered and eaten by the king and his friends, and an ass was elevated 
to the position of sacred animal in his stead. The sacred ram of Mendes was likewise slaughtered at the king's command. The walls of the principal cities were razed, the temples were plundered, and their treasures of gold and silver carried off to Persia. Not content with plundering the temples, Ochus stole the sacred writings from the sanctuaries and compelled the priests to repurchase them at exorbitant prices. As satrap, he appointed a Persian named Ferendates, and then he returned home to Babylon loaded with rich booty. Twelve years after the conquest of Egypt, Ochus was murdered by Bagoas, who placed the king's son Arsace on the throne. But he ruled only three years, falling a victim to the same treacherous eunuch that had murdered his father. 334 B.C. In the place of his last victim, Bagoas elevated a distant relative of the royal family, his friend Darius, to the throne, and at his hands finally met his merited reward. The king detected the eunuch's plan against his life, and compelled the fellow to swallow the draft intended for himself. Darius III did not long retain the throne he owed to his friend's crime. The Greek invasion, under Alexander's leadership, soon deprived him of his crown. Egypt remained tranquil, almost an uninterested spectator, during the dread struggle between Greece and Persia, even though all of the Persian garrisons had been withdrawn. In the Battle of Issus, the Egyptian contingent fought with the Persians under its satrap, Sabaces. Their leader fell, and the troops fled with Darius. In Egypt, Mazaces succeeded Sabaces as satrap, but he had no troops to support his authority. The power of Persia was crushed but Egypt did not strike the one blow that would have sufficed to regain its freedom. They had, however, sufficient spirit left to defend their homes against robbers. After the defeat of the Persians at Issus, Amatas, a Macedonian exile who had joined Darius, fled to Tripolis in Phoenicia, collected a fleet, and sailed to Cyprus where he increased his land forces. Thence he sailed to Pelusium, effected a landing, and declared he was the new satrap appointed by Darius. He then marched through the delta to Memphis, near which city he defeated a body of Egyptians. After the victory, his bands dispersed to plunder the rich country seats lying about the city. While engaged in this work, they were surprised and cut to pieces by the citizens. Amitas fell, and not a man of his bands escaped. After taking Tyre and Gaza, Alexander determined to secure Egypt. He reached Pelusium after a seven days' march without encountering any resistance. His fleet awaited him in the harbor. Mazaces, having no troops and having no hope of assistance from his unfortunate monarch, had no recourse but surrender. Alexander garrisoned Pelusium and sent the fleet up the Nile to Memphis. With the army, he marched along the river bank to Heliopolis, and crossing the river at this point, soon entered Memphis. The great king entered the ancient capital, not in the character of a conqueror, but like a pharaoh of old, observing all the old religious ceremonies. He offered sacrifices to the gods, and instituted athletic games and prize contests 
in the fine arts in which celebrated Greek masters took part. The Egyptians were naturally captivated by this conduct, which was so different from that of the last Persian rulers, and it is not at all surprising that a mystic romance was soon woven about the person of the Macedonian king. According to this romance, Necht Nebeth had not fled to Ethiopia, but to Macedonia. He was a great magician, and as such he took the form of Jupiter Ammon, and in this form approached Queen Olympias, the wife of King Philip. Alexander was thus, the story continues, the son of Necht Nebeth, and not of Philip. The romance thus made Alexander the legitimate heir of the old pharaohs, and the avenger of his father Necht Nebeth. It would seem that Alexander rather favored the spread of this legend, as he knew it would greatly strengthen his hold on the Egyptian people. Sailing down the Nile from Memphis through the Canopic branch, he went to sea from Canopus, landing at the outlet of Lake Maroetis, near the ancient town of Rakote, he saw at a glance that the place offered unequaled harbor facilities. He therefore determined to found a city here which should bear his name, and thus was founded the city of Alexandria, the most important and most permanent of the many towns founded by this king. This city soon became the great intellectual exchange between the nations of the Occident and the Orient, the mother of a new civilization. Here, European and Oriental philosophy, religion, and science met on a footing of equality, and views were exchanged and new systems inaugurated that completely revolutionized ideas. The philosophy of Philo and the astronomical system of Ptolemy were among the brilliant results of the new civilization. A new art, the Hellenistic, resulted from the interchange of Greek and Oriental, more especially Egyptian ideas on art. Doubtless, too, the spread of Christianity was much fostered by the cosmopolitan spirit in regard to religious matters which emanated from this city. From Alexandria, the king pushed westward to the famous oasis of Amon. With the assistance of the gods, he reached it in safety. The story goes that when the water supply gave out, rain fell, and that messengers of the god, in the shape of ravens, conducted the army to the oasis. On the way he was met by a deputation from Cyrene, which offered him a golden crown and costly presents. The city evidently apprehended an attack and thought it advisable to submit peaceably. As Alexander entered the temple of Amon on the oasis, the high priest hailed him as son of the god. Not knowing that it was customary to designate the pharaohs as sons of Ra and of Amon, the king laid great stress on this greeting. After having made the temple rich presents, Alexander returned to Memphis in safety. Here he instituted a great festival in honor of Jupiter. He now turned his attention to the reorganization of the Egyptian government. The civil government was put into the hands of two Egyptian nomarchoi named Doloaspis and Petesis, and on the resignation of the former, the control of civil matters was entrusted to the latter alone. The commanders of the garrisons and of the various troops of mercenaries as well as the heads of the commissary departments, were Greeks. 
leaving a part of his army in Egypt, Alexander, early in 331 B.C., left the country, never to return. He had so delicately adjusted the government that the various officials effectively held one another in check and there could be no chance of a revolt. After Alexander's death, his body was brought to Alexandria for interment. With the conquest of Egypt by Alexander, the history of the country comes to a close. The Ptolemies, who after the great king's death again made Egypt independent, were a Greek family, and the civilization of their times differed materially from that of the older epochs. Under them, the old religious traditions were fostered, it is true, but they no longer possessed any vitality. There was no longer a national religion as of old. The old religion and language were known to the priests alone, and with every generation they became less and less intelligible, even to this class of, well, let us call them official custodians of the ancient traditions, until, with the coming of Christianity in the first century A.D., the old religion gradually passed away. The Ptolemies themselves were Greeks. Their capital, Alexandria, was a Greek city. The civilization of their epoch was partly Greek, partly Egyptian. The history of Egypt after the conquest forms an integral part, first of Greek, then of Roman, and lastly of Mohammedan history. Chronological Table Mena unites Upper and Lower Egypt, not later than 3200 B.C. Snefru, the founder of the Fourth Dynasty, not later than 2830 B.C. Accession of Mary Ra Pepi, not later than 2530 B.C. Transition Period about 2400 through 2250 B.C. Accession of Amenemhat I, about 2130 B.C. Usertesen III, about 2013 through 1987 B.C. Amenemhat III, about 1986 through 1942 B.C. Hyksos domination, about 1780 through 1530 B.C. Accession of Achmes I, about 1530 B.C. Tutmosis III, about 1480 through 1427 B.C. Chuenaten, about 1376 through 1364 B.C. Accession of Horemheb, about 1340 B.C. Seti I, about 1316 through 1289 B.C. Ramses II, about 1288 through 1221 B.C. Ramses III, about 1180 through 1148 B.C. Accession of Herahor, the first priest king, about 1050 B.C. Sheshank I, about 945 through 924 B.C. Pianchi's invasion, about 800 B.C. Accession of Shabaka, about 728 B.C. First Assyrian invasion, about 672 B.C. Second Assyrian invasion, about 667 B.C. 
Tanawat Amon's invasion, about 664 B.C. Third Assyrian invasion, about 662 B.C. Samtek the first, 645 through 610 B.C. Nekau, 610 through 594 B.C. Battle of Carchemish, 604 B.C. Nebuchadnezzar invades Egypt, 567 B.C. Conquest of Egypt by Cambyses, 525 B.C. Revolt of Chabash, 486 B.C. Revolt of Inaros, 464-460 through 460 B.C. Amenrut frees Egypt from Persia, 414 B.C. Necht Horheb, 386 through 368 BC. Necht Nebeth, 361 through 349 BC. Conquest of Egypt by Ochus, 349 BC. Conquest of Egypt by Alexander, 331 BC. The End End of History of Egypt by F. C. H. Wendell This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org.